remember a couple of occasions where he would advocate against the curve very strongly because uh, he felt that a student deserved a better grade than, uh, than the curve was, uh, was mandating uh, uh, upon him. In addition to that deep dedication, another thing that I really admired about Judge Weiss, one of the reasons you bring on adjunct faculty, of course, is because they have practice experience and they can talk about the world of practice and the world of law as it operates in the field on an evolving basis in a way that's a little bit more challenging, I think, for uh, doctrinal professors, or can be. The danger with that sometimes is that uh, the, 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 um, the class can become uh, an exercise in war stories. And so it becomes, well, Joinder, well, let me tell you about this great case of Joinder that I happened to litigate 14 years ago. Meanwhile, the student doesn't even know what the word Joinder is. It's not a word for them, right? Uh, and so, uh, so it could be a challenge. And I think what Judge Weiss was really able to do was to both distill very difficult concepts, aware of where students were, and then to relay them and include within them a certain appreciation for the world as it exists that students really found uh, valuable, which is why he was among the most popular adjunct faculty. And the last thing, and I think this is something that's really important, uh, and I know it resonates with a later panel today, uh, and it's something that's important to us here at Pitt Law, is the way in which uh, Judge Weiss really emphasized professionalism, ethics, and civility as part of, uh, of his teaching exercise. I think one of the challenges that we face, and we notice this as we think of skills that we try to build among our students, and I think all law schools face this, is a certain desire to sort of cabin ethics and professionalism off into one class called professional responsibility. So, okay, well, we got it. It's professional responsibility. Students take it. It's all good. Uh, and there's always a danger when you do that, which is that all of a sudden, when you're learning torts, ethics doesn't seem to matter because that's a different class, right? Uh, and Judge Weiss was very, very good about talking about the importance of ethics, the importance of professionalism, and really the importance of civility. Civility is a form of ethics. Civility as a core aspect to the lawyering experience. Zealous advocacy does not mean incivility. And the way in which he was able to instill that, not only professionally among his students, but also act as a personal model of that is something I've always found deeply satisfying and deeply, uh, deeply uh, something that I've always deeply admired about him. So I did want to make sure that I emphasize that uh, this was an important part of Judge uh, Weiss's legacy as well, uh, and one that we at Pitt Law and many of our students benefited from immensely. So with that, I will now shut up and turn the matter over to, uh, to Chuck. So thank you again. Thank you, Dean Hamoudi, um, and welcome everyone um, to this uh, to this great event that I'm really proud to to be a part of. I, I want to say, I want to tell you how this idea started. Um, I got a call about a year ago from Professor Ilhan Lee from the University of Missouri School of Law and Bill Jansen, Professor Bill Jansen from uh, Charleston Law, who's right back there. Um, two wise guys of the 60 or so among of us um, in academia. And we got together and we started talking about the judge's 100th birthday, which um, was just this week and what we should do for it. And the few of us realized that there are about a half a dozen of us teaching in law schools around the country. And we got together and said, we've had a courthouse naming ceremony for the judge. We've had um, a, a court reunions, but we've never had something to honor his jurisprudence and legacy. And the idea was sprung um, from, from, from those conversations. We thought of where we should have this. And the natural inclination was here at his alma mater. He was a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. And the event had to be held here. So I had, as the only wise guy in full-time academia here at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, I had the honor, at some point it might have felt like a curse, to, um, to pull all of this together, uh, but I couldn't have done so without the help of the other wise guys in academia and elsewhere who really helped, Professor Bill Jansen, Professor Ilhung Lee, Professor Phoebe Haddon, um, Art Stroyd, Professor Ira Nathanson, where's Ira at? He's here, he's here somewhere, Ira's back there. Um, and you'll meet all of them today. We're all speaking and we're all on panels and I will, um, you'll hear from me as well. I'll be sort of emceeing and, and, and introducing panels throughout the day and moderating panel too. But right now we're gonna learn a little bit more about the judge. We couldn't do this without learning a little bit more about the judge. And at this point, I'm gonna introduce Art Stroyd. But one thing I will have to say is all judges have fraternities of clerks. So I know we have some federal clerks in the audience today. You'll, you'll, you'll leave your clerkship and you become a, a fraternity, a brotherhood, a sisterhood of clerks. Us wise guys and wise gals, we call ourselves, um, about 60 of us around the country, all over the place. Um, if we were a team, our team captain is, was, and always will be 
Art Stroy. Um, and I, 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 I wish I could just introduce Art off the cuff, but I really have to read his bio. So I wanna, I wanna introduce him here. Art Stroyd clerked for Judge Wise from 1972 to 1974. After he served in the Navy during the Vietnam War, he was the first wise guy to be hired when the judge was elevated to the Court of Appeals. Uh, since then, he has spent his career in private practice as a trial lawyer specializing in civil litigation, first joining the international law firm of Reed Smith, where he became the head of its litigation group and served as one of its managing partners. Later, he joined two of his former partners to form Del Sol, Kavanaugh, and Stroyd, a boutique litigation firm that is based in Pittsburgh and is one of our sponsors here today. He's been president of the Allegheny County Bar Association, also one of our sponsors here today, and the Academy of Trial Lawyers of Allegheny County, which Judge Wise co-founded. And he's been active on community boards as well. He's also a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers. So with that, I want to welcome, welcome Art Stroyd up to the podium. Well, thank you, uh, Chuck. Uh, uh... I just wish my parents were alive. My father would have been very proud and my mother would have believed all that. Uh, so, um, in any event, uh, today's symposium, uh, one of the issues that I raised was, I've met so many young lawyers who walk into the federal courthouse knowing that it's called Joseph F. Wise Jr. Uh, United States Courthouse, but not knowing why, not understanding, never having practiced before Judge Wise, never having uh, known him, uh, they don't really appreciate just what went behind uh, that. So in addition to celebrating his birthday, what had been his 100th birthday, and as well as celebrating uh, his jurisprudence, we thought it'd be appropriate just to celebrate his legacy. And by doing that, we thought that it'd be appropriate to put his, the program today, the substance of the program, in the context of who was Judge Wise. Um, the context as uh, the judge as an individual, uh, he touched the lives of everybody who worked with him, all the wise guys and wise gals. And uh, so we wanted to just uh, talk briefly about uh, just who he was. Um, if you never met him, he was everything that you ever imagined a judge should be. Uh, he, is, he was wise, as his name would imply. Uh, but he was beyond reproach. He was uh, principled. He was moral. He was the he mastered the nuance of every detail of every case that was before him. Uh, he was hardworking, generous of his time and talent. But he was also very sincere, very polite, very good humored. He was respectful of everyone, whether it was the newspaper guy in the lobby or. Uh, uh, Supreme Court justice, it was, they all deserve the same respect. And he was respected by all as well. He was respected by those even who did not fare as well uh, in, in front of him, uh, but they always left knowing that they had a fair hearing. Um, but a quick look at his military service, I think really puts uh, his contributions in uh, proper context. Um, he, uh, was um, born and raised in Pittsburgh. He was from the north side on Perrysville Avenue. Um, he had just finished his freshman year at Duquesne uh, as a, and a freshman and, and uh, World War II had broken out and he volunteered to uh, join the army uh, at the end of his freshman year. Why? Because it was the right thing to do at the time. And uh, he... Uh, did um, He was too late to land in Normandy, the first wave, but he did land at Utah Beach after D-Day. Although he missed that first wave of, uh, of uh, battle, he saw plenty of uh, battle uh, in, uh, under General George Patton uh, in his conquest of the Brittany Peninsula in 1944. Uh, Judge Wise was a uh, forward observer of the 22nd Armored Artillery Battalion. Uh, he would call in artillery strikes by radio, and like so many of his of the greatest generation, uh, he spoke very little about his service. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it was almost impolite to ask him. We knew he had been wounded. We knew he had almost died, but we never really asked him uh, 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 personal questions as to what was it like. 
uh, and he never volunteered until uh, he came back uh, from a celebration of the 60th uh, anniversary of the liberation of the small town in France, south of Paris. And uh, he had been uh, invited by this small town to be the uh, feature uh, representative of the United States. Um, he uh, was there as the symbol of the uh, liberation of that town, and he was uh, toasted, and he uh, asked us to uh, come down to Chambers, the wise guys and wise gals who were in Pittsburgh, to come down to Chambers and to uh, share his remembrances of this uh, celebration. Um, he was a great patriot, and he loved uh, he loved being the uh, representative of the United States Army in the uh, in the 60th uh, anniversary of the uh, of the uh, liberation. Um, he ended up um, uh, sharing with us stories of the celebration, but more importantly, for the first time, he opened up about what it was like uh, when he was wounded. Um, he talked about, uh, he showed us the uh, Legion of Honor medal that he was, that the president of France presented to him. He uh, talked about, he talked about all of the um, celebration, but more importantly, he talked about what it was like sleeping in the mud in that uh, under General Patton's uh, 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 invasion. Uh, he talked about what it was like seeing friends get killed in, uh, right beside him. He talked about himself being wounded, um, which was uh, uh, the first time we ever heard those details. Um, one of the uh, features of uh, Judge Wise, in addition to the traits that I mentioned, was loyalty. Uh, he was loyal to all of those who worked with him, uh, he's loyal to his family, but he was also loyal to uh, a, a man who saved his life, who was a firefighter uh, from Pittsburgh, who was in his company, and uh, who uh, uh, on November 11, 1944, uh, saved uh, the judge's life. That was the, coincidentally, November 11 was Armistice Day that time, the now Veterans Day, but it was Armistice Day celebrating the end of World War I. What well, was the end of the fighting for Judge Wise that day? Uh, mainly because he uh, he uh, was uh, wounded uh, on the battlefield uh, that day. And uh, he describes uh, Chester Wernicke, who was the um, was the uh, firefighter from Pittsburgh. Uh, he described him and introduced him at almost every single public event that uh, the judge was being honored, uh, whether it was being uh, elevated to the district court or the court of appeals, uh, whether it was for the uh, his portrait unveiling, he always insisted that Chester was there, and he always insisted on introducing him and recognizing uh, what Chester had done. And in fact, I thought it was appropriate if I would just read one of his remarks and when he introduced uh, Chester. This is Chester Wernicke. Years ago, he was a young man who drove his Jeep across a battlefield in France to pick me up at considerable risk of his own life. I was lying there wounded, paralyzed, conscious, and otherwise not in very good shape. Chester dragged me into his Jeep, drove across this field as shells were still dropping about, obviously a great risk to his own life. He took me to an aid station so that I could get emergency treatment. Chester, I'm glad we're both here today, uh, as we all are as well, or were as well. Uh, but uh, first of all, to describe uh, what he, uh, where he was driven to an aid station for, quote, emergency treatment, uh, also emphasizes another trait of Judge Wise, and that was uh, humility. Uh, he would tend to uh, downplay his role, uh, because instead of uh, being, uh, going for emergency treatment, uh, the judge, the war was over for the judge at that point, because he was, uh, he was uh, moved to a uh, uh, hospital, and in fact, he spent the next four years in and out of hospitals. He had, uh, when he was in the field, he uh, said he opened his shirt and he looked down and could see his intestines. He eventually lost six feet of his intestines. He also um, uh, suffered um, great pain. But um, during that four year period when he was um, uh, going in and out of hospitals over the next four years, he also was going to law school and uh, ended up graduating from Pitt Law school was a painful experience for me, but I can't imagine what he had gone through uh, and when he was uh, going through it. 
Uh, but after uh, those injuries, he was awarded two uh, Purple Hearts with Oak Leaf Clusters, a Bronze Star with uh, for Valor, and uh, he basically um, uh, basically put that all behind him and really didn't talk about it as the greatest generation was known for. Uh, but he did graduate and pass the bar, and he joined his family. Family is a critical point in his life, and uh, not only his children who are here today, but his brothers uh, and his father. His father was uh, Joseph Weiss Jr., or senior, as you can uh, figure, but these are uh, two of his brothers, and they had the law firm, uh, became known as Wise and Wise, uh, and it became the premier uh, insurance defense uh, trial firm. Uh, and he became well known, even though he was the new man on the totem pole here, uh, he became well known for being always well prepared, being professional, and being a really an up and comer uh, trial lawyer. Uh, and, and it was a family affair. This is the youngest brother, Danny, uh, being joined, as you can see, uh, somehow the Wise family always attracted publicity because these are all newspaper articles. This normally doesn't happen when somebody uh, joins a, a law firm, but uh, somehow it uh, did uh, happen there. But uh, in, the point is, though, that the Wise family, was, as, and as they continue to be, young Joe is, uh, is here today, uh, wonderful lawyers and uh, well-known. The judge in particular became known as one of the leading trial lawyers in the city um, of the defense bar. Uh, but he was respected by everyone, plaintiff's counsel, defense counsel, the judiciary, all uh, respected the fact that he was so calm under pressure. And after what he had been through in the war, it's not surprising. You know, the battlefield is one thing, the courtroom's another one, and it's kind of child's play compared to what he had been through. Uh, but he uh, also became a leader of the bar. He co-founded the Academy of Trial Lawyers and... Uh, was uh, was uh, repeatedly uh, solicited to uh, be become a counsel of record for a particular uh, for a particular uh, client. However, uh, duty called again, and uh, he uh, a, a responded to a, uh, a I guess a mandate, if you will, to be a to run for judge. He had been appointed, and he ran for judge. Incredibly, in Allegheny County, he was elected as a Republican. Uh, does not happen, and uh, it, uh, but it, it, it was cream rises, and he definitely uh, was uh, able to uh, uh, put away with the disparity of uh, registration and was elected uh, to Common Pleas Court in 1967. Uh, it didn't take long before his uh, track record as a Common Pleas judge uh, became known in Washington. And he was uh, uh, he was eventually uh, appointed to the uh, uh, U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. And uh, as you can see, it was a happy day, uh, happy day for everyone. I'm not sure. Uh, the, I, I wasn't sure whether Joe, I should mention, uh, gave me these uh, photographs and these clippings. Uh, and uh, he always looks good in these photographs. I'm not sure whether his sisters. Uh, always look quite the uh, the same, but um, in any event, is and that's his mother, uh, the judge's mother as well over there. Well, it didn't take long, and then uh, kind of a blink of the eye, and all of a sudden he was talked about for the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and uh, again, uh, again he moves up to the circuit. Uh, this was he was 49 years old. Um, his uh, the uh, I saw this ad in the paper, or not ad in the paper, this uh, uh, photographs in the paper, and I thought to myself, uh, I had uh, just was finishing up law school, and I thought to myself, well, this would be a great 49-year-old uh, judge. It'd be a great uh, person to uh, clerk for. I'd have a whole entire career as a mentor, and sure enough, it worked out very well. Uh, but uh, his family expanded then to be the, uh, the Third Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, these became his confidants, they became his uh, tennis partners, they became his friends, and uh, he was uh, admired by all. Um, he was known for being uh, pragmatic. Um, he always remembered what it was like to be a trial lawyer. He always remembered what it was like to be a, a district court judge, and he brought that to, to the Court of Appeals in every opinion. He always was very conscious 
of what went on in the record before it ever got to the Court of Appeals. And that, that pragmatism really made his uh, decisions much more uh, uh, struck, uh, struck a chord with uh, practitioners. Um, I think this picture captures what the wise guys and wise gals remember most. And that was him in chambers, always wearing a suit coat all day long. Every, uh, never, never uh, was uh, kind of, we never had uh, casual Fridays. <laughs> uh, but he, he was always studying, always researching, always writing, always analyzing, uh, deeply engaged and worked very, very hard. He always did the first draft of every opinion, uh, every opinion that bore his name. He, did, he wrote the uh, first draft uh, of it. Um, and uh, eventually, he, I can't say he made a total uh, uh, commitment to the law at that point or to the Third Circuit at that point, because Chief Justice Rehnquist in 1989 uh, asked him to head the Federal Court Study Commission, which you'll hear about uh, later on. I think that uh, just Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, captured uh, so much of uh, Judge Wise when he was commending him for having completed this uh, monumental task, which took uh, the judge's vast experience in the courts and merged it with his uh, uncanny ability to take a complex situation and turn it into co uh, coherent um, uh, understanding. Uh, but uh, just, just Chief Justice Rehnquist said, that uh, Judge Wise, quote, never let the solemnity of being a judge obscure the twinkle in his eyes. And uh, it was very true. He, uh, the judge had a wonderful uh, sense of humor and it always came across. Uh, in 1993, uh, some of us wise guys went to uh, Baltimore when the judge was given the, uh, the Debit Distinguished Service to Justice Award. And uh, Justice Scalia indicated at that point uh, that it was such an honor uh, to uh, that it, probably the most coveted honor for any federal uh, judge to receive because uh, the recipient is elected by all the federal judges and is nominated by the federal judges. And to read the the recipients is like reading who's who of American jurisprudence. Um, but the uh, and in reading jurisprudence, uh, I should mention the West uh, dedicated uh, a reporter to him, Pitt Law Review dedicated an issue to him, uh, but all of us wise guys and wise gals, this is uh, one of the early uh, celebrations, one of our early reunions, uh, all of us uh, also held him in such high regard. And uh, as uh, Chuck mentioned, that's how uh, what this brought about today's uh, celebration. Uh, in fact, we reminisce whenever we have a reunion how he changed our lives and uh, how, uh, we just having clerk for him, having known him, having him as a role model changed our lives. Um, and uh, as a, after having clerked for him, you always had the ability to think to yourself, no matter what situation you faced, what would Judge Wise do? Uh, whether it was a hostile judge, whether it was a, uh, uh, an adversary who was uh, more obnoxious than uh, you can tolerate, or whether it was a demanding client, what would Judge Wise do? And I, I think it's a question that we all uh, continue to ask ourselves. Um, well, uh, sadly, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2014, um, as a fitting tribute to a patriot and an unselfish uh, public servant and to a role model, uh, many of us uh, wise guys and wise gals walked behind his case on with his family, with his friends, and with members of the judiciary, state and federal, including Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, at the Arlington National Cemetery. Um, it was a, uh, the judge was buried along with his uh, uh, wonderful wife, uh, Peggy, on that day. It was a glorious day, but a sad day uh, for all of us. And uh, it was an emotional when there was a 21 gun salute uh, to cap off the, uh, the day. Um, but that 21 gun salute uh, did not end our memories of him, but it also didn't end uh, the legacy, uh, which continues today. And uh, in fact, uh, immediately after uh, that, there was a groundswell of uh, support from the legal community to name the, uh, to name the courthouse for Judge Wise. Uh, this is an op-ed piece that, uh, that uh, uh, that Ken Gormley did when he was dean, he's now chancellor at Duquesne, 
but uh, he uh, kind of cap encapsulated why the courthouse should be named for the judge. And uh, in addition to a groundswell from uh, academia and a groundswell from every uh, bar association uh, group that passed resolutions, I should uh, give a shout out to uh, Circuit Judge Mike Fisher and uh, Chief Just uh, Judge uh, Brooke Smith, who really made the magic happen with the, within the federal bureaucracy to have the, uh, have the courthouse named for the judge. Uh, so it was in uh, 2015, uh, President Obama signed legislation as a uh, 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 the most recent tribute to the uh, quintessential judge who touched many of our lives. Uh, so we hope that this gives you a little bit, bit of a glimpse into why we wise guys and wise gals uh, hold him in such revere and uh, why uh, the substance of today's um, uh, seminar uh, is it should be in the context of the man as well. So thank you. All right, let's get started with panel one. If you just uh, join us up here. <clears throat> And this is the one panel where we have one virtual panelist. Uh, Professor Fander, is he with us? Thank you. So um, I'm going to let uh, the moderator here, uh, introduce everyone, but I'm going to introduce the moderator, uh, my good friend, Professor Il-Hung Lee. Um, he clerked for Judge Wise from 1988 to 1990. Uh, after his clerkship, he was a litigation associate with uh, Cravath, Swain, and Moore in New York. Currently, he's the Edward Hinton Professor of Law and Director of the Center for the Study of Dispute Resolution at the University of Missouri School of Law. He teaches and writes on the fields of uh, dispute resolution, trademark, sports law, and race in law. Professor Lee also serves as a neutral for the World Intellectual Property Organization and USA Track and Field, among other organizations. So, um, Ilhan, over to you. Yeah, come on, you can come here to do the video, right? Max, would you, how do we do the video here? Okay. While we're working on that, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Max, who's the uh, Pitt Law School uh, IT guru. Uh, we all know that in the days we live in, we cannot function without the IT department. Uh, so thank you. And we'll begin shortly with a um, video uh, that will introduce the uh, Federal Court Study Committee. As a springboard for vital and beneficial change in the federal court system. Although our report is broad, and far-ranging, 
Nevertheless, it is but the beginning. On a much more somber occasion, Winston Churchill said, Now this is not the end, nor is it even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Those words ring with some meaning today. The committee's report is the culmination of diligent efforts by many, but its real fruition lies in further discussion, elaboration, and most of all, implementation. The task assigned to us was a daunting one, to make a complete study of the courts of the United States and of the several states, recommend revisions to the laws of the United States, and develop a long-range plan. Other commissions and committees have been asked to study the Supreme Court or the Courts of Appeals in the past, but in the last 200 years, none had ever been asked to survey the federal courts as a whole. We knew from our own experiences that many of the difficulties facing the Supreme Court, facing the federal courts rather, we were apprised of many more during our public hearings and by commentary from judges, lawyers, and most importantly, from individuals who seek the protection of the federal courts. We could not linger long on any one topic, given the short life of the committee and the multitude of issues, nor could we make a satisfying in-depth study of any one issue. Rather, we have offered concepts to be refined in the implementation. We have suggested broad scale remedies to many of the most immediate pressing problems and listed many topics for detailed studies where we had neither the time nor the resources to do so. We do not say that we have found solutions for all of the problems confronting the courts or indeed that we have even identified all of the concerns that are so troublesome. We can, however, say with emphasis that this study was long overdue and has demonstrated the need for further and specific work in the future. I'd like to take just a few moments to discuss a few of the proposals. One of these is planning for the future. By its nature, the judiciary looks to the past for guidance, but the future must be reckoned with. We do not know precisely what tomorrow's claims will be, but we do know that there will be claims tomorrow, and the courts must be prepared to grapple with them. Judges simply must not be so obsessed with today's demands that they cannot lift their eyes to see what lies ahead. No organization can be at its best when it simply lurches from crisis to crisis, surprised and dismayed at developments it could have foreseen. The future is largely unpredictable, but general trends are sometimes discernible. The judiciary must plan as best it can for years ahead, and it must take Congress into its confidence. We are delighted that soon after our tentative recommendations were issued in December, that the Judicial Conference of the United States took immediate steps to begin organized, long-range planning within the judiciary. This step will pay substantial long-term dividends. Another serious concern that we confronted was the size of the federal courts. The role of the federal courts in our society has undergone substantial changes in the past 200 years. <laughs> the judiciary has become larger and more important to the American public. Indeed, one of the heartening experiences Thank you. All right, those were the opening remarks by Judge Wise uh, as he presented the uh, report of the Federal Court Study Committee uh, to the Chief Justice at the Supreme Court on April 2, 1990. I remember specifically being in chambers the year before when we learned that our judge was selected by the Chief Justice to serve as the chair of the committee. At the time, um, I did not appreciate the importance of the work, nor could I have known the lasting impact of the committee's recommendations. I do remember the judge being quite busy 
uh, preparing for committee meetings and events. Uh, all the while, while he had a full uh, court uh, uh, case load uh, as a senior judge on the Third Circuit. Uh, the committee's work relating to supplemental jurisdiction, uh, specifically Section uh, 1367 of Title 28, uh, is the subject of our uh, discussion, subject for the panel discussion today. Uh, I'd like to thank again uh, PNC Bank for sponsor sponsoring the panel. Uh, and we have uh, to shed light on the subject, a very distinguished uh, panel of speakers. Um, I encourage you to uh, see the uh, full and very impressive bios of each of our speakers on the program, uh, symposium program. Uh, but very briefly, uh, joining us remotely is Professor James Fander, who is the Owen L. Kuhn Professor of Law at the Northwestern Fisker School of Law in Chicago. He's a prolific author. Uh, his most recent book is Cases Without Controversies by Oxford University Press. And he's also a co-author of one of the two leading case books in the subject of civil procedure. Um, our second speaker, uh, Dean Wendy Collins Purdue is Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Richmond School of Law. Uh, and she's also a prolific scholar. Uh, and she is uh, one of the co-authors of the other leading case book uh, in civil procedure. And then uh, uh, lastly, Professor uh, Iron Stephen Nathanson is Professor of Law and the former Associate Dean at St. Thomas University in Miami Gardens, Florida. Uh, he has deep roots to Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh and the Third Circuit. He was uh, Editor-in-Chief of the University of Pittsburgh Law Review here. He clerked for Judge Wise. Uh, then he clerked for Judge D. Michael Fisher also in the Third Circuit. And he was a visiting assistant professor here at Pitt uh, before uh, his appointment at St. Thomas. Uh, there will be time at the end for questions uh, to the panel members. And if I may, I think this is a panel with kind of a six degrees of separation uh, in that uh, I was in chambers when a judge was appointed to the committee. Another member of the committee was Judge Levin Campbell of the First Circuit, for whom Professor uh, Jim Fander clerked. Uh, a few years uh, after uh, title uh, 281367 went into effect. There were several court cases that called on uh, the courts to interpret uh, and construe that section. Uh, one of the cases landed in the Third Circuit. Uh, that would be uh, Merit Care Inc. versus St. Paul Mercury Insurance Company, uh, with judges McKee, Randell, and Wise on the panel. And Professor Nathan was uh, in the Wise Chambers uh, at that time. Uh, due to a uh, circuit split, uh, the Supreme Court also addressed uh, the issue of 1367 uh, in uh, Exxon Mobil Corp versus Alipata Services. 5-4 decision with an opinion of the court by Justice Anthony Kennedy, for whom Dean Perdue clerked in the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and uh, for whom Dean Perdue's son clerked later at the Supreme Court. So we are keeping you in the family. And our first speaker will be uh, Professor Jim Fander, who's joining us remotely. Are you there? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to participate in this centennial celebration of the life and legacy of Judge Weiss. Just sorry I couldn't join you in person. Of course, Judge Weiss is known for many accomplishments as an appellate judge, but became a national figure as the chair of the Federal Court Study Committee. As we've heard, the committee set out to study and recommend improvements to jurisdictional rules that govern the federal judiciary. And after months of deliberation and drafting, the committee published its report, um, uh, one that came quickly to the attention of Congress through the efforts of one of its members, Representative Bob Kastenmeier. The Courts Improvement Act of 1990 thus bore the distinctive impression of the committee's recommendation. I'm reflecting on the circumstances that led to the adoption of Section 1367 as part of that 1990 statute in my remarks today, and I've entitled my essay, Jurisdictional Reform in and Out of Congress. If Section 1367 stems from the work of the committee, the statute itself sought to codify longstanding doctrines of pendant and ancillary jurisdiction. 
Those doctrines allowed the district courts, when hearing a dispute otherwise properly before them, to exercise jurisdiction over some, but not necessarily all, related claims. In particular, the Supreme Court had taken a limited view of pendant party jurisdiction in such cases as Aldinger versus Howard and Finley versus United States, refusing to expand the litigation unit to encompass some related claims. Congress accepted the committee's proposal to address Finley by adopting 28 U.S. Code 1367. According to critics, notwithstanding a stated intention to to preserve the complete diversity requirement, one literal reading of the text would overrule that requirement. Academics who had worked with legislative drafters defended the statute calling on the courts to give effect to the deserving, the diversity preserving intent of the, of, of the law. And the resulting exchange grew quite testy, so much so that one of the participants later quoted his mother for the proposition that a lot of fur was flying. The sequence of events that led to the eventual resolution of that interpretive puzzle provides an entry point for this essay in honor of Judge Weiss. Returning to Finley and the adoption of Section 1367, the resolution of questions presented in ExxonMobil and then exploring applications of ExxonMobil, we can learn much about the judicial role in jurisdictional law reform. My talk explores three episodes in the development of Section 1367. I start with the origins of the doctrine, pendant and ancillary jurisdiction pre-Finley, and then examine the textualist turn in Finley itself, the statute it spawned, and the interpretation of that statute in ExxonMobil. And then finally, I want to take up some of the post-ExxonMobil decisions as a prelude to offering some thoughts on the trade-offs between Congress and the courtroom as sites for jurisdictional innovation. So to begin supplemental jurisdiction before 1367, for much of the nation's history, the federal jurisdictional system had no substantial body of supplemental jurisdiction known as such, but a good many parties appeared before the federal courts in connections with claims that didn't themselves satisfy the requirements of federal question or diversity. And these expansions of the litigation unit were apt to occur on the equity side. Once a court asserted control of property in an in-rem proceeding, the court had the power to dispose of all claims to the property brought before the court, including claims that did not themselves satisfy the requirements of diversity. On the law side, in suits for damages, jurisdictional expansion was a bit trickier, where two separate and distinct causes of action are alleged, one based on federal and one on state law, the old learning held that pendant claim jurisdiction was unavailable. By tying the scope of the litigation to the nature of the legal claim rather than the underlying facts, the court invited much arid theorizing about the scope and the limits of the cause of action. Academics tried to help no one more insightfully than Herb Wexler, He was writing in 1948 in response to a then proposed and later later enacted codification of the judicial code in Title 28. Wexler argued against reliance on the identity of the cause of action or legal theory is too restrictive. Instead, he would define the scope of federal adjudication by reference to the rules governing joinder under the federal rules of civil procedure. He proposed to accomplish this change with a focus on matters of operative fact shared between the state and federal claims. 20 years later, the court followed Wexler's lead in United Mine Workers Against Gibbs, a decision that rejected the cause of action formulation as unnecessarily grudging. Instead of the cause of action, the Gibbs court emphasized the underlying factual connection between the claims. The court's justification for expansion to facilitate joinder and litigant convenience was based on its and its operative fact formulation as well were all drawn straight from Wexler. Much of what happened in the next 25 years was a working out of the implications of Gibbs. On the federal question side, pendant claim jurisdiction gave rise to proposals to add pendant parties as well. On the diversity side in Owen Equipment, Uh, The court approved defensive forms of ancillary jurisdiction, cross claims and third party claims, but declined to allow plaintiffs to circumvent the complete diversity rule. 
these differing views reflected a disagreement about whether the party, the, the arguments from party convenience and efficiency that guided the development of pendant jurisdiction over federal claims should also apply in matters brought to federal court on the basis of diversity. The second phase uh, deals with supplemental jurisdiction and the rise of Section 1367 and focuses on the way Finley changed the law, both by narrowing pendant party jurisdiction and by ending the Gibbs era of judicial participation in the creative interpretation of jurisdictional statutes. Because once the court disclaims any role in redefining the scope of jurisdiction, the task necessarily falls to Congress. But Congress has never entrusted the rules that govern federal jurisdiction to a committee of experts and judges as it has with, say, the federal rules of civil procedure. Instead, exercising its authority over tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, Congress chooses, for the most part, to retain its lawmaking primacy. For the FCSC, the committee, that ongoing legislative control had a clear message. Unlike changes proposed by civil rulemakers, changes in the judicial code would require affirmative legislative enactment. Congressional engagement poses a challenge for jurisdictional reform. The nuances of federal jurisdiction law rarely attract the attention of interest group lobbyists. Sure, exceptions exist, like the jurisdictional rules governing class actions, that were pushed forward in 2005, and the jurisdictional fix to snap removal that some legislators have been exploring at the instance of trial lawyers. But without the goad of in interest group pressure, legislatures, legislators understandably believe that other matters might press more insistently on their scarce time and attention. Congress put together the Federal Court Study Committee with just these sorts of concerns in mind, and the committee was still conducting its business when Finley came down in 1989. Since the story has been told before, we can briefly summarize the high points. Some followed the textualism of Finley into an account of 1367 as posing a threat to complete diversity. Others, including the law professors who helped join in drafting, urged creative interpretation to ensure preservation of complete diversity. And still others argued for a sympathetic interpretation of the statute, one that would preserve both an expansive conception of supplemental jurisdiction for federal questions and would protect complete diversity from erosion. The lower courts chose sides in the debate that emerged and that set the stage for the Supreme Court's ultimate resolution. Judge Weiss, having completed his work on the committee, offered among the most incisive contributions to this interpretive debate in Merit Care, Inc. against St. Paul Mercury Insurance. There, the plaintiffs had satisfied the complete diversity requirement in a suit against the insurance carrier, but one sought damages of no more than $5,000. Judge Weiss ruled that aggregation across plaintiffs was unavailable as a matter of settled law and then rejected the argument that Section 1367 supplied supplemental jurisdiction. Weiss concluded that Section 1367 was not intended to expand diversity or to, or to set aside existing no aggregation rules. In reaching that conclusion, Judge Weiss found that there was much to be said for a Tenth Circuit decision which had similarly declined to view Section 1367 as overruling the complete diversity and no aggregation rules. While Judge Weiss did not squarely rule that Leonhardt was the best interpretation of the text, the interpretation created sufficient ambiguity to warrant resort to legislative history that pointed squarely toward the preservation of no aggregation rules. In ExxonMobil, the court rejected the views of Judge Weiss and others who urged the preservation of the existing no aggregation rules. The majority viewed matters, uh, apparently, as a situation in which Congress had authorized supplemental jurisdiction over related claims in 1367, but had failed to foreclose the jurisdiction in 1367B. Um, and hence, the no aggregation rules were said to be overturned statutorily. In reaching this conclusion, the court claimed to rely on the textualism of Finley. But in doing so, the court introduced a substantial jurisdictional spanner into the works, 
The majority's reading, unlike that of the dissent, would apparently underturn, overturn both the no aggregation rule and the complete diversity rule itself. In other words, it would seemingly allow the joinder of additional plaintiffs under both rules 20 and 23, whose joinder would otherwise destroy complete diversity. That issue wasn't squarely presented in ExxonMobil, but was it, a, it was among the concerns that led many judges, including Judge Weiss, no doubt, to shy away from the textualist account of the statute that the court embraced in Exxon. To ward off that disruptive effect, the ExxonMobil court pulled a rabbit out of its hat. It explained that rules governing original jurisdiction and diversity had long been viewed as requiring complete diversity of citizenship, so much that the joinder of any non-diverse plaintiff contaminated the litigation and foreclosed the exercise of jurisdiction. But oddly, the court found that its no contamination rule didn't apply to the requirement that plaintiffs under 13, 1332 satisfy the amount in controversy. In short, the court introduced a judicial con construct contamination and used it as a device to ignore the text of the statute as it had itself interpreted that statute. One has difficulty accepting the majority's rationale with straight face and greater difficulty still in understanding the ExxonMobil decision as an application of the best textual account of the statute. Perhaps the court was fashioning jurisdictional policy or perhaps the court found the intervening adoption of the Class Action Fairness Act a useful indication of changing congressional attitudes. The court disclaimed any reliance on the Class Action Fairness Act in its footnotes, but one supposes that it may have protested too much. Then we look at supplemental jurisdiction after ExxonMobil's interpretation of 1367, and of course, it continues to evolve, reflecting both the textualist and policymaking strands of the Supreme Court's decision. Hard-edged textualism best explains one decision, the Fifth, Circuit's the Fifth Circuit's rejection of a form of ancillary jurisdiction in Griffin versus Lee. Jurisdictional policy, and in particular, a more welcoming attitude towards minimal diversity, seems to have informed the Second Circuit's approach in P5 Capital against Pappas. I'll give you quick summaries to reveal the legacy of the ExxonMobil approach. First, Griffin, Griffin versus Lee. There, a lawyer for the plaintiff in a diversity proceeding sought the payment of fees after securing some success and then withdrawing from representation. District Court awarded the lawyer $16,000, but the Fifth Circuit overturned the award finding on its own motion that the district court lacks supplemental jurisdiction over the claim. As I explained in other work, the Fifth Circuit displayed little interest or curiosity about the history of ancillary jurisdiction. If it had, it would have learned that federal courts in diversity had long exercised ancillary jurisdiction on the theory that the district court had authority over the distribution of the property and was empowered to protect officers of the court. But this was of no moment, the Fifth Circuit explained that concerns of fairness and efficiency cannot confer jurisdiction where the Congress has, according to the Supreme Court, unambiguously chose to limit such jurisdiction. But of course, there was no such unambiguous limit. If the text, however, clear did the work in Griffin, policy took center stage in P5 Capital. P5 Capital brought two kinds of claims, a class action on behalf of shareholders and a variety of additional state claims against a host of non-diverse defendants. Defendants removed, arguing that CAFA conferred subject matter jurisdiction over the class allegations, and the remaining claims met the transactional test of 1367. True enough, but on the face of the complaint, those additional non-diverse claims would run afoul of Section 1367B's provision for closing jurisdiction over claims by plaintiffs against parties joined under Rule 20. ExxonMobil viewed the contamination theory as foreclosing any erosion of the complete diversity requirement in that context. And yet the, se the Second Circuit found that CAFA had changed everything. Even though it was codified in 1332D and falls squarely within the reference of the preservation of complete diversity in section 1367B, the court found that CAFA had expressed a policy of assuring federal court adjudication of class actions that meet the threshold without regard to complete diversity. And so went on to reject complete diversity um, 
by authorizing the joinder of non-diverse defendants on related claims um, in apparent violation of the contamination approach in ExxonMobil. So that leads us to a reflection on the way jurisdictional law changes, something nicely reflected in the history of the 1990 adoption of 1367 and its subsequent development. After the committee that Judge Wise chaired broke, uh, disbanded, uh, the task of jurisdictional reform fell to the Federal State Jurisdiction Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States. The Federal State Committee bears responsibility for developing proposed judicial conference policy on a variety of issues, including jurisdictional proposals. In the course of that work, much of it react in reaction to proposals elsewhere. This, the committee, the Federal State Committee, has considered and worked to develop solutions to jurisdictional problems that have no sponsor in Congress. Over the course of the first decade of the 21st century, the committee developed a list of jurisdictional fixes. And after securing judicial conference approval, the committee spearheaded efforts to build the approved proposals into a package for adoption by Congress. In one example of how that process can lead to jurisdictional reform, Congress took up and eventually adopted the Jurisdictional and Venue Clarification Act of 2001, implementing a set of reforms that the committee had developed and the conference had approved. Like the legislation implemented by the proposals of the Federal Court Study Committee, in short, the JVCA represented the culmination of court reform efforts that were driven at least in part by the judiciary itself. Drafting the particulars of the reform of those reforms attracted the able attention of another Pittsburgh lawyer, Arthur Hellman. Professor Hellman had a well-earned relationship with members of Congress and a sound command of legislative drafting. Uh, and the resulting statute specifies much by way of detail and apparently leaves little room for the play of jurisdictional policymaking. Enacted in the shadow of Finley's textualism and perceived concerns with the judicial reception of 1367, the 2011 reforms aim to achieve textual clarity in fixing problems and to avoid unintended consequences. The JDCA illustrates both the possibilities and the limits of jurisdictional reform. The Federal State Jurisdiction Committee has no statutory mandate Unlike the FCSC, no members of Congress serve on the committee and its meetings take place behind closed doors. Of course, they become public after its reports have been acted on by the Judicial Conference, but it operates behind a veil that shields more of its work from public scrutiny than, say, the work of the Civil Rules Advisory Committee. On the other hand, unlike the rules advisory process, the Federal State Committee doesn't view itself as charged with developing jurisdictional policy. Rather, the committee proposes non-controversial fixes to the jurisdictional statutes. For example, the committee supported the creation of an indexing system that would adjust the amount in controversy every so often to, um, to keep abreast of inflation. But even that modest recommendation was omitted from the final text when some groups questioned its wisdom. Congress, in short, remains responsible for updating jurisdictional law, and the Federal State Committee process operates in deference to that sense of congressional primacy. Consequently, the federal system has yet to identify any institution aside from Congress with ongoing responsibility for the clarity and function of jurisdictional rules. Without that ongoing oversight and with the rise of what one might call gotcha or normative textualism, we get ludicrous jurisdictional doctrines. Obviously, corporate defendants prefer to litigate in federal court, and some federal courts lean towards making diversity dockets more widely available. Without a reliable partner in Congress to update jurisdictional policy, both, both normative textualists and jurisdictional policymakers may feel that expanded access to a federal court serves the evident purpose of Congress to expand federal jurisdiction. Those were the words spoken in support of the decision in the P5 capital case. Diversity-based consolidation, both under CAFA and in MDL, exerts a kind of hydraulic pressure in favor of expanded jurisdiction. The Supreme Court, to be sure, often plays an important role in the evolution of jurisdictional policy. Sometimes the court secures changes through lobbying and sometimes through adventuresome adjudication. 
On the adjudicative side, one can hardly see the pleading decision in Ashcroft versus Iqbal as an exercise of anything other than a rather unbridled form of judicial lawmaking. Other familiar examples include the court's administration of its collateral order doctrine, its creation of a complete preemption removal doctrine. As we've seen, the court's decision in ExxonMobil, though couched in textualist terms, embeds a substantial dose of judicial policy in an unruly doctrine of contamination. Justice Kennedy's normative textualism had a hand both in Iqbal and in ExxonMobil, just as Justice Brennan's jurisdictional policy shaped his approach to United Mine Workers versus Gibbs. However effective in shaping policy through adjudication and lobbying, the court has been relatively inactive as the supervisor of the rules enabling process. Rulemaking occurs within the judicial conference subject to the approval of the court before the amendments go to Congress. The court might nudge and signal, uh, but has largely declined to do so. The court doesn't appear to view its status as the final arbiter of civil rules as a site for effective law reform. Some um, argue that the court might have secured some changes in the pleading regime by signaling such a desire to do so instead of relying in Iqbal on adjudication to achieve a result that appeared in that context quite injudicious. In the end, then, the puzzle of how to update jurisdictional law remains. Congress has other fish to fry and little institutional interest in the nuances of jurisdictional law. Members of the judiciary have some obvious advantages as agents of jurisdictional development. As Judge Weiss's example reveals, federal judges have an undoubted expertise in the issues and a strong interest in getting them right. But one might well reject a model that put federal judges in charge of defining the scope of their own authority. On one view, judges might aggrandize themselves. That was the fear articulated most insistently by the anti-federalist Brutus at the time of the ratification. On another view, judges might shirk and reimagine their offices as sinecures with an assured salary for life. Judge Weiss's experience with the FCSC officer offers us one example of effective jurisdictional development. The relatively open nature of the committee's processes, its inclusion of members of Congress enabled a more seamless translation of those recommendations into law. One can criticize the language of Section 1367, perhaps, but no one can blame the committee for the choices Congress made. Shifting responsibility for jurisdictional change to blue ribbon panels, perhaps modeled on the Rules Advisory Committee, makes a certain amount of sense as the least worst option. If Congress were, to, were concerned about federal judges playing too outsized a role, it could structure the committee to ensure a stronger presence of academics and practitioners by mandating, by mandating review in both the Supreme Court and in Congress, the Jurisdictional Enabling Act would sensibly preserve institutional vetoes on jurisdictional, change that, on jurisdictional changes that were perceived as too cushy or too expansive, a kind of just right conclusion that one might suppose Judge Weiss himself would have supported. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fander. I understand that Professor Fander's full comments will be published in a later issue of the University of Pittsburgh Law Review. So we'll look forward to that. And next we have Dean Perdue, and uh, we'll take a look at some provisions of Section yes. 1367. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to delve more deeply into 1367 um, it, and give you a, a more detailed look at what happens when we have this intersection that, that uh, Professor Fander talked about, the intersection of a statute and a, and a commitment to, by golly, we ought to follow what the statute says, and, an, and, and a set of policies that might not be fully reflected in the language of the statute. And so maybe my talk would be called the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, there's, there's some messes here. I should say at the outset, the messes are not the making of the Federal Court Study Committee. Um, it, as Professor Fander observed, it laid out some general concepts um, to be refined um, and did not um, purport to, to uh, instantiate exactly how uh, this should be accomplished, although there were uh, some initial rough drafts. 
And I should say also that the recommendation on supplemental jurisdiction, um, I, I think, was a, was a very wise one. It came uh, after the case uh, Finley, which my mind was had been a terrible decision. It was um, the, the, just very briefly. It was a suit by uh, a decedent fam decedent's family against uh, who uh, died in an airplane crash. Um, suit against the FAA. Federal Tort Claims Action has to be in federal court, and an additional uh, claim against the uh, utility company and and the city. Um, there was no diversity. So you had a claim that had to be in federal court and an effort to join a, a state claim. And the Supreme Court had said, yeah, well, um, that might be efficient, but we don't see any authorization for it. Um, and, and in essence had, had said, um, uh, and if you don't like the decision, uh, pass a statute. So um, the, the, the study committee had recommended that. And it, the, bear in mind, this is a study committee, most of whose work was about how to frankly, limit the work of the, the um, federal courts. This was a recommendation that would, by definition, expand the work of the federal courts, and I think reflected the core, observ core character of the judge, that what was really at stake here was not reducing somebody's workload. What was really at stake here um, was justice and fairness, um, and that was an overriding concern in this recommendation. So um, right, uh, right recommendation, um, I'd say the implementation left something to be desired. Um, so I'm going to uh, just kind of take you through the statute. Um, a, a quick overview of the statute. Um, it, it's structured in a simple way. First section, we confer broad jurisdiction, full extent allowed by the Constitution. Section B says, yeah, but we're going to cut it back some in diversity cases. Section C says um, the federal courts have discretion, have, have authority to dismiss some of these, even if they have jurisdiction. And section D is a, a tolling provision. So simple structure, nice structure, and then some language that complicates things. Um, so do I get some slides? How do I get slides? Anybody know how I get slides? Um, This is about text, so you got to see text. Uh, that one's top. Nine. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, um, so we start with section A. Um, uh, the. the, the except as otherwise provided in B and C, the court shall have uh, jurisdiction over uh, supplemental claims so related that they form part of the same case and controversy under um, Article 3. So I want to start with that um, italicized language. The, the House report um, observes that the, the codification uh, that, that subsection A codifies the scope of supplemental jurisdiction um, first articulated in Gibbs. And Gibbs had laid out uh, a, a test of the state and federal claims must derive from a common nucleus of operative facts. They're not seeing it. On, They're not seeing it. Yeah. Well, aren't they seeing it there? So only, only in the room here. Oh. Mm -hmm. Everybody can. There we go. All right. Um, uh, so, a common nucleus of operative facts, um, a, a test that civil procedure students can cite to you easily. Um, but is Gibbs actually the outer limits of Article 3? Um, the the um, opinion in Gibbs does reference Article 3, but the analysis doesn't really look like constitutional analysis. Um, the court makes much of the fact that the prior, more narrow test of Hearn versus Orsler um, had, had been decided um, before the new federal rules of civil procedure were adopted, and that those rules were, uh, the new rules were built around the impulse towards entertaining the broadest possible scope 
consistent with fairness and uh, fairness to the parties. Um, that's not exactly traditional constitutional law analysis. We changed the federal rules of civil procedure, so I guess it must be different now. Um, and several commentators and a few courts have suggested that Gibbs might not be the outer limits of Article III. Um, interestingly, one of those cases is a Second Circuit case, Jones v. Ford. Uh, then Judge Sotomayor was on the panel, although she did not write the opinion. And, and in a footnote, that panel observes, uh, Congress's understanding of the extent of Article III is, of course, not binding as constitutional interpretation. And Section 1367's legislative history cannot be read as an independent limit on Section uh, A's clear extension of jurisdiction to the limits of Article III. Thus, the correct reading of subsection A's reference to same case or controversy under Article III remains unsettled. Uh, the place where this arises is in counterclaims. Um, so uh, it's commonly stated that um, there's supplemental jurisdiction over compulsory counterclaims, um, but not over permissive counterclaims. The test, of course, for um, uh, compulsory counterclaims is uh, uh, same transaction or occurrence. And, and actually, the, the study group had, had suggested that a should use the test, same transaction or occurrence, and that was re rejected instead of this using this broad language. Um, these, these compulsory counterclaim or permissive counterclaim cases um, arise um, relatively frequently in cases where there's a claim based on something like violation of the uh, Fair Debt Collection Act or um, Consumer Leasing Act or those sorts of, of uh claims, and then there's a counterclaim uh, that you didn't pay the underlying debt or some something that's somewhat connected, but some courts have said it doesn't, uh, it doesn't arise from the same transaction. So some, some of the courts have said those are permissive counterclaims, um, but it's, there's a factual connection. Um, does it arise from a common nucleus of operative facts? Maybe, maybe not, but again, some, some courts um, have uh, suggested maybe we can go further. The, the other place where these counterclaims arise is in set-offs. Um, there's, a, there's a historical tradition of counterclaims for set-off. The plaintiff says, you owe me this amount, and the defendant says, yeah, but you owe me that amount back again. Uh, in something that might or might not be related. And so we have an open question. Um, about the full scope of um, uh, Article Three. Now, to my mind, I don't, I don't fault the the, um, the committee, the drafters, for um, saying it's it's Article Three. You all figure out what that means. Um, if they had used other language, that might have meant it went less than the full scope of Article Three. But it remains an open open question. Um, Okay, so that's that part of um, the uh, statute, but I want to then look at uh, the other part of the, uh, the first part, actually, of Section A, which says, in any civil action of which the district courts have original jurisdiction, the district court shall have supplemental jurisdiction over all other claims. Now, grammatically, that's awkward, because it's other claims other than what? And the prior clause doesn't refer to claims. The prior clause, the prior part of the sentence refers to civil actions. So we, it's, it's an awkward framing uh, that as part of the problem, I think, of, that, that led to um, some of the litigation. Um, so how, how are we supposed to dissect this? Well, um, in uh, ExxonMobil, the, the court gave us um, uh, relative clarity. So the court says, once a court has original jurisdiction over some claims in the action, it may exercise supplemental jurisdiction over additional claims. So um, uh, if you've got, um, say, uh, this is United Mine Workers versus Gibbs, you've got uh, jurisdiction over the federal claim, the, the arrow in green, you get other things that are um, that are added in there. Um, or uh, or Finley, you've got jurisdiction over the federal claim. Uh, you, you're looking for one. You got one. You can hang um, other claims uh, onto that. So 
Fair enough, but then what do we do about diversity cases? As Professor Fander indicated, that presents um, something of a, of a challenge um, because the court said, well, A doesn't differentiate um, uh, diversity cases any differently. Uh, so there's no reason to treat them differently in A. You'll look for a claim. So this, is, this was the companion case in ExxonMobil, um, Rosario Ortega versus um, Starkist. You have one claim uh, that meets the amount in controversy and another diverse plaintiff who does not meet the amount of controversy. Um, I, I made up the states. Uh, they, they weren't actually Maryland and New York, but for purposes here, um, it get, gives you, you can uh, see you've got the diversity. Um, the court said, well, you got one, so you can hang other ones um, onto it. Um, and they said that's the same in class actions. This, of course, undermined uh, the um, prior rule uh, of Zahn, um, which had said the class members had to have the amount of controversy, but the court said, no, you've got a claim to hang it on. You can hang the class actions. And yes, it overrules a prior Supreme Court case, but that's what the statute, that, that's the clear language of the statute. Um, okay, uh, so that's the clear language of the statute. Then what do we do about diversity cases? So what do we do if the, like um, Rosario Ortega, one of the plaintiffs is non-diverse. And that's where the court said, well, um, uh, in, in, uh, a, a, a single non-diverse party can contaminate other claims in the lawsuit and incomplete diversity destroys original jurisdiction with respect to all claims. So there's nothing to which supplemental jurisdiction can adhere. So um, that the presence of, in this uh, hypo, the, of the New York plaintiff, uh, contaminates the claim of the, the, what would otherwise be the main claim. Well, that's interesting. Um, uh, what? So how far does this go? Um, what about a class action? Um, the court does not address that. Um, you heard some uh, discussion from uh, Professor Fander about that. If we take that seriously, then that would seem to um, eliminate, uh, that would uh, overrule the um, uh, the prior Supreme Court case in Ben-Hur, that the plaintiffs, the, the uh, class members do not have to be diverse. Um, or, or more specifically, I suppose it would mean we have to find um, another source of uh, jurisdictional authority, that 1367 would not be the source of jurisdictional authority. Now, for many cases, CAFA would be, but not all. And so we have some question, I think, um, as to whether um, uh, the, the statute has, in fact, overruled that, uh, overruled Ben-Hur. Um, okay, so uh, that's um, uh, uh, section A and the issues that are open. Let's, um, oops, there we go. But but there's more. <laughs> that was A, let's look at B. So A says here you get jurisdiction full extent allowed by the constitution, but B cuts it back in diversity cases. So um, uh, B says in, in actions um, founded on diversity, of 1332, um, there shall not be supplemental jurisdiction over, and here's the magic language, claims by a plaintiff against persons made parties under Rule 14, 19, 20, or 24. Again, and I've talked to first year law students, claims by a plaintiff against person made party under these rules. Um, uh, relatively um, straightforward language. Um, and and uh, how, how, how is that going to work? Well, um, this is um, the uh, uh, Owen Equipment, the earlier case. Um, we had a claim against a, uh, a diverse party. Well, there was some question about diversity, but in any event, for these purposes, it's we have a, an initial claim, um, an impleted third party, and the plaintiff then brings a claim against that part, that um, third party. That's a claim by a plaintiff against a person made party under, under Rule 14. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty straightforward. No no jurisdiction. Easy, easy case. Language does great work there. Um, well, what about this case? Um, you've got a, a plaintiff and two defendants. 
a mountain controversy in one case, you don't have a mountain controversy on the against the other defendant. That's a claim by a plaintiff against a person made party under Rule 20. Because the reason you can have two defendants in there is Rule 20 lets you have two defendants. So again, easy, straightforward language, um, uh, clear case. Thank you, statute. You've you've clarified some things. Um, but then we get to um, Rosario Ortega, two plaintiffs, one defendant. Uh, the plaintiff, uh, one of the plaintiffs did not meet the amount of controversy. Is that a claim by a plaintiff against person made party under 14, 19, 20, 24? No, it's a claim by a plaintiff, but it's a claim by a plaintiff against a defendant. So the court says, can't you read? That's what the statute says. This is, if you got there and if you came in in A, then uh, there's nothing in B that um, takes away jurisdiction. Okay, fair enough. Although now we get to one of the, uh, maybe we're doing the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is kind of ugly because it means if we had, if the plaintiff had had, or the plaintiffs had had the bad judgment of adding a second defendant, there would not have been jurisdiction because now we have a claim by a plaintiff, plaintiff number two, against a person made party under Rule 20. Yep. What I call defendant number one is there because we have Rule 20. So there's no jurisdiction. Again, if you jurisdiction there, not jurisdiction there. That, that's kind of odd, but that's what the statute says. So, okay, um, we have relative clarity, again, even if it's a little bit ugly. Um, all right, so fair enough. Uh, what, what, what's the problem? Well, um, there, there was a variety of uh, uh, discussion when the statute came out about some choices about Rule 19 and 2024, policy choices that were made, um, ones as to which I think um, reasonable people might differ. Uh, but there is one other aspect of B that I think um, warrants some uh, discussion. And that's the last clause, which is goes largely ignored um, at the very end. So claim by plan against person made party under any of these rules, when exercising supplemental jurisdiction over such claims would be inconsistent with the jurisdictional requirements of 1332. Now that's an odd clause because what it seems to say is um, that there's no jurisdiction, there's no supplemental jurisdiction if the claim is inconsistent with 1332. Well, if it weren't inconsistent with 1332, you wouldn't need supplemental jurisdiction. So what does that clause mean? Does it mean and we really mean it? Um, what's the work it's doing? Um, well, I think the work it's doing um, uh, uh, is um, might be useful um, in, in some cases that, that uh, do come up. So co consider this case. Um, you've got a standard diversity case. You've got a counterclaim. And then the plaintiff, now the defendant to the counterclaim, wants to implead a third party. It, first of all, is that a claim by a plaintiff against persons made party under Rule 13? Well, kind of looks like it, unless you say, well, they're not really a plaintiff, now they're a defendant. That one, that version hasn't gotten a lot of traction. But maybe there is um, a possibility of using that last clause. And, and interestingly, the, the initial, the Federal Court Study Committee report had had a draft that had similar language, uh, you know, claim, uh, claims against parties joined under various rules, provided that courts may hear such claims if necessary to prevent substantial uh, prejudice or par um, uh, to the party or third party. Um, so provided that you actually can hear it. So that's an understanding of B that says, um, B takes away jurisdiction, except the last clause puts it back in, in a few cases. Um, I, I think that's actually the, the better reading of that clause, although it's not a reading that's actually gotten much traction. Um, I think it's been, the clause has been largely um, ignored. But where might it uh, apply? Well, I think, it, um, you know, or what, what are we to, to, to make of it? If we go back to this, what, what's it getting at? I think it's actually getting at um, the the language of the Kroger case, which was back um, when when um, Kroger was decided, and and that um, that that is 
um, uh, well, in, in this, um, that we had a, a claim by plaintiff, impleted third party, and we had a, um, a claim by Kroger against um, uh, Owen Equipment. Um, the, um, and the court said, yeah, can't do that because um, that would be a, uh, it's going to undermine the diversity rule. Um, sneaky, it is what I call the sneaky plaintiff problem. The sneaky plaintiff is going to say, I really want to sue both OPPD and Owen Equipment. I really want to sue both of them. I'll sue one of them, and I know they're going to implead the other one, and then I can sue them both, and I'll get into federal court. So that's, we're going to undermine the total diversity rule with sneaky plaintiffs. Um, uh, how plausible? Well, anyway, that seemed to be what they worried about. Um, well, is that, going back to this, is, is, is do we think this is a problem here? Do we think they're, they're plaintiffs sitting around going, I really want to implead my insurance company for something. Maybe if I sue the defendant, they'll counterclaim, and then I can implead my insurance company? No, we're not gonna. It, we're not gonna uh, it, uh, it, um, undermine the total diversity rule. So I think that's what that clause is getting at. Um, but we've got cases like this where the courts have said, "Yeah, it would be really good to have um, third party uh, to have jurisdiction," but sorry, um, the statute ties our hands. We can't. Um, I, I think that's a, a an unfortunate reading. And we, whoops, likewise, we might. Um, uh, in Cohen, uh, in Kroger, we might say that if Kroger had gotten sued by oh, an equipment, maybe we'd let them counterclaim. Again, is that really? Is that are, are, are the Krogers of the world um, uh, sitting around going, oh, I want to sue Owen Equipment. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'll sue OPBD. They'll implead Owen. Owen will sue me, and then I'll get to counterclaim, and I can undermine the total diversity rule. Seems um, uh, implausible, but we haven't uh, had. A, and that, that clause has been largely ignored. Okay, uh, what else have we got? Um, section C, discretion to decline jurisdiction. Um, th here again, this was, I mean, this builds on on uh, Gibbs with the, um, the court saying that, you know, that, that uh, supplemental jurisdiction is adoption of uh, discretion, not of the plaintiff's uh, right. It's uh, one of uh, a doctrine of judicial economy, convenience, fairness to the litigants. And they gave uh, three examples, um, the, the federal claims dismissed before trial, state issues um, substantially predominate or jury conf confusion. Um, and uh, th this as well, what there was a the House report um, says that C codifies the factors that the Supreme Court had recognized. It doesn't quite codify. Once again, we have language that's not exactly what the what uh, um, Gibbs said, and um, uh, more than that, it might actually be more constraining. So, a couple of circuits have said, "Yeah, this is we, we're still doing broad interpretations under Gibbs." Um, more circuits have said um, it constrains the the um, uh, discretion, and and looked back in particular. At um, go back to A, the district courts shall have supplemental jurisdiction. And uh, so they shall have it in these circumstances. They may, they may decline if, and then there's some things listed, and a, a number of courts have said, you got to be on the list. You, you, this is no, no longer a freewheeling, it just doesn't make sense and isn't e efficient. You got to be on the list because A combined with C says you have it and you can dismiss for these reasons and these reasons only. Okay, so um, again, some uncertainty, split split um, uh, uh, decisions on that. Um, and finally, tolling. Um, the the uh, period of limitations shall, for any claim asserted under A, um, if it's uh, voluntary dismissed, it's told um, while the claim is pending and for 30 days. Um, a, a very uh, helpful um, salutary uh, provision that protects parties who use supplemental jurisdiction and then find it gets dismissed and they might be, their the statute of limitations might have um, expired. Um, and the Supreme Court has confirmed it's tolling while it's pending. But even on this one, we have um, unresolved questions about um, does it matter what the, does this apply only if you were dismissed under C? Does it apply if it was dismissed because the court decided actually you aren't under A? You, you tried a compulsory, you tried a permissive counterclaim and the court decided, no, you weren't covered. 
Does it apply there? Split up among the courts on that, um, which is unfortunate since tolling, if you get it wrong, is kind of a bad outcome. Um, so again, we have a split on, on this one. Um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that every section of the statute um, is one that has, uh, uh, for which there's um, been uh, uh, litigation. There's been no litigation, as far as I can tell, under Section E, um, at least none that I've, I've uh, found. Um, so that's the that's the good news. Um, so th this is a case, um, a, a situation where we've had, uh, a, a you know, a lot of um, uh, litigation. <laughs> Some irony here, um, given that the the federal court study committee was was all about trying to reduce the workload of the federal courts. Um, this is the statute's been in the Supreme Court at least five times. Um, there's a lot of litigation. It's it's uh, the Lawyer Full Employment Act. Um, um, and so that the implementation, uh, an implementation against the backdrop where the court was going to take the language very, very seriously pr proved problematic. Um, that said, um, we ought not uh, forget that even if the Im implementation proved flawed, the, the core idea um, was, was a very good one. And I, I have to say that um, after uh, many years of, of being a dean, I, I've come to appreciate that it's it's uh, easy to take pot shots at uh, what was done, and uh, we ought not to forget the things that might have uh, been a good deal worse um, if we hadn't tried at all. So those are those are my thoughts on the statute. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't need to share the statute. I just want to have it on the screen from time to time. Thank you. Good morning. I'm so excited to be here today and also because I'm on the panel here with Dean Perdue and Professor Pant, uh, Fander, two of our most esteemed procedure scholars. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the um, other organizers of today's symposium with whom I've had the privilege of working um, in the preparation of this great symposium. Um, of course, Art, our original OG wise guy, um, Phoebe, um, uh, Il Yong, um, and uh, Bill and Chuck. Um, you guys have worked tirelessly, and uh, also I'm grateful to be part, but also that you guys allowed me to have some space when I had some personal matters. I had to um, tell them I'll call them back. Thank you, so, to take care of personal matters. Um, Professors oftentimes use the phrase, I'm honored and humbled to blah, blah, blah. And whenever I see that, particularly on Facebook, I roll my eyes because it's usually a way of humble bragging. I am honored and humbled to get the Nobel Prize or the like. I kind of hate it. But today I, I kind of have to say it, but sorry. <laughs> but I really do mean it. Um, I'm a law professor. I teach Civ Pro for quite a number of years. Um, my main area of scholarship is, is intellectual property and technology law, um, though with a heavily procedural bent. But really the main reason I'm here today um, in this esteemed group is because I was in chambers at the time on uh, Judge Wise uh, wrote the Merit Care case. Um, so what I'd like to do today is, is talk, you know, we started off with, um, Professor Fander's 
um, historical perspective on why we have the statute, where it came from, and what happened with it. And then Dean Perdue's deep dive into the nuts and bolts and intricacies of the statute. I want to take a very different view, um, informed by my personal experiences as well as my um, own perspectives as a former wise guy, um, as a law professor, and as an academic, as a scholar. So I'm going to be taking this from the, the trifold perspective of service, uh, scholarship, and teaching. Um, those of us that are in academia, uh, I see Professor Brand here. I see Professor Curran. Um, Professor Hellman is not here, is he? Hopefully I'll get to say hello to him at some point today. Um, this trifecta, service, uh, teaching, and scholarship, are the things that we are evaluated by as academics. When you go up for tenure, these are the things they look at. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to talk about all three today um, in that order, service, teaching, and scholarship. Um, excuse me. Uh, yeah, service, teaching, and scholarship. In the end, I'm going to suggest that that all three of these are service, and Judge Wise's uh, life and legacy exemplify service in all three senses. Um, no, I, I would like to do a, a piece for the law review. So if the editor in chief is here today, I'd love to meet you and uh, say hi. Um, editor in chief, volume 59. Um, I actually have deep roots here, as Il Jung noted. Um, not just a, a grad here, but I, I served as a, a visiting professor here, and, and I know quite a lot of folks here. Um, I, my tentative title of this piece is going to be How I Learned to Stop Worrying and love the Supplemental Jurisdiction Statute. Let's start off with service. What do we mean by service? Well, in this context, I want to talk a little bit about my time as, as a uh, wise clerk. Um, I suspect that many of the things I have to say will ring very true um, with those of us who served with Joe Wise, as well as many others of us that have worked in the legal profession. Uh, what is service as a judicial clerk? Is it is it service to the judge? Well, who does the judge serve? The court? The legal system? The judiciary? The federal government? Um, the American people? No, I suppose a pithy answer would be all of those, right? Well, one example of service is the service of a clerk to her or his uh, judge, right? And helping them to reach the best decisions um, in light of the concerns of the law, the legal community, the court system, um, and the American people, and so on. And you know, I, I'll avoid getting too detailed. One of the quandaries of being a speaker in a symposium like this about the history and legacy of Judge Wise is, of course, we have um, Chambers confidentiality. So I, I can't really get into details of what happened in a particular case. Um, I'll suffice to say that I was in Chambers at the time Judge Wise wrote the marriage care opinion. And again, without getting to details, I, I think it, it's safe to say this, that, that being a clerk to a, a judge in any court system doesn't mean just being a lawyer. You're not a hired gun for the, for the judge. Your job is not to just write an opinion that reflects um, what the judge wants the opinion to say. You know, a lawyer, of course, has a duty to advocate zealously for their client, but when you're a law clerk for a judge, your responsibilities aren't just towards the judge. They are towards all these things, in my opinion. And so if you uh, disagree with the judge, your job is to stand up and speak to the judge. Whether I agreed or disagreed with Judge Wise in the drafting of the Merit Care case is entirely specious. Um, I, I would say that some opinions that I worked on for the judge, um, I agreed with them in whole or in part and perhaps from time to time disagree. 
Now, the great thing about working for a federal judge is, like Judge Wise is, he wants you to push back. He needs you to push back. It's easy to find somebody that just will find a bunch of cases and, and, and help him edit and footnote his opinion. It's quite another to have somebody who, who keeps him on the right path, on the righteous path. So I remember times when I agreed with Judge Weiss, times I disagreed. I remember quite vividly, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, one time having quite a heated discussion with the judge as we walked down the hall in our green carpeted and green military painted chambers. And the judge listened to me and listened to me and read my memo. And finally, he turned around and stopped in his tracks, looked at me and said, Ira, someday when you're the judge, you can decide the case this way. But today I'm still the judge. And that was the end of it. Now, of course, then at my point, at that point, our job is to make sure that the judge has the best opinion possible, right? One that, that is defensible, one that passes muster. There were other times when the judge and I disagreed and I convinced him to change his mind. I'd say both of those were some of my proudest moments as a wise guy. Having a judge who I could stand up to, whether I prevailed or not, and sometimes, yeah, I, I did. Um, the only thing I'd say that the judge really didn't get to continue deciding and to which he probably should best have deferred to uh, Monica and to the clerks was on the color choices he made for paint. When I clerked for him in the late 90s, um, it was time to replace the carpet and, and the paint. And he chose the paint, which turned it out to be some sort of radioactive lime green, at, at which point Monica announced that the judge was not deciding what the color of the new carpet would be. Well, <laughs> regarding the opinions, Judge Wise, as, as Art noted, wrote his own opinions. But that doesn't mean his clerks had little to do. Um, we did quite a lot. We would help him edit the opinions, expand the opinions, change the opinions, revise the opinions, refine the opinions. But he wrote the first opinions. And from that, we learned a lot. If you look at any opinion written by Judge Wise, you see in that very first paragraph, what was the issue? What was the outcome? You don't have to dig through the whole opinion to find out what the case was about or what the, the result was. We learned a lot from Judge Wise. And I think that, that he, he relied upon his clerks. He treasured having his clerks. He's the best kind of judge. He's the kind of judge that didn't need clerks. He wanted clerks. So my service to the judge, of course, was in, in that regard. I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of, of merit care in this respect. What I'd like to do is move on to teaching and scholarship. And when we get to scholarship, I'll, I'll give some more of my thoughts on the, on the statute and the merit care opinion. Because just like I had an opinion in chambers all those years ago, I, of course, have my own opinions today, which may or may not reflect what was said in chambers. So let's move on to teaching. As I noted, I'm a teacher of IP. I teach patents, copyrights, internet law, but I also teach CivPro. I have now since, gosh, since uh, 2005, I believe, when uh, Dean Dave Herring um, asked me to teach uh, legal process, which was our first semester CivPro course. And that was my baptism to teaching CivPro. I have come through the years to the conclusion that 1367 is one of the best ways to teach CivPro and to test CivPro. My students always think the personal jurisdiction, it's all about the personal jurisdiction. And of course, we spend a lot of time on that. Personal jurisdiction is really, for the most part, cases about other judicial cases. It's the judges reflecting on other judge-made law. But 1367 is so much more. 1367 is about relationship 
not just between judges and judges, but, but, but between judges and Congress. The problems of 1367 that Professor Fander noted and that Dean Perdue noted are about the relationship between the judiciary and Congress. It's a separation of powers issue and a hugely important one, but it's even more important than that because it's about federalism. It is about the separation and division of power between the federal courts and the state courts, which means the questions of jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, are amongst the most difficult, most important decisions any judge could make. But they also, as a teacher, and again, I'm talking about teaching here, as a teacher, it's about how can I best ensure my students learn how to read statutes, they understand the concepts, and more importantly, how they take the various pieces they learn from day to day and put them all together. That's where supplemental jurisdiction comes in. Um, I've done Cali lessons on, on 1367, a Cali lesson on 1367. I, I run a website that has as videos and, and handouts on 1367, as well as other matters of, of CIPRO. I spent a lot of time thinking about 1367, um, not necessarily just in chambers, but as a teacher. How do you teach something so difficult with so much kind of history and rancor toward, to it? And the answer is, you got to bite, cut it up into bite-sized chunks, but you also have to know all the pieces. So for my exam this past fall, I had a 1367 question on it, but it was so much more than a 1367 question. To understand how to answer a 1367 question, you've got to understand original jurisdiction, which means you need to have, at least at that 1L level, mastered diversity jurisdiction, alienage jurisdiction. You need to understand a mountain controversy rule. You need to understand what it means to be a citizen of a state or a citizen of a foreign state. And that's just one little chunk of 1367 analysis. You also have to know federal question jurisdiction. You need to know the well-pleaded complaint rule. You need to know the Holmes rule. You need to know the Grable rule. I'm not going to get into it. I'm just throwing a bunch of terms at you. But the, the, the point is, is that you got to know a lot of stuff. And by the way, that's just to get you through the second clause of the first sentence of the first part of 1367A. You need original jurisdiction. If and only if you have original jurisdiction, 13, I can pull it up. Here we go. You need to have original jurisdiction. And if you do, and if the non-original claims, the claims lack diversity or federal question or some other form of original jurisdiction, these non-SMJ subject matter jurisdiction claims, well, you can add them on if what? If they share, if they're from the same constitutional case or forgives common nucleus of operative effect, right? Look at all you have to know just to get to that point. Federal question, you got to know diversity. And now you have to engage in an analysis, right? a comparative analysis, almost joiner-like analysis between the claims that have original jurisdiction, the claims that don't. So you got to know a lot of specific stuff. But as a teacher, I can't teach it that way. As a teacher, I got to get into the specific stuff from day to day to day, and the students don't get it because every day they think they learn something, and then the next day they're learning something different. How does it all fit together? Well, here is a place where it can all fit together. So I use a metaphor. I teach subject uh, a supplemental jurisdiction through the ice cream cone method. Ice cream cone? What does that mean? Well, if the federal court is a cone and original jurisdiction is a scoop of ice cream, then that scoop can be in different flavors. It can be diversity flavored. It can be federal question or patent flavored. It can be civil rights flavored and so on. Well, if and only if you have a court with original jurisdiction or a cone with ice cream, you can add sprinkles. Subject, supplemental jurisdiction is the sprinkles. So uh, grappling with the complexities of this statute, I, I, I hope to think has made me a better teacher by coming up with these various methods of explaining difficult concepts and of allowing students to embrace structures that they readily understand that allow them to then incorporate those bits and pieces, right? 
So the first part of the statute is a grant of jurisdiction, again, conceptually. And Dean Perdue did a wonderful job of going through these parts, right? As she noted, part A of the statute is a grant, a really broad grant of supplemental jurisdiction. But of course, B is a, is a section that divests or take away, takes away supplemental jurisdiction in certain cases, right? And I won't really get into the other parts. C is, I say, it's like punting, right? Even if you have supplemental jurisdiction, sometimes you can punt it in the exercise of the court, at the uh, discretion of the court. And under section D, if we kick any of those claims out, either because supplemental jurisdiction is lacking under A or because it's divested under B or discretion to dismiss is engaged under C, well, there's a savings clause. So conceptually, again, how do you teach? You take the deep dive, you go specific, but then you also have to go big picture and allow pe people to put things together bit by bit and build up those structure structures. So if you dismiss under A or B or C, then you might be able to save the statute of limitations under section D. That's how I teach it. Now think of all the things you have to know to answer a question that addresses supplemental jurisdiction. It's a lot. Do most students get it all? No. But do they get enough? Yes, and that's kind of the point of the first semester of law school. They even have to understand the basics of joinder. Because after all, how can you know whether you fall in that clause that Dean Perdue noted? Claims by plaintiffs against persons joined under Rule 14, 19, 20, or 24. So as a teacher, this statute has been a godsend because it requires students to understand a lot of judge-made concepts like the aggregation rule or the well-pleaded complaint rule, but it also requires them to engage in careful uh, uh, statutory construction, which is one of the most important skills in the first year of law school, the one that a lot of students like to ignore. Finally, I'd like to talk about an academic thoughts on 1367. And this is part is perhaps more directly, um, if not responsive, at least um, adjacent to the comments made by Professors Fander and um, Purdue. My current thinking about the statute and its history is that, well, let me start this way. With merit care, I'd like to talk about merit care and then about Justice Kennedy's um, opinion in uh, the uh, Exxon versus Alipata case. Um, in merit care, uh, Judge Wise makes a um, kind of textual based argument looking at the statute and looking at this language here under Section B and concludes that. The language is ambiguous, and therefore we need to resort to legislative history. Legislative history, of course, says that the statute was not intended to overrule um, the diverse, the complete diversity requirement, um, Strawbridge, and therefore in the case of uh, Merica Mericare versus St. Paul Mercury Insurance Company, there was no supplemental jurisdiction. Um, let's briefly note the fact pattern in, in Mericare. Um, we had two plaintiffs suing, we had multiple plaintiffs suing one defendant. There was basically merit care um, versus uh, St. Paul, the insurance company. It was an insurance defense claim. What happened was there's a um, an, an elderly care home in, here in Monroeville that had problems with the roof. Uh, the insurance company uh, refused to cover the claim. And so merit care and Quinlan, a related company, joined under Rule 20 as co-plaintiffs to sue Merit Care, to sue St. Paul, the insurance company, for insurance coverage. I'm betting you that, that, that almost all the practicing lawyers in this room have dealt with a million cases similar to that, either in insurance defense or insurance coverage or the like. Very familiar kind of stuff. The thing, though, that even though the parties were completely diverse, um, Merit Care was the only one that met the amount in controversy, at that point, um, over $50,000. Quinlan, a related company, also had a coverage claim, um, but at the time of removal, nobody realized that that claim was only for $5,000. Of course, $5,000 is too insufficient, 
And under the uh, well-established rules of aggregation, um, as noted earlier, um, aggregation was not possible between the claims of Medicare and Quinlan. Now, at the time, uh, the parties, of course, made a wonderful briefs on the merits uh, on the insurance issue, on the insurance coverage issue, bad faith, this, that, and the other. And there was really only a reference in a footnote, as I recall, to uh, the jurisdictional issue. The parties kind of glossed over it. Well, wise guys, that's not something you do to Joe Wise. Joe Wise is always going to ask sua sponte. Do we have jurisdiction? Do we have power? Because as that man of honor, he doesn't want to exceed the power of the courts. And there, there's a tension here, which I'll get to later. Do you have to exercise power to limit power? That's what I think Medicare does. Power on time. Okay. I'm being told we're running short on time because how long have I been going? Have I been going 22 minutes? It feels like two minutes. Okay. My apologies, Yo Yo. I will quickly wrap up. What I want to get at here is I think Judge Wise reached the right outcome in merit care. I think he had the right outcome. I'm not sure that I entirely buy the argumentation. He said that the statute here was ambiguous. I really don't think it is. Um, he backed that up then by saying, even if not ambiguous, the statute leads to an absurd result. I'm not sure it does that either. What we instead have here is a real dilemma. Jurisdictional issues, the issues of court power, are, are some of the most important issues the courts have to grapple with because a court that exceeds its own power, think of Erie versus Tompkins, right? Erie versus Tompkins was a case where the Supreme Court said, we've been overreaching in our power for 100 years. Courts that overreach in their power are, are dangerous to a democracy. Judge Wise didn't want to be a judge in that kind of court. So to some extent, I'm not sure I agree today with the rationale of Medicare. I do agree with the outcome. Um, Justice Kennedy makes a much more textual-based approach, but in the end, I think that he makes a rather pragmatic uh, opinion um, as well, trying to reach what he thinks is a fair outcome. Um, so thank you very much. We do have three all-star panels after this one. I am told that we are well over time. Uh, so I'm very sad to say that we will not have time for questions. I'll close by recalling a uh, bar association meeting where the judge said that to, to lawyers, uh, this concept, jurisdiction, it's a funny little word. I have to be careful what I mean when I say that word. So all these years later, I think you'd be very pleased that we're still studying it very closely. How about a hand for our, our panel speaker? Thank you. Well, about the now. Yeah. 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 A little gray, but we're just going to be we're just going to be waxing today. Oh, fine, fine. Go for it. I I have some some introductory remarks I can make. Um, and you'll find them. Five minute break. Five minute break, and we'll get we'll get uh yeah 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 five minute break everyone, and we'll get we'll get moving.
second panel today. And um, I'm Professor Charles Katubi, and I clerked for Judge Wise between 2002 and 2004. Um, in my brief remarks to, to introduce this panel, I do want to say one thing about the judge that hasn't been mentioned yet, is that Judge Wise was truly an internationalist. Uh, I know the, the word globalist these days is a bit of a dirty word, and I don't, I don't want to peg him with that, but he was definitely an internationalist. And, you know, I, I think it stemmed from his time in the military um, on the battlefield in France, seeing the devastation that could be wrought by war. And he, the judge really believed in the rule of law and especially private law and private international law as a, as a global force for peace. Um, in 1994, when he was a judge on the Third Circuit, he published an article on the service of process by mail under the Hague Convention, which was an issue that was just decided, what, five years ago? Um, so as a judge in the Third Circuit, he was publishing on these issues. Um, we have here at Pitt Law the Center for International Legal Education, which Professor Ron Brand began um, back in 1995, was it, that it started. And Judge Wise was one of the first advisory board members um, to CILE when it was created, a position he held until 2014. He was one of our biggest supporters, our largest donors, and one of our, our, our biggest advocates um, in the law school. I was his clerk, as I said, between 2002 and 2004. And when I was hired, he told me that he, that he hired me because I had a demonstrated interest in international law. And when I left Chambers two years later, it was, you know, as we, as all his clerks know, is always a, a, a solemn uh, um, departure from Chambers. Um, and he brought me into his green carpeted um, uh, Chambers, and he went over to his wall. And he had a series of old maps on his wall. This is one of them. And he walked up and he took it off his wall. He took it out of the frame and he rolled them up, three of them, and gave them to me. And he said, I know you're really interested in international law. I want you to have these. So I took all three and I had them reframed. And they were in my office when I was in private practice in D.C. for 20 years. And now they're back here in my office here um, at the law school. If you're scouring Judge Wise's jurisprudence for, 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 for noteworthy and impactful cases, it's hard to overlook um, his decision in Mannington Mills uh, from 1979. Um, it's been cited, I, I counted four times by the United States Supreme Court and hundreds and hundreds of times um, by, by, by lower courts. So I'll, I'll set the stage. We're going to use Mannington Mills, I think, as a foil um, here, we're not going to talk about, we're going to talk about anything a little bit. We're going to use it as a foil to talk about international comedy, prescriptive comedy, um, to, be, to be specific. So I'll, I'll give a little brief, brief introduction of Mannington Mills. Mundane beginnings, two manufacturers of vinyl flooring um, with competing patents, Mannington Mills being one, and Conjolium, and they both hold a number of competing patents. Mannington Mills lodged civil antitrust claims against their competitor, alleging that their overseas licensing practices and threatened threats of patent enforcement overseas violated the Sherman Act. The claim was based on Mannington's allegation that Conjolium had made fraudulent misrepresentations to 26 foreign patent offices in obtaining its foreign patents. The district court dismissed the case on active state grounds, Deciding that, um, that 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 challenging the validity of foreign patents should be determined by the respective states where the patents have been granted, and that in enjoining conjoining from enforcing their foreign patents would violate the active state doctrine. You know, on appeal, Mannington argued that it wasn't precluded by the active state doctrine, and that the use of the United States courts to resolve these antitrust claims regarding overseas conduct. Um, was consistent with the extraterritorial application of the Sherman Act. So the panel, in, a, in, a, in an opinion written by Judge Wise, first found that the granting of foreign patents doesn't violate the act of state doctrine, and then proceeded to talk about and decide whether jurisdiction should be exercised in this case. Now, that choice of words has been honed over the next 44 years. Uh, we're not talking today about abstention from jurisdiction, right? We're talking about Mannington Mills and what is decided on how to look at whether a, um, a whether when a statute reaches extraterritorially, prescriptive comedy, as we would call it today. So what we're going to do here is a bit of a conversation. 
amongst the, the panelists and, and, and some brief introductions are in order. Um, right here, we have Professor Linda Silverman. She's the um, Ashley Professor of, of, of Law at NYU. And I'm going to also start without going into full backgrounds. You can look at them on the, on the website with little personal introductions. Um, Linda's from Pittsburgh. She grew up on the hard scrabble streets of Duquesne. So she is a Pittsburgh girl at heart, even though she's uh, in the high lofty towers at NYU. And to her right, we have Professor Trey Childress um, in from Malibu at the University of Pepperdine, uh, Pepperdine School of Law. Um, a bit of background, Trey, um, we were um, associates together, um, young, fresh faced, just out of clerking associates at Jones Day many, many years ago. And I do recall, I do recall, I will say this, being um, in an office talking about the extraterritorial application of the RICO statute and what is now a very famous case that Trey and I were the young, young lawyers talking about that issue. So it's pretty remarkable that we're here today talking about the issue again. And then we have Professor Ron Brand here at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, who's the, the founder of CILE and, um, and one of my mentors. If I had two mentors in my legal career, one was Judge Wise, the other one was Professor Brand. So it's a great panel to have here today. So I gave the introduction to the facts of Mannington Mills. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Brand first. Um, can you talk with us and tell us a little bit about how judges dealt with this prescriptive comedy, extraterritoriality leading up to Mannington and what Judge Wise did in Mannington? Thanks, Chuck. And thank you to the group uh, of, of uh, Weiss uh, clerks for the opportunity to be a part of this very special experience. As, Judge, as, as Chuck said, uh, Judge Weiss was a real friend of our international programs here at, at Pitt Law. Uh, and I used Mannington Mills in my international business transactions class. In fact, some of the students here, we just covered it yesterday. <laughs> Uh, and I, but I think of it I, I probably a little bit differently than, than Linda and Trey think of, of it. But uh, I grew up in rural Nebraska in, in farm country, and uh, I think of kind of the the old farmers' rule. Uh, the old farmers' rule, as I see it, is don't step in it unless you absolutely have to. Uh, and I think that's sometimes the way judges must think about foreign relations issues. And the Mannington Mills case, and, and when we talk about comedy and prescriptive comedy, and as, as Chuck said, he, he the case ends with, or in Judge Weiss's words, whether jurisdiction should be exercised. Now, what that phrase doesn't say is whether judicial jurisdiction should be exercised or whether legislative or what we call prescriptive jurisdiction should be exercised. And there's been a good deal of debate about that. We know that Article 1 and Article 2 of the Constitution give clear foreign relations powers to Congress, or foreign commerce, among other things, and to the president, certainly. But Article 3, we never really think of giving foreign relations powers to the courts. Uh, and so, but this is where courts have to deal with that question. And I think understanding Judge Weiss's opinion in Mannington Mills uh, really requires understanding two important elements of context. And so I, what I'd like to is try to set some of that context. One is the history of other case law leading up to the case. Uh, and the, the second is uh, the set of doctrines that had developed uh, at the time that opinion was written and uh, they continued to develop. Uh, the deal with I, what I see as the natural discomfort of judges Experience, that they experience when they face uh, these kinds of issues. Uh, let me begin with, begin with the second of those uh, and use it uh, to, to lead to the first. The, the, the comedy doctrine that Judge Weiss applied in Manning to Mills uh, really can't be considered without acknowledging uh, a kind of uh, the, the background here. It, it, it is a set of doctrines that, that uh, uh, defendants use in litigation uh, brought in U.S. courts when the defendants went out of that litigation. Uh, but, and that's always the case for the defendant, right? But in this area, it, it's the set of doctrines that apply when uh, defendants try to avoid the litigation based on some element of so foreign sovereign uh, participation, conduct, or otherwise. Now, uh, 
when litigation is brought with foreign states as parties, we have sovereign immunity. And they, if foreign states or entities that are wholly owned by foreign or majority owned by foreign states can claim sovereign immunity with exceptions. That was not Mannington Mills. There were no states. It was two private parties involved. Uh, if the defendant, as in Mannington Mills, uh, thinks that the conduct of a foreign state should be taken into account or a specific act should be taken into account, they can assert the act of state doctrine. And as Chuck indicated, uh, the district court decided the case on basis of act of state. Uh, the Third Circuit, in Judge Weiss's opinion, uh, said the act of state doesn't apply. The act of granting a foreign pat patent is a ministerial act, not the type of act that the act of state doctrine gets into. And then it's not a conflict that gets created uh, among states when you're talking about ministerial acts. It's the kind of political acts uh, that we should be uh, concerned about. Judge Weiss also meant, uh, briefly mentioned a, a related doctrine, foreign sovereign compulsion, uh, that comes out of act of state, one that's very seldom successful, but really only one case that, that really demonstrates its real effect. But then he got to the doctrine of comedy. He didn't decide it on the basis of comedy. He sent it back to the district court to develop a more complete uh, record. But before doing so, uh, he expounded on the test that he wanted the lower court to consider uh, against which to uh, put that better record in place. And the test that he used expounded on the Ninth Circuit's Timberlane case that had been earlier decided. And he listed 10 factors to be considered to balance the interests of the United States and other states uh, in order to determine whether it was reasonable to go ahead uh, with the case. And he said, and I want to quote a couple of things. He said, this may indeed be a situation where the consequences to the American economy and policy permit no alternative to firm judicial action enforcing our antitrust laws. But before that step is taken, there should be a weighing of competing interests. He then went on to say, if an American company is excluded from competition in a foreign country by fraudulent conduct on the part of another American company, then our national interests are adversely affected. In a purely domestic situation, the right to a remedy would be clear. But when foreign nations are involved, it is unwise to ignore the fact that foreign policy, reciprocity, comity, and limitations of judicial power are considerations that should have bearing on the decision to ex exercise or decline jurisdiction. Uh, he cited several cases uh, where there had been conflicting judicial conduct in the United States, uh, U.S. with other courts, but primarily U.K. and, and Canada at that point. Uh, and then saying the record's not enough, sent it back. But now I want to return to the context of, of, of history because Judge Weiss and his colleagues on the Third Circuit in 79 were not the first to address this question, of course. Uh, and they were addressing specifically the question of U.S. antitrust law to conduct that had uh, foreign party implications, 26 states in this case. But in 1909, uh, Justice Holmes wrote for the Supreme Court in American Banana versus United Fruit in a case that considered allegations that a New Jersey corporation had engaged, in, engaged foreign governments uh, to help it squeeze out uh, an Alabama uh, corporation uh, from the banana trade in Latin America, uh, noting that the acts causing the damage were done outside the jurisdiction of the United States and within that of other states, Holmes found it surprising to hear it argued that they were governed by an act of Congress. And then he concluded that a conspiracy in this country to do acts in another jurisdiction does not draw to itself those acts and make them unlawful if they are permitted by the local law. Now there's debate about whether the American banana decision was really an act of state case or a restrictive view on territoriality. Uh, but after the effects test adopted in the Alcoa case, a Pittsburgh-based case in 1945, 
Uh, courts have consistently found clear congressional intent to apply U.S. antitrust law beyond the borders of the United States, so long as what has happened has an intended effect within the United States. Now, what Mannington Mills brought to the table, I think, uh, is the question of whether a court may decline to decide a case even though Congress intends the statute involved to apply extraterritorial. This brings uh, with it the question of defining just what legal analysis uh, is, a court is applying. Uh, it's not form non-convenience so and a decision to decline to, to exercise judicial jurisdiction that otherwise exists. Uh, it's not a matter related to sovereign immunity, a doctrine defined by statute uh, that invo must involve a state. Uh, it has been discussed, and in the Alcoa case, it was described as subject matter jurisdiction, but that case is that term for this has been left by the wayside. That's not what this is. Subject matter jurisdiction is a judicial jurisdiction concept. Uh, it is legislative jurisdiction. It's prescriptive jurisdiction. Uh, but it, it's more than that, I think. Judge Weiss's opinion, I think, clearly demonstrates a belief that the question involves the exercise of judicial discretion in determining whether to apply the, extra, the law extraterritorially. And, that's the factor that's been the focus of a whole lot of subsequent uh, discussion. The approach in Mannington Mills was, was basically written into the third restatement in 1987. It was written out of the fourth restatement in 2018, based largely on what I consider to be dicta in the Supreme Court uh, case. Uh, and all of this then is grist for us to think about and talk about, I'm sure, uh, and, and, and there's a whole lot of commentary that leaves things without clarity, but today we have two people who are going to give us perfect clarity on the doctrine. <laughs> Before we get there, I just want to interrupt very briefly when you use the term, the restatement um, of foreign relations and judicial discretion. I think you were right, and I I did know I did not know Judge Weiss very well, but I didn't meet him particularly in this context when um, my mentor and um, colleague Andreas Lowenfeld, who was the reporter on these provisions of uh, the Restatement of Foreign Relations, and Andy's view was that this factor test, which Ron refers to and is incorporated into the restatement, and this concept of reasonableness was not judicial discretion. I mean, his view was that, the, if you can believe it, and we know in other contexts, those of you proceduralists, uh, international shoe, reasonableness is um, a legal rule. So Wellenfeld's view was that this was a legal obligation, and it was not judicial discretion. Now, I believe that he and Judge Byers disagreed about that. Judge Wise was very happy to find all of these factors out from Mannington Mills in the third restatement. But I think, and obviously I don't know, but I think he was much closer to Ron's characterization of this as judicial discretion. I just wanted to underscore, because Andy's probably watching up there, um, that yes, I understood certainly that he thought that the uh, rule of the, the rule of reasonable was in fact um, a legal obligation. And I know he also would not be very happy with the developments which will now fall out. <laughs> Well, that's what I want to get to now is those those developments, right? And then, so I talked to Professor Childress about this. So when Judge Wise was writing, the third restatement came out, what there was was a, a set of factors, right? Here's a, what are the seven factors or nine factors in Manning, yeah, yeah. 10 factors in Manning. I'll consider all these factors. And, and Hartford Fire, which is also an antitrust case, sort of was like that. But then we quickly moved from a you know, balancing of factors to something more rule-based, in interpreting statutes for their extraterritorial effect in things like Aramco and Empagran. Can you sort of historically take us there on where, this, where the jurisprudence went? Uh, thanks, Chuck. I'll try to. Uh, but to do that, I think I have to take a step back to take, take, take a step forward. And one of the things that I should say, like our colleague at the earlier panel said, that you can teach all of civil procedure through 1367. We can almost teach all of jurisdiction through this idea of extraterritoriality and comedy. Uh, for as long as there have been statutes, courts in the United States have been concerned with their extraterritorial reach. Going back to the early 1800s, in a case known as Charming Betsy, which gets known as the Charming Betsy Canon, uh, then Chief Justice Marshall observed that, that uh, congressional statutes should be interpreted, if at all possible, so as not to conflict with the law of nations. 
And so uh, we saw at that point in uh, the jurisprudence of the United States, a concern with the limits of prescriptive jurisdiction uh, in the context of Congress and the belief that international law itself provided some meaningful restraint on the prescriptive jurisdiction of Congress. Now, the good news uh, or the bad news was that in the 1800s, there just were not many statutes passed by <laughs> Congress that would have had any matter here. And similarly, doctrines of personal jurisdiction were so limited at the time that I don't think many courts in the United States would have been terribly concerned with proceeding to adjudicate a controversy that involved a person who either consented or was served with process in the jurisdiction. And so, so many of these issues that we're, we'll get to in a second in the antitrust context in particular have to do with changes in the way we view law and changes in jurisdiction, not just prescriptive, but also adjudicatory jurisdiction that sweep within uh, U.S. courts uh, personal jurisdiction cases that touch elsewhere, even if they have a contact with the United States. And so there's this concern of extraterritoriality as a rule of international law vis-a-vis -vis the charming Betsy Cannon in the early 1800s. We get to American Banana, as Professor Brand mentioned. And there, uh, Justice Holmes takes a view that doesn't consider international law at all. Rather, he places it within a framework, what I would say, of conflicts of law, and basically adopts what would become to be known as the first restatement view, that the only place that can give rise to the cause of action is the place of injury. And so in that case, what Justice Holmes says is, it's not that we should be concerned with American law being applied abroad, it's that it can apply abroad to conduct that happened in either Panama or Costa Rica, because the only law that could be applied, see conflicts of laws, is the law of the place of injury. And since the United States was not the place of injury, uh, the US law was not to be applied. Now note, the fact that the case was even being heard in the United States as a matter of personal jurisdiction had to do with the fact that you had a US company involved. And so we still had not seen at that point this sort of uh, expansion of personal jurisdiction that would begin again to uh, include many new cases and contestable cases in US court jurisdiction. So we continue going forward, and of course, we have the, the, the monumental change in personal jurisdiction doctrine with international shoe. And so new cases start to come into uh, the court's jurisdiction, and the court has to figure out exactly what to do with them. Now, at this time, we have the conflicts rule that's announced effectively in American Banana. But in the antitrust context, notwithstanding the fact of what the Earl of Justice Holmes had said, the lower courts, in a way, following where personal jurisdiction led them, began to say that if there is conduct that occurs in the United States, even if the harm is felt elsewhere, or if there is conduct outside of the United States, so long as there's an effect within the United States, then there can be prescriptive jurisdiction. And again, I think in a way, this is, this is like a molding, even if it's not intentional or not explicitly stated, of conforming prescriptive jurisdiction with personal jurisdiction. Here we have personal jurisdiction, because a US company did something that caused harm abroad, ergo we have prescriptive. And similarly, if a, a, a non-US foreign company or indeed a US company does something abroad that has effects in the United States, we have personal jurisdiction, ergo we also have prescriptive jurisdiction. Now the problem is that once you bracket those together, you have to have some doctrine that releases the, uh, the valve of, of, of the steam. And in personal jurisdiction, we have forum non-convenience. And so what the courts, I think, did here is develop a doctrine that was designed to figure out when a case, even if it gets through the court access doctrine of personal jurisdiction, even if you could plausibly state a claim under federal law, should still be in the United States. And I actually think, getting back to Manning and Mills for a second, that's exactly what the judge was doing, yeah. right? And there's the part in the opinion, I think it's under Roman II, where he says, personal jurisdiction has not been contested. There has been service of process. For two American companies. Right, yeah. and two American companies. Yeah. And he's, but then he moves on to think about, well, even though we have the power through personal jurisdiction to adjudicate, should we exercise at discretion, I think, as a matter of, quote, unquote, prescriptive jurisdiction? And that's where we come into the, the, to the 10-factor test. Now, even though the Ninth Circuit in Timberland uh, and the Third Circuit in Manning to Mills accepted that test. The D.C. Circuit and Lake, Laker Airways effectively rejects that test. And when it comes to the United States Supreme Court and Hartford Fire, again, an antitrust case involving reinsurance providers in England who, have alleged, who are alleged to violate the Sherman Antitrust Act, um, the court has to figure out, do we go right to this sort of 10-factor test? 
um, or do we use something else? And what they come up with is this true conflict <laughs> idea that potentially, although they don't say it, but potentially the Manning to Mills approach could get triggered, but only if there's a true conflict between U.S. law and the foreign law. Replacing the idea of friction as the key pivot point to making the determination whether a multi-factor balancing test is appropriate. And there they say there is no true conflict. The reinsurance providers can comply with UK law. The reinsurance providers could comply with US law. Since there's no true conflict, there's no risk of conflict, there's no risk of offending comity. And therefore, the, the, the case can be heard without triggering the 10 factors. Can I just, can I, I keep interrupting, but I just um, can't help but when you use the term true conflict, maybe you're going to say something about this, but true conflict um, in conflict of laws terminology, and I say it only because you invoked the conflict metaphor or analogy, true conflict in traditional conflict of laws does just mean that the way you would understand, or where I should say you because you're trained lawyers, but a lay person would understand conflict. One law one law says something and another law says something else. And in conflict of laws doctrine, that's a true conflict. When Justice Souter in Hartford used it, he did not use it in those terms. He used it in the way Ron referred to compulsion and the way Trey just said, you are required to do something that someone else prohibited. And that is how, that's why there is no true conflict in um, Justice Souter's opinion. Justice Scalia, on the other hand, who I believe actually taught conflicts, says to Souter, you don't understand conflict of laws. This is a term of art that um, uh, conflict of laws lawyers know. And so uh, you shouldn't you know, deal with, uh, uh, there is a, in conflict of laws terms, there's a true conflict, but that's irrelevant. Um, and we're just going to balance. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, and indeed, what Justice Scalia does in that opinion is effectively 403 of the restatement, effectively Mannington Mills. Well, he cites Mannington Mills. Correct. He and, cites and, he, and he says, you know, look, this is a this is a question of comity. This is a question of, of restraint. This is a question of reasonableness. And he does the, the analysis. Now, he, does I, so, three, two. he does it in that provision because he agrees that 403 is a compulsion right. case when they tell you to weigh. And he later has buyer's remorse. Yeah, 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 yeah. With Justice Lee, he has buyer's remorse. And so to continue taking our step forward, so we, 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 you know, we have we have this rule from antitrust is that the antitrust laws, American banana, you know, aren't extraterritorial, except when they are developed as by the lower courts when there are conduct effects in, in the United States. And we see it through Judge Weiss, at least one vehicle to figure out, well, if there's going to be in some cases, extreme exercises of congressional prescriptive jurisdiction. How do we restrain it through the 10-factor Mannington Mills test? We see the Supreme Court dodge that whole inquiry at Hartford Fire and say, well, that might be the right test, but only if there's a real conflict between the laws compulsion-wise, between what you're required to do in the United Kingdom and what you're required to do in the United States, because only then do we have regulatory conflict, which we're concerned about. We're not concerned with the outer limits of Congress's ability to legislate. What we're concerned with is regulatory conflict between the United States and the United Kingdom. This sort of gets cast aside then, in the, at least by the Supreme Court, in the antitrust context, in the Epigram case, where, unfortunately for Judge Weiss, the court says the Mannington Mills framework is unworkable. Too complex to be unworkable. Unworkable. Yeah. Uh, and case by case balancing is not what we should be doing. Right? We need a clear rule. Either Congress is in or Congress is out. And, before, and this is going to be a great segue to, I think, what you're going to talk about. But, but the, the, the idea with in and out switches the analysis that, that I began with altogether. It's no longer a question of international law, Charming Betsy. It's no longer a question of conflict of laws, American banana. It's no longer a question of comity, friendship to other countries, see Mannings and Mills. Now it's a question of congressional intent. Now it's a question of congressional intent, which the court then picks up in other cases too, and Morrison, RGR, and others. If Congress wants to do it, they should say it, and we do it. No stopgap, although we'll, maybe we can talk in a second, but I think even in the restatement fourth, there's a possibility of using reasonableness as a rule, like Lowenfeld mentioned, to restrain what would otherwise be an extraterritorial application of a U.S. statute. 
And so with that sort of setting, the kind of taking a step back to take a step forward, letting you know that antitrust cases are, are different, that there was a move from standards to rules, I think that might be a segue to what you're going to say, and I'll turn it over to Chuck. Yeah, yeah, that, well, that's a good, I mean, so you see so much going on here, We're talking about, you know, power of the courts versus the power of Congress, you're talking about standards versus rules, and Linda, that's what, what, what I want to put to you, you re recently gave a, a Hague Academy lecture, which anyone doesn't know international law, that's one of the highest honors you can have is to deliver a Hague Academy lecture on this point that U.S. private international law is moving from these standards that Judge Wise had to more rules, right? And that's that's your your point here. Well, yes. I mean, I I thought Trey was going to mention before we even got to um, the Hartford Fire and Epigram, there was you might call it a blip, but there was a Supreme Court case, the Aramco case, um, which was outside of the antitrust area and. I think, you know, it really came back to the American banana um, approach, whether you call it a presumption against extraterritoriality or you call it a conflict rule as trade in. Um, it was a Title VII Civil Rights Act, which prohibited discrimination on various grounds. A Lebanese uh, citizen was hired in the U.S. to work for a, a Saudi company. Um, he was fired uh, due to his race, religion, and national origin. And the Supreme Court um, held that Again, the statute didn't apply to the defendant's conduct, invoking what it characterized as the long-standing presumption, uh, which you might have forgotten about as you read all the antitrust cases, but this is not an antitrust case, um, but the long-standing presumption against the territorial reach of a federal statute. One interesting thing about the Aramco case, and Trey mentioned it again, is that Congress, shortly after this case is decided, overrules this case, and it passes the 1991 Civil Rights Act and expressly extends the reach of the statute. But and I think this is sort of important when you think about um, the role of the courts versus Congress. Um, it provides for an exemption if the law of the foreign country would be violated. And to some extent, this idea of the if you say in my terms a rule, it illustrates that the calibration of competing U.S. and foreign interests may be better dealt with Congress rather than a court trying to balance um, this all out. And then you get, and if you're just looking chronologically, there's Aramco, and then you get Hartford Fire, sort of an epigram. Um, and so you might think, well, Aramco's just, you know, sitting there. Um, but it gets resurrected, and that is really the trend in which we go on. So in 2010, um, in Morrison versus uh, a National Australian Bank case, the court applied the presumption to a securities claim brought under the 1934 Securities Exchange Act. And here we have um, foreign investors who purchased shares of an Australian corporation on um, the Australian and I think other foreign exchanges, often referred to as FQ case right? Foreign plaintiffs, foreign defendants, foreign events. And the Supreme Court, the lower court, I should say, um, dismissed this case using um, sort of the old kinds of multi-factor uh, test. Um, and the plaintiffs, I think, made one of the greatest mistakes you can possibly make. You, you can lose this case and a case with these kinds of extreme factors and sort of live with it. They decide to take this case to the Supreme Court. And, you know, be careful what you wish for, because the Supreme Court affirms, but it adopts a completely different approach and a completely new architecture to look at how you should think about the extraterritorial reach of legislation more generally. And it states first that it's going to apply this presumption, resurrecting Aramco, against extraterritorial application of the statute, unless the statute clearly says something else. Um, and then the plaintiff said, no, 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 wait a minute. Um, this is, um, things happened in the United States. So this is a domestic application of the statute. And the court now says, um, in order to decide whether this is an extraterritorial or a domestic application, we're going to look to a provision of the statute and say, what is its focus? And at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court says, well, in this kind of a case, the focus is the exchange or the transaction that is where the shares are traded. And so it's a foreign and not a domestic application. And so you get this two-step rule-oriented approach. One, apply the presumption unless the statute is rebutted by something in the statute, either language or context, and then look to the focus of the statute. And so uh, to side, decide if it's domestic. And so then there are two 
later Supreme Court cases, um, the Nabisco case in 2016 and the Western Gecko case in 2018. Um, Nabisco, and uh, that's the RICO case that, that uh, Chuck and Trey, did you work on that case? It, we, it, was, it was a different RICO case. It was a different RICO case. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long case. <laughs> that case was, this case was around for many years. I teach a course in transnational litigation and uh, where the students use these cases and they argue and so on. I do it while the cases are really in the appellate courts um, until it gets to the Supreme Court, then I can't use it anymore. <laughs> um, but that I used that case for something like six or seven years um, as the focus of the statute kept switching. And it had finally it gets to the Supreme Court and I retired. I don't have to use transnational, I don't teach transnational litigation anymore because these cases have all gone away. But Nabisco, um, was a, a civil RICO case um, where uh, the, the EU actually uh, brought suit against Nabisco um, for treble damages under RICO as the result of this sort of elaborate cigarette smuggling uh, scheme. And can I actually like yeah, you to please. interject there for a second? That, that's a key point that pretty much in all of these cases, there were objections from foreign governments yeah. to the okay. extraterritorial application of US law which brings us back to ideas of comity, over-regulation, ideas of true conflict. This case was different it, because it was the, 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 right. the EU itself saying, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Right. We actually are happy with you. Well, they were the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs. Right. Yeah. And, and this, this was asked, actually, at oral argument. Um, uh, maybe Chief Justice Roberts, who said, what should we make of the fact, right, right that it's a foreign sovereign like suing, <laughs> Well, under U.S. law, yeah. and what should we make of the fact that there aren't any objections? Right. And the answer at the end of the day, as you're going to say, is they didn't make any of that anything yeah. to do with yeah, that. It didn't, didn't, wasn't it the oral argument or something? But didn't somebody say, "Well, you're always filing um, these objections exactly. in other cases." Why not this? Didn't they ask yes, yeah, yeah, I didn't I thought so. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. but I just want to make that make, make that point. In the other cases that we've been discussing, there were objections by amicus briefs or otherwise from foreign governments okay. to the extraterritorial application of U.S. law, and here there wasn't, but yet the court didn't use that as to factor into their analysis, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. They're back, you know, they're back to this presumption that they had, and although, and it's an interesting case because they actually say, um, under RICO, you have these predicate acts. Remember I said, if something's in the statute, you can overcome the presumption, and they said, with respect to any of the predicate acts, if there's extraterritorial reach in those statutes, then RICO can be used to um, include those acts. Um, so that's the regulatory context of RICO, if you will. But remember, this is a civil treble damage act. And so the court holds four to three that you have to look at the provision for treble damages, that separate provision, and the presumption applies separately to that provision. So now the presumption applies. And then as to the second step, we have to look to the focus. What's the focus? We're back to uh, the focus of, uh, of trouble damage action for damages is the injury. The injury is outside of the United States, no domestic application, impermissible reach of the statute. I will say that the 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 second case, the Western Gecko case, all of a sudden the court decides, you know, maybe we don't have to ask the broad question of extraterritorial reach Overall, let's just look at the provision. So they go to step two first and they say, um, is this a domestic application? Um, and they avoid the question of whether the whole statute applies extraterritorially. And now um, maybe there'll be some commentary about this focus test, which as you'll see, I sort of favor, although I, I understand its problems because although this case involved lost foreign profits, that is Western Gecko, the court concludes, oh no, no, the focus of the statute is the infringement. And so the infringement occurred in the United States. So it's domestic and we can use US law. Now I just say this whole changing landscape of uh, Ron mentioned it and so did uh, Trey, it's really embraced in section 404 of the new uh, restatement. They, emphasize they, they provision on the presumption. Actually, focus only shows up. I went back and looked to see what provision it was. It's in the comment. Focus point uh, is in uh, the comment. And then there's some additional provision in uh, section 405 that says um, reasonableness um, in uh, 
interpretation. Um, I think, you know, I would still suggest that that's not an invitation to the multi-balancing factor test of Mannington Mills, but I mean, we'll, we'll see, right? And hey, uh, Chuck, I thank you really for the plug uh, of my Hague Academy lectures because it was really one of the great disappointments of my life because I was asked to give these Hague lectures, which you give at the Hague to a whole host of international students. Um, in the summer of 2020, <laughs> they asked you to do this five years before, four or five years before. And it's something if you're, you know, toward the end of your career, you really do look forward to giving the general uh, course. Um, and they said, uh, we'll postpone. I said, you know, I don't think this is going to be over in a year. I mean, how about 2022? And they said, no, no, we ask people for years and um so when 2021 rolled around, they said, we'd like you to give this on your computer. Uh, yeah, see, so sad. So I'm very glad to be here and get at least a plug to a smaller group. But the- It's uh, just like the day. It is. It, it really it's is. Like nice to return. Keep it's 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 hard to keep the so, um, But I did these, there wasn't even an interactive audience. It was just, they basically, I gave them in front of my computer in my house tape. Um, so, um, I did that, um, but my thesis to go back to it, which I had developed you know, over my work is that developments in US private inter international law have generally moved from standards, which I was gonna say are broad and evaluative factors and decisional criteria that look at things case by case. So that's where, that, that's that early Mannington Mills, Timberlane and, and, and in other areas. Um, to more formal rules. Um, and I'm, <laughs> to some extent, a rule person. I like predictability. Um, I like direction. And so while I think a lot of people in this field think that this development has been <laughs> not so great, um, I've liked it. And I, I have used illustrations from other areas, from conflicts, if we start to look at conflict of laws, judicial jurisdiction, other areas of adjudicatory comedy. Maybe this is the best. Maybe this is the area where I said, I know what I can do with my Hague lectures. I can talk about uh, the counter revolution from standards to rules. Um, and prescriptive jurisdiction, extraterritorial reach is, I think, the best example. So I'll just give you a, one case in point. In the uh, pre Morrison securities cases, um, they look to conduct and effects in the United States to try to find some nexus which would justify using U.S. Law, law. And then you would use these other factors, things like the Mannington Mills factor, the restatement factors, um, to decide whether or not it was reasonable to go ahead and apply U.S. law. And I have to say, I mean, I've been in this business a long time, attempting to reconcile these lower court cases was absolutely impossible. And so although not perfect, I think Morrison and that approach has led to greater predictability by, at least in the securities cases, giving you a default rule for civil securities, fraud actions, um, application of US law where the transaction or the exchange is in the United States. I want to also say, and this is again, point that's been was in the first panel and comes back here. Congress can, of course, choose to change that rule as they did. Congress didn't like this in at least in action, securities actions that are brought by the SEC or the United States. And it restores the old conduct and effect test. What I don't know is whether prescriptive comedy is going to come back where I think once they say, well, Congress has now told us that the statute is supply. Um, that's all we need to know. We'll see. Um, the result is that the geographic reach of the Securities Exchange Act differs depending upon, and this is sort of another theme, whether there is private or public enforcement, because that same public-private line also characters the RICO cases, but for different reasons. The court in Nabisco draws a distinction between the regulatory reach of the statute, which can extend, and a private right of action uh, based on its interpretation of different provisions. But I still maintain that in both situations, um, there is a rule-oriented result and not an inclusive multi-factor test. Now, there's a bit of artificiality about the presumption focus analysis. And, you know, others 
I do a lot of cross-border things and uh, people elsewhere say to me, I don't know why you say there's a presumption against extraterritorial reach. In all of these financial cases, they are applying US law extraterritorially. And I say, no, no, you don't quite understand the reasoning. They aren't applying it extraterritorially, extraterritorially as they see it. They are applying it because they think it is a domestic uh, application. So, you know, we've all, everybody who does conflicts and jurisdiction characterization is the name of the game. And this is probably another aspect of how important characterization as a legal process uh, is. Um, and once a focus rule is identified, I still maintain that there is greater um, consistency and application of the statute. And if you don't like it, Congress can change it. And maybe there, that's where the decision ought to lie. So that's my, that was, that was my Hague lecture. And I thank you very much uh, for providing my audience. You know, I, I think that's a great, it's a great segue for me to give a, a minute insight into Judge Wise, too. It, it, clerks might agree or disagree with me. When I was in chambers, one thing he hated, he railed against, it may seem irrelevant here, but it's not, is he hated the sentencing guidelines. He hated the sentencing guidelines because he wanted discretion to be able to decide cases, to be able to, to make decisions that weren't necessarily bound down by rules. And this is one of the reasons why I think he came up with the Mannington Mills approach. But so I want to kick it to, to Trey here. And there has been recent cases where Mannington Mills has, has, has remained cited by the Second Circuit recently in an antitrust case. Right. So you want to chat about that really quickly. Right. So um, even though there's been this movement in the securities context and um, in other contexts towards the presumption, uh, at least in the Second Circuit, Mannington Mills remained. Yeah, yeah. In Manning an antitrust case. In an antitrust case. Uh, and it was called NRA Vitamin C, uh, where there were allegations basically of price fixing from uh, uh, Chinese entities that were, were selling or trying to import into the United States vitamin C supplements. And um, it's a bit of a weird case because it, it, there's two there's two bites at the apple. There's a first bite at the apple, which is centered around this Hartford Fire concern about whether there's a true conflict. Because um, remember, we would only get potentially, at least in, in the current universe, to the Mannington Mills balancing reasonableness approach if there is a true conflict between the laws of a foreign country and the laws of the United States. Here it would be the laws of China and the laws of the United States through the Antitrust Act. And um, the, the first time it went up to the Supreme Court, the question was the a subdivision of the Chinese government had actually filed a brief and said the law of China is X and the um, companies are in full compliance with that law and to comply with US antitrust law would put them in violation of Chinese law. In other words, the Chinese government had said, is saying there's a true conflict. And the question um, uh, for the court, the United States Supreme Court, was whether the Second Circuit had to defer to that in terms of the true conflict analysis or whether it could engage in its own analysis. The Second Circuit had said, China says there's a conflict, there's a conflict, don't, we don't engage in the, uh, we, we can't, you know, we can't hear the case. The United States Supreme Court says, no, 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 that, that's, that's not, it's contrary to the judicial function. You don't even do that in the United States. Right when the United States government shows up and files a brief, the, the Second Circuit doesn't say, well, the U.S. says X, we'll just go with X. Yeah. And so what the Supreme Court says is that uh, statements of foreign sovereigns are due respectful consideration. So the case then goes back to the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit says, we're going to give it respectful consideration. And lo and behold, we come to the same conclusion. There is a true conflict. <laughs> and now we get to do the Mannington Mills factors. And, and the Second Circuit, the first time it did the Mannington Mills factors, did the seven or nine or 10 or however many it was. Thankfully, this time it only does five. Yeah. <laughs> it collapses them into five and effectively concludes that it would be unreasonable uh, to for the United States uh, to apply its laws in, in, in this context. And so this case then goes back up again on a petition for writ of certiorari to the United States Supreme Court, various uh, drafters on the restatement uh, and others encourage the Supreme Court to take the case and say, look, this antitrust stuff is happening in a multiverse, right? For any Marvel, Marvel fans, right? There's, there's this, this continuing one line of time that, that is all about the presumption against extraterritoriality. And now there's like this antitrust universe out here where something strange is happening. And the court needs to take it and resolve, you know, this bit with the uh, antitrust laws. And the court doesn't take it. So at least today, still in the Second Circuit, Mannington Mills is alive and well. 
um, in the antitrust context. And uh, Judge Weiss's work is still being used to try to help the Second Circuit figure out whether um, these cases should go forward. I will note, uh, it, it's not an accident that it's the Second Circuit because with, this goes back to personal jurisdiction, with all the banking and other business and commerce in, in New York in particular, there is more of a sweep of pulling some of these cases into U.S. courts and thus somewhat of a need to have these uh, escape devices, if you will, uh, that, that, like I said, we have form non in the, in the, in the personal juris jurisdiction context. And here we have um, uh, the Mannington Mills framework. So it is still alive and well, even though Justice Breyer uh, in uh, Epigram said it's unworkable. The Second Circuit still thinks it's workable and the United States Supreme Court hasn't seen fit to 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 take the case to, to decide whether it is unworkable. Yeah, the tension is really, is, is really empigram for, and vitamin C, isn't it? Isn't that really the tension in a way? The, the, what the kind of factor well, it, that they it, use? Right. I mean, because yeah. empigram said, empigram right. says you can use prescriptive comedy. It just says you can't. Am I right? You can't no, case by case. case. And, yeah. And yeah. 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 Ron. I, I, I'd like to be a party to the conversation Andy Lowenfeld and Judge Weiss are having at the moment as they look down <laughs> on, on this. But I, I, I want to comment on the, the rules versus principles stuff, because I'm not as convinced as, as Linda that, that that's the way things are going or the way things should go. Uh, and, and I've spent a lot of time in, in treaty negotiations in The Hague, and, and I think that uh, that it, it where in civil law countries, rules are rules and the court applies them and, and you want predictability, but you could get predictability, predictably wrong results from some rules. And I don't like predictably wrong results. And I think it's one of the, the hallmarks of the US common law system and much of the Anglo-American process uh, that emphasizes the importance of the role of judges here. And much of the world, uh, you become a judge by taking an exam straight out of law school. <clears throat> and, and when we do treaty negotiations with countries where that's the case, they do not want judges having discretion. Okay. One of the beauties, I think, of the U.S. legal system is that judges, we trust them to have discretion and to exercise it appropriately and not to have a rigid application of the law, but a fair application of the law. Now, even in the fourth restatement, which takes a more rules-based approach, you come to 405 and it says reasonableness and interpretation. It says, and in the comments, it says, in interpreting the geographic scope of federal law, courts seek to avoid unreasonable interference with the sovereign authority of other states. And then, but we haven't really defined comedy yet, but <laughs> How do you define reasonableness? Well, they do in, in a comment in the restatement is a reasonableness is a principle of statutory <laughs> interpretation and not a discretionary judicial yeah. authority to decline to apply federal law. It operates in conjunction with other principles of statutory interpretation. When the intent of Congress, Congress is to apply a particular provision and it's clear, a court must apply that provision, even if doing so would interfere with the sovereign authority of other states, but they follow that with a paragraph that is headed unreasonable interference with sovereign authority. Okay, so, but, and it seems to me, and I think the Second Circuit has demonstrated in the vitamin C case that whether reasonableness is a legal concept or you think of it as judicial discretion, we're going to do it the same way. And whether, whether you think of the Mannington Mill's list of 10 factors to be balanced as judicial discretion or a legal rule to be applied, is there a different result? Yeah, that's uh, question. Because you think of it in a different way. Right. And it does seem to me, uh, and, and that's why I'm comfortable with these kinds of doctrines in the United States because of the way we, the way people like Judge Weiss become judges. Uh, and, 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 but I don't think these sorts of things work in other countries, and we can't put them into treaties. Uh, but it, but I do think it works here. Let me let me just add to that and, and take a. Uh, I'm not sure I believe this, but I'll take the the advocate's position and say, should why 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 should courts be doing that? 
right? The courts don't have the institutional competency to figure out regulatory conflicts between the executive branch of the United States and foreign governments. And in these cases, the United States and NRA vitamin C has not come in and said one way or the other how they feel. You may, in some of these cases, like China did, have foreign governments come in and say how they feel. But if we determine, and again, antitrust is its own part of the multiverse, but if we determine generally that the statute applies, apply it. Apply it. So can I, can I, I pick I, up I, on... Can I pick on... Answer, Go ahead, Ron. Give a quick Ron, response please. to that. Please. Now I have two proposals. It's working. I think your response. I think, right. I think the response comes from Chief Justice Marshall, who's having the conversation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and Marbury versus Madison. He said the province of the judiciary is to, to tell us what the law is. Okay. And if it's a rule, you still have to interpret that rule. Yeah. And, and ultimately we get that ultimately we get down. To the interpretation, and and, and the courts are, are, are going to have to do that. And of course, the the legislature can say, "Well, this court got it wrong," and writes the statute more clearly. But but I, I go back to the old farmers' rules. I, I just think it makes judges uncomfortable when they're forced into a position where, when in the intent the intent of Congress. To apply a particular provision is clear, a court must apply that provision, even if doing so would interfere with the sovereign authority of other states. I think that makes judges uncomfortable, and I, I don't think you're going to box judges in no matter what you do. So do you, the, the, my, this is my plug for Trey. Trey spent uh, three years as the counselor to the, the, the legal advisor of the Department of State, which if no one knows that is, I think the highest international law position in the United States. So I'll ask you, Trey. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, after the legal advisor. The legal advisor. He's actually the presidentially appointed Senate confirmed person. But, but the legal advisor. That is not. Let's bring in his ear. He doesn't have to sign anything at the same time. Um, but so it, what you're saying is it really matters, though, if the executive comes in and says, this this interferes, this doesn't interfere, this crosses the line, this doesn't cross the line. Yeah, and I'm going to fight against myself. The United States government doesn't want to interfere. Yeah, we, 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 we don't we do don't want to enter these cases. Yeah, and they're and 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 these are good, the private cases, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it's different if you have a public enforcement SEC case. We're in it. Yeah, because yeah. we're we're the, we're the plaintiff. But the United States government as a whole doesn't want to enter. Um, it's too complicated. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, if 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 uh, we may not be the in the best relations with China right now, but I can tell you at the State Department, we don't want to get cross of them by entering a case and saying, "Yep." Let's apply U.S. antitrust law to China. Yeah, we don't want to say that. In fact, if you read the U.S. government briefs in the in the first in vitamin C case, they're a bit wishy washy on on that point. They say, you know, well, respectful consideration is the rule because that's what we get. But that's the same rule we get, so we're not, you know, stepping on China at all. But you so, do have to come in if the court asks you, and the and the and the Supreme Court most recently has really been asking courts in a lot of these transnational cases to to uh, they invite the SG to follow. But I guess you can say. You no, can, you can. But you do us you? Now. They don't. No. Yeah, no. And so, in the, even but in, in the CDSG context, you will see in these briefs a bit of when on the merits at least mm -hmm. a bit of sort of of, of wishy of wishy washiness because um, it's complicated. I mean, and so that's the that's the, to me that's the better argument. So courts shouldn't do this; they're not institutionally competent to do it. If there's a regulatory conflict, then let the United States government come in and say so. Maybe in that circumstance, deference is due to the U.S. and the courts of states hand. But the reality is. The United States is not going to come in. And so then we're back to, well, what do you do? Right. And so in here, the, the court can can say, look, we still apply it. It's up to Congress. But we know Congress isn't going to fix it, generally but speaking. They have in a couple of cases. Uh, the FTAIA uh, and the, the, the Morrison, yeah. Morrison yeah. and Dodd Frank, Aramco. Right. You know, and so um, they're, they're uh, People were saying Judge Wise is, was quite wise, <laughs> right? I think I think in recognizing, maybe not explicitly, but that if anyone can fix the potential for stepping in it and the mess, it is a wise judge. But that does raise other issues of I think institutional competence and other issues of separation of powers and other issues of is that the way you know, we, we, we should we should really be running the railroad. And I think that's what the presumption's about. It's like Congress, if you want to do it, say it. If you're if, if, it, if it's if it's vague, we're going to presume you didn't say it. 
And then we're going to further limit it with this focus test to make sure even if it gets applied, it's going to be to a domestic condition of some sort. Um, I, you know, and yeah. remember the reasonableness, I mean, the uh, presumption doesn't apply in uh, antitrust cases. And so all of these cases that are using reasonableness or prescriptive comedy, there are all cases in, way in which the presumption hasn't operated at all. So you need something um, to restrain perhaps the U.S., so on the one hand, you, when, when, when Congress does it and they told you one way or the other, there you have the rule. And otherwise, we need something. Any questions? I knew Professor Curran would have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have a mic? I don't know if we have one. Maybe you can just move. I'm going to repeat through the microphone. This was a wonderful panel. And um, I thought I would interject a note from comparative law. Um, in an area that does not involve antitrust uh, discovery, where transnational cases are involved, um, where transnational cases are involved, um, and judges, American judges, have rejected the Hague Evidence Convention. So they are using the domestic federal rules of civil procedure. Um, judges faced with foreign blocking statutes, such as the French blocking statutes, where high French government officials, so this is unlike the Chinese case where you just have the high foreign sovereign um, interjecting, you have both that as extra evidence, but you have a clear legislation from the foreign uh, government, from the foreign uh, statutes, um, forbidding uh, the foreign company from divulging the opinions, the uh, evidence that the discovery order requires. American judges tend to nevertheless require um, such discovery. And they, to follow up on uh, Professor Silberman's uh, saying that characterization is everything. They do not, American judges do not view this as extraterritorial application of the law. They view this as, as a question of a foreign interference with American court jurisdiction. So this is US jurisdiction and their duty, especially to American plaintiffs to allow them full discovery, which is a quasi constitutional, if not an actual constitutional right. But if you go to foreign countries, this is viewed as incredible extraterritoriality on the part of the United States. So I just wanted to interject that, and that's the situation where we are today. Comments? Well, I, I mean, I take it from the way you framed it that, that, that you think that U.S. courts should should have maybe a restraining. I approach similar to reasonableness. You find judges saying things like, it's no problem of mine that there's this statute. They shouldn't have this statute. It was stupid of the French parliament to pass it. I, I would just say that, I mean, there's been an evolution over time in, in the antitrust laws. The U.S. was the first to apply them extraterritorially, but and Microsoft is more worried about the EU antitrust laws now yeah. and the effects test that they that the European nations complain so much about. Uh, they now have adopted and taken even further than the United States has, and so this is not just a U.S. issue in terms of prescriptive uh, jurisdiction and application of, of, of legislation. You know, I understand that, and but the Data Privacy Act yes. of the EU, if that's what you're, the I, same thing going to well, except the, the foreign country, the foreign parties in these cases who are required to provide evidence that they say will violate the Data Protection Act of the EU. From what I have seen, and I followed every single case up to maybe two years ago in U.S. courts, the courts, the American courts are saying, that's not what it says. There's no evidence that this will actually be, that the, that the legislation will actually be applied. And I know it's not applied in every EU member state the same, but for example, in France, it is really applied. I, I mean, one thing I, on the comparative front, I mean, I think Ron's right. What we've seen is all the protests against extraterritorial use 
is one of the things you see. The EU in particular, and just the other day, we have a Japanese um, colleague of mine who's visiting at NYU, and she sent me a very recent Japanese Supreme Court case in which the Japanese have extended, she said it's pretty shocking, have extended their law outside of Japan to apply to extraterritorial reach. And she said, I don't think it's going to stay, but we haven't seen any in these EU or even this Japanese case, anything like kind of prescriptive comedy. On the other hand, since you raised the um, Data Protection Act, um, you know, on the one hand, we have said we're not going to do balancing. And I'm not sure if you you saw that, I'm sure you did, the, the EU Court of Justice case in the EU Google France case, in which all of a sudden they don't, you know, you read the statute, they, they're they going to limit the scope of the, the, uh, the General Data Protection Act, at least with respect to the right to be forgotten, because what they say, it illustrates the kind of prescriptive comedy. They say, you know, the European right of the right to be forgotten is not recognized in many countries. Other countries have strong uh, policies about full access to information. And so they do not, in interpreting the GDPA, they do not um, extend that obligation to delist to, delist to non-EU defendants who list information on websites outside of the EU because they had initially, the French had extended it to um, uh, Google and, and they pull off. So all of a sudden, at least in that one instance that I know of, there's kind of balancing in the classic balancing sense of the term, not multi-factors, but at least um, you know, a concern about um, the interests of a foreign state. You know, and I'll, I'll just add that, it, um, you know, the market kind of takes care of itself in some ways, though, like in this antitrust context, at least, um, uh, there is substantial coordination between the United States Antitrust Division and antitrust divisions throughout the world simply because of this. And they have tried to develop executive to executive standards for prosecution and otherwise, now, of course, we have the interesting wrinkle for the United States, and you have it in some other countries as well, is the fact that you can have private lawsuits about, about these matters. And that's the real concern. It's private lawsuits and class actions, and that takes us in a whole separate conversation. But, um, uh, you know, if the judges don't sort it out, um, other other actors can and, and, and do. Not, not perfectly, but... But again, getting back to uh, to the point that there there are there are other branches of government who who can deal with some of this regulatory conflicts. But one other area that we haven't mentioned yet that is going to I think breed some cases uh, soon is export controls and sanctions law, uh, and with the whole you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the various sanctions, and there there are going to be uh, contrary, uh, there are going to be. Uh, in-house counsel are dealing with problems where they really do have true conflicts and not only is compliance with one law, it's going to be a criminal act in another state. And so uh, there's more of this to come. Well, we're going to see one of these uh, one of these doctrinal tensions, at least, just so we leave you with sort of what's going on right now. There is a case in the Supreme Court to be argued next week, right? Uh, 21st. Yeah. Um, uh, which is going to raise the question of the Lanham Act, um, in which um, the 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 lower there's an old case in which the court used the sort of language of foreign commerce to say, oh, it extends extraterritorially. Unfortunately, none of the recent cases say that all of the recent cases say, no, no, that language doesn't count. So w will they follow that or overrule it? Or will they say we're gonna? It's like the antitrust cases, so we'll just use prescription. Or will they move and say no, no, it's a presumption in focus and use that analysis? I mean, Trey, you've looked at. Yeah, the I, yeah I was just adding. I mean, one wonders. I mean, at least, um, I mean, the United States government in their in their in their brief in that case has basically said that. Um, uh, Belova is a one-off, effectively, and that the test now is the presumption, and interpretive canons change, and even though when Congress legislated, it was legislating in a certain universe, that universe has changed since Morrison and RGR and everything else, 
And so you apply the two-step and you look at the focus and what they're going to now. As I said to you on the phone, focus is in the eye of the beholder. I said character. Right. And so right? a miracle of miracles, the focus of this is going to be confusion, right? Yeah. Trademark confusion, which will then allow you to sweep in sweep in these cases. You know, one of the things that I, I presume the court is going to continue with the two-step in a creative, you know, uh, uh, opinion that sort of gets gets uh, around the, the steel company issue and comes back to the RGR issue. One wonders if the Second Circuit will take note of that in the antitrust context because it's the same idea: is that you have a you have a precedent which permits it, even though that precedent is in tension, arguably with the with the with the presumptions two step. And so, um, I guess for, back to Manning to Mills for a second, assuming the court in uh, that case uh, decides that the Lanham Act gets the two step. I wonder if the Second Circuit, in an in a, in, a, in an antitrust case, say antitrust continues in its own line, or now the courts pretty much make clear they're just chipping away, and Lanham gets it, and Lanham Act and the antitrust act should be interpreted in the same way, et cetera, et cetera. I, I mean, I cannot see the court in the antitrust area, you know, changing the antitrust cases. There's just too much water under the bridge or over the bridge, wherever it is, and. Remember Scalia in Hartford Fire actually, you know, he says that the antitrust yeah. cases are just different. So I can't see the court retracting. I don't see them. I mean, I think you're probably right. We only have the only Supreme Court case is Steele. So yeah. they only have to get rid of one. But then you're back to this notion of what's the focus? The the in the, in, the sales all took place abroad, right? And what so it looks like it would be extraterritorial. And the, the U.S. government has said, and of course the plaintiffs, um, oh no, the focus is confusion, custom potential customer yeah. confusion. I and so, um, well, the SG says remanded back yeah. so we can get some evidence mm -hmm. about whether customers were really diverted. They would have, they would have U.S. The, the, they would have been customers of the U.S. company if they had bought these, right? Yeah. So that case, just so we'll leave you on this note, yeah. that case is Abitron versus Heck Petronic. If anyone anyone is curious, that's going to be arguing next week. Um, that's that's it. We're gonna we're gonna end and go to lunch now. Um, thank you, the panelists, for wanting in and for being here. And um, we will meet back here in, in one hour at, at, at one o'clock. We couldn't have put it on and flown people in from all around the country to do this event without the support of our sponsors. I know representatives of many of the sponsors were here this morning. Some may have left, but if you are here, as I recognize you, please come up because we do have a, 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 a gift and a token of our appreciation. So um, is anyone here from Buchanan Ingersoll? No. Okay, we'll get, it, we'll get that to you. Um, the Allegheny County Bar Association. Anyone here? I know they were here this morning. You're here? All right. Come on, come on up. Please, please, please. Um, uh, BI and, uh, and the ACB sponsored breakfast and lunch for us, which we really appreciate. Each panel was separately sponsored. So the first panel was sponsored by PNC. I don't think anyone's here from, from PNC. Uh, PNC Bank has been one of our biggest supporters this year, not only for this event, but uh, a, another small plug, what they've done for our LLM program this year, and especially our rule of law scholars, um, the, our students from Ukraine and Afghanistan are here on full tuition scholarships because of the support of some of these places like PNC. So uh, thanks to PNC. Um, Leach Tishman, um, Steve Irwin, can, can, okay, great. I knew Steve wasn't here, but thank you. Um, Bill, can I talk in a minute, please? Thank you very much. Bill's going to talk about in a minute about the uh, about what Leach Tishman was able to uh, to, to to do for us. Um, Saul Ewing, Saul Ewing has sponsored the current panel um, on on profession professionalism and ethics. Um, so thank you very much for your sponsorship of uh, of the event. Um, and we also have um, the dinner tonight um, and was sponsored by um, uh, Mary McKinney. Uh, is Mary here? Mary, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to grab this now or do you want to grab it later? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Uh, I think I, I, I may have given some out. Um, all right. Del Sol, Cavanaugh, Sprite. Where's Arts at? Did you give it to him already? Yeah, this guy. You grabbed it already. Okay. <laughs>
Arts Forum is sponsored panel four, which he is moderating. He was excited to get his gift. Um, so, so, he, uh, so he grabbed it early and Duquesne University as well. Help us get the word out and help us, help us put all this together. But Leach Tishman's put together and sponsored our, um, our gifts to everyone who showed up today. So Bill, why don't you come here and talk about what, what, what that gift is? He, Bill was a driving force behind this and, uh, and, and the arts. <laughs> So uh, two people said to me earlier today, what are these boxes and do they need to be immersed in water? So each of you, uh, we uh, encourage you to take one of these on your way out and sitting next to it is a uh, full page description of what you're looking at. In 2003, the tradition began of having judicial bobbleheads created for law clerk reunions. Uh, this one is a very special one. It depicts the judge standing right next to the judge is Chester Warnicky, the gentleman that rescued the judge on the day he was grievously injured on the battlefield. The base shows the battlefield in France where the event occurred. And the various depictions on the front here are uh, commemorating events in the judge's life. We want to thank uh, the Wise family and the Warnicky family for granting us permission to create these bobbleheads for you. The one side also commemorates the uh, renaming of the uh, courthouse in the judge's honor and a recognition of the event for which you're receiving them. So please pick one up on your way out and it does not need to be immersed in water. <laughs> so I have the- Go ahead, please. I, I, I have to introduce you. No, you don't. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, it's Bill Jansen, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the uh, the ethics portion of our presentation. And if you're like me, every time this moment comes in a CLE, the thought I would rather be eating broken glass runs to mind. Fortunately, you're in for a treat. We have absolute, uh, the uh, bright lights of the professional ethics community who are in a, a position to share with us some remarkable insights in this area, a very important area of law. First, uh, a big shout out to uh, Saul Ewing for uh, making uh, panel three uh, possible, as Chuck said, without the support of our sponsors, the uh, symposium would never have happened. So thank you very much, Saul Ewing. So the judge uh, was an impactful figure in all the lives of the law clerks who had the distinct privilege of working with him. From 1987 through 1989, I had the privilege of joining uh, four remarkable law clerks uh, learning at the knee of the master. Art story oriented you to the judge uh, at the beginning of the proceedings today. and We thought panel three ought to be on civility, professionalism, and ethics. And one, that's an important component for CLE. Two, it was truly a defining attribute of Judge Wise. And I would not do that justice uh, better, certainly, than a series of uh, legal superstars did this on the occasion of his taking senior status. And I offer this to set the stage for why ethics, professionalism, and civility is so critical, a component of a 100th celebration of the judge's birth. So let me just run through these quickly for you. Third Circuit Chief Judge Aldersert wrote, some do it better than others, but few do it better than Joe, and none do it as nice as he. Fellow Third Circuit Judge, the late Carol Lose Mansman, lawyers continually pay him the highest professional compliments, 
the recognition that he has never forgotten that he was once a lawyer. U.S. Solicitor General Ken Starr, his magic lies in the fact that he is a far-reaching, far-seeking judicial reformer who at the same time is marvelously self-effacing and gracious. He listens, and with care and respect. The late Dean Sell, University of Pittsburgh School of Law, never have I heard a lawyer criticize Joe as a judge, even when the decision was not what that lawyer might have desired. We in the profession are much the better because he walks and works in our midst. Chancellor Nordenberg from uh, the University of Pittsburgh. What is remarkable about the man extends beyond the quantity and quality of the professional accomplishments. It includes the way he approaches others, and particularly the, particularly the way he deals with people in his life. To merely report that Judge Wise is greatly admired is something of a profound understatement. He enjoys the highest professional respect and the deepest personal affection. Attorney David Fawcett, how does one who constantly decides contentious litigation that lawyers and citizens cannot resolve themselves continuously receive admiring accolades? Close friend and fellow uh, circuit judge Leonard Garth, Garth, his presence helps us to take heart against forebodings. I've had the privilege of being a teacher for 17 years now, and we always talk early on in our semester together about Judge Wise and how you can be at the absolute top of the profession and not be a jerk. Um, the importance of ethics, civility, and professionalism are challenged in a very real way at the moment, and thankfully, we have three rock stars to walk us through that. Our first presenter is Nathan Crystal. Mr. Crystal is the managing partner of Crystal and Gianni Crystal, LLC, with offices in Atlanta, Charleston, New York, and Washington. His practice and law firm focuses on professional ethics, international business and litigation, and data privacy. He is an adjunct professor of professional responsibility at NYU and the author of several books and numerous articles on professional ethics and contract law. Please join me in welcoming Nathan to the podium. Well, thank you, Bill, for that kind introduction. As I listened about Judge Weiss this morning, uh, I had three emotions that went through my body and mind, and uh, envy, admiration, and regret. The envy is I've had some great mentors in my life that helped me become, I think, a good lawyer and hopefully a better person. But Judge Wise seems to have been much more influential than that, a mentor, if, the, the ultimate in mentors, so to speak. And I envy all of the clerks that he's had over these years and that he has so influenced in so many different ways. And you can imagine the number of additional people that have been influenced by those clerks. The second is admiration for how well Judge Wise lived his life, a life that was extended very fortunately because of the help of another person and uh, how Judge Weiss was able to achieve so much with the time that was given to him. And hopefully all of us can use that legacy to live our lives to the maximum extent possible. And finally, regret. Uh, regret that there aren't more lawyers and judges like Judge Weiss. We need them in this time. We have faced very difficult times and we hope that there will be people that will come along following his lead, following his legacy, and carrying on those values. As Bill said, the, the thrust of this panel is to see whether or not Judge Wise's uh, contributions in civility, professionalism, and so on, uh, whether they can be maintained and extended in an era in which they are under, under challenge.
So the title of this work is A Philosophy of Lawyering Based on Judge Weiss's Nuanced Method of Judicial Decision Making. And I hope to develop this into an article for the publication by the Pittsburgh Law Review. So to answer the question that's posed in the charge to this panel, I did two things. First of all, I looked at his opinions on Rule 11 cases, and uh, I certainly didn't look at his entire body of work, and I'll be interested to see whether some of the things I say would carry over into some of the other uh, aspects of his judicial legacy. And I asked the question, based upon those opinions, whether the reasoning could be applied to the work of lawyers, recognizing that lawyers, of course, have clients. Judges have responsibilities, but they don't have clients. And so there is a fundamental difference between the work of lawyers and the work of judges. And that's one of the things I want to explore in this, uh, in this paper. Now, in the paper, I draw a distinction between what I call polar and nuanced judicial reasoning. Now, with regard to polar judicial reasoning, I characterize it as having the following aspects. A judge in a reasoning in a polar matter will hear the arguments raised by the parties with regard to the issue presented to the judge. There are certainly cases where a judge might reformulate the issue and say the parties aren't, don't have the issue straight, the issue is different. But in most instances, the judges are going to be ruling on the issue presented by the parties. And there will be arguments presented by one side, arguments presented by the other side. The judge will consider those, find arguments more or less persuasive, and render a decision based upon those contending arguments. So in that sense, the, uh, the judge is acting like a uh, referee or like an umpire in order to, to decide, those, uh, decide those matters. The judge using polar reasoning will fulfill the judge's primary obligation, which is to decide the case before him or her. Uh, of course, to decide it fairly, but ultimately to decide the case. In nuanced judicial re reasoning, however, uh, there is a difference to how the judge approaches the, the case. It's from multiple perspectives, in particular, the perspective of the attorneys, the parties, and third par persons who may be affected by the decision. And the judge will be sending messages to all of those affected uh, interests about what would be proper behavior, what would be improper behavior, the expectations of the judge's conduct. And ultimately, the judge, like a judge using polar reasoning, will also decide the case. So the ultimate obligation is nonetheless carried out by a judge using uh, nuanced reasoning as opposed to, uh, to polar reasoning. The difference between the two is in the messages that the judge sends in nuanced reasoning to all of the affected groups. Now, as an example of nuanced or of polar judicial reasoning, uh, in the article, I'll discuss the case of White versus General Motors, which is a case that's in our case book. It's a wrongful discharge case. Um, and in that case, the, the court found that the lawyer was subject to, the plaintiff's lawyer was subject to sanctions in that case because the lawyer violated the fundamental obligations that the lawyer has under Rule 11, that is reasonable investigation into the facts, reasonable investigation into the law, and not bringing the matter for an improper purpose. And without going into detail about that case here, which I will go into in, in the article, the one of the examples of the failing by the lawyer is the it was a wrongful discharge case. The discharge employees had signed general releases it was part of a special program at General Motors to uh, reduce their, their payroll, but they had signed general releases. They claimed that the general releases were ineffective, but the lawyer didn't investigate the grounds for ineffectiveness, either legally or factually. 
and therefore the lawyer was subject to sanction. And I think that's a good case of, of polar reasoning. The, the court in that case looked at uh, the contending arguments and ultimately found that the lawyer's arguments were not persuasive and the lawyer is, uh, was subject to sanction. Now, I don't want to be uh, mistaken here about criticizing polar reasoning. I'm really not criticizing polar reasoning. I don't think polar reasoning uh, is wrong. Uh, and in fact, polar reasoning is often a very highly efficient way for courts to resolve decisions. And again, the court would be acting as an umpire or a referee, and that can be a very, um, a very efficient way of deciding. Of course, this day and time, the uh, efficiency of referees and umpires is becoming less and less efficient with regard to uh, with regard to referees. We now have uh, the instant replay, which is not so instant, where you the referee has to look and, and make a decision about whether the call on the field was correct or, or incorrect. By, by the way, it's a good way of teaching students about the standard for review. <laughs> So uh, uh, it, it used to be more efficient than it was. Maybe it's fairer now than it, it was, but certainly less efficient. And of course, baseball, those of you who follow baseball know they've now introduced the, uh, the, the time limit on pitching. And so in the background, you have a clock, and I forget how many seconds it is, 15 seconds that you have to deliver the pitch. Uh, the batter has to be in the batter's box within eight seconds. So all of this is supposed to improve the efficiency of, of baseball, but it obviously has added a lot of complexity to it and maybe a, a fair amount of unfairness because I know there's at least one game in the uh, in the preseason where the batter didn't get in the batter's box within the eight seconds that was necessary, and the umpire called a strike, which was made the batter out. And this was the bottom of the ninth inning, so the, the game ended on the uh, batter not getting in the bat batter's box in time. And you can imagine that happening in a World Series game. Uh, hopefully, the players will uh, adjust to that, and, and I think they are adjusting to it. But it, the basic point is that, that there are these uh, aspects of both football and and uh, and baseball that are undermining the efficiency. But back to the point here is that polar reasoning, I think, is an efficient. May, um, means of deciding. And it's not one that leaves out reasoning, because when I talk about polar decision-making cases, these are in all types of cases, not just per curiam orders where there aren't any reasons given and, and simply uh, the order comes down. Uh, polar reasoning applies across the board, where uh, you have arguments on both sides, they are articulated, the, the judges state the reason why those arguments are unpersuasive, they give the decision. So there's a lot of strength to polar reasoning. So what's so good about nuanced reasoning as compared to polar reasoning? And so here I want to look at the Giardo case, one of Judge Weiss's uh, most important Rule 11 cases. And in Girardo, um, the case itself is basically a uh, also a, a wrongful discharge case. The plaintiff alleged that after 16 years of exemplary service, the defendant company fired him because he refused to falsify quality control documents. The company defended on the ground that the plaintiff was an at-will employee and that his discharge did not violate the public policy exception to the employer's right to discharge an at-will employee. And so um, in Gerardo, first of all, what I found remarkable about the opinion when I first read it was almost all of the opinion is devoted to discussion by Judge Wise of the philosophy, application, and limitations of Rule 11. Now, perhaps that can be explained by the fact that Rule 11 was only recently amended at the time he decided. The case was in 1987. The rule had been amended in 1983, uh, but there had been a number of court decisions in the meantime under the rule. So this was a very extensive discussion of the background, purpose, and so on of the rule. And in the end, he reaches the conclusion that the judge, that the lawyer should not be subject to sanction in that case. But what was important to me was that uh, the judge in rendering this opinion was not acting as a referee, not acting as an umpire. And certainly he did that in the sense of deciding the case, but he was acting more as I would see it as a coach or a teacher 
of the lawyers, of the lower court judges, of the counterparties in the case. And so just to give a little feel of that without going into detail in the case, he speaks to those three categories and, and, and more than that really, but three principal categories. The litigants bringing claims, the counterparties who might seek sanctions, and the district judges who much must decide these sanction issues. So looking at the first uh, group, the litigants who may be subject to sanctions, the judge speaks to them in a way, how can you avoid sanctions? What should you do to avoid sanctions? And there's a famous quote from the case in which the judge says, quote, the rule imposes an obligation on counsel and client analogous to the railroad crossing sign, stop, look, and listen. It may be rephrased, stop, think, investigate, and research before filing papers either to initiate a suit or conduct the litigation. And there's a lot more there in terms of the instruction and teaching that he gives to litigants in order to avoid Rule 11 sanctions. In terms of the second category, the guidance to judges in determining sanctions, he gives an, a lot of options to district judges about how they can decide a sanction other than just a monetary sanction. Uh, and he, these are, uh, I think, a fairly complete listing of what he, what he indicates as possibilities. Warnings, oral reprimands in open court, written admonition, circulation of sanctions opinion within the firm of the offending lawyer, an interesting solution, uh, required attendance at a seminar, and he indicates that dismissal in extreme cases would be possible, but judges may be very reluctant to jeopardize a client's case because of the lawyer's indiscretion. And he's very clear that sanctions are not a general fee-shifting device. Judges are still bound by the American rule with regard to attorney's fees. And then finally, he speaks to the counterparties, the ones who may be seeking an award of sanctions. Judge Wise says, the goal of sanctions is reducing litigation abuse rather than fee shifting. And he refers to the duty of mitigation on the part of the party seeking sanctions, who may seek sanctions, as a way of reducing the excessive burden on a party who may be subject to sanctions and also reducing the tactical advantage to bringing a sanctions motion. The judge cited with approval a quote from another case in which the court said the attorney should use telephone conference calls or status conferences to alert the court to abuse rather than the more expensive formal motion. And finally, Judge Wise gave guidance for all of the parties and that it was on the line between proper and improper litigation contact, conduct. Judge Wise said, just as mere failure to prevail does not trigger a sanction award, neither does advocating new or novel legal theories. But having said that, then he goes on to say, counselor client do violate the rule by mounting an attack on existing law, not in good faith, but rather promise prompted by such improper considerations as harassment, undue delay, creativity by itself is not enough. So in broad terms, I see Judge Wise as dealing with really a fundamental aspect of the adversarial system, the tension between effective advocacy on the one hand and the sometimes, uh, sometimes risk that the system can be abused and how to draw the line between those two. And in a lot of ways, he's putting the ball in the court of the litigants, the counterparties, and the lower court judges to draw that line with the instructions that he has given about the underlying purpose and goal of this rule. So can Judge Weiss's approach, the nuanced approach of reasoning, be transferred to the work of lawyers, especially in light of the fact that lawyers have clients while judges do not? In my book on professional responsibility and in some articles I've written, 
I argue that lawyers need to adopt what I call a philosophy of lawyering. And by philosophy of lawyering, I mean it, it can be broadly construed to mean a philosophy of life where the practice of law is an aspect of one's overall life philosophy. But it can also be more narrowly focused on the particular issues in practice where lawyers face uncertain questions of professional responsibility. And I think these uncertain questions come up much more frequently than lawyers may realize because many of the rules are discretionary. Many of the rules are open textured in the sense that they give a general standard, but the standard is itself uh, not clearly defined. Earlier panel talked about the reasonableness standard and the meaning of reasonableness. Reasonableness pervades the rules of professional ethics with regard to lawyer conduct. Now, I have discussed four philosophies of lawyering, client-centered, a philosophy of moral value, a philosophy of institutional value, and defensive lawyering, or more broadly, lawyering in the self-interest of the lawyer. So turning first a little more detail about these different philosophies, the client-centered approach to lawyering, which is, I think, the approach that's most often used by lawyers, particularly in certain areas of practice, like criminal defense practice, it has two different central ideas. One is the pr principle of professionalism. Lawyers should do everything possible to advance their client's interests, and they should refuse to act or refrain from acting on behalf of their clients only when it would clearly violate a rule of professional conduct or applicable law. Zealous representation on behalf of the client is the essence of the client-centered approach, with the restriction only being clear violation of rules of ethics or clear violation of law. And the second aspect of this is the principle of non-accountability. Lawyers are not morally responsible for the actions they take on behalf of their client in their professional role as lawyers. In a way, it's a little bit like someone going to war. And if it is a just war, and your conduct in a just war involves killing someone, normally killing someone is a moral wrong, but in the pursuit of a just war, it is not morally wrong. The second of these philosophies is the philosophy of morality. So in case of doubt about what your professional obligations would be, a lawyer should act in accordance with general moral principles. Now, that leaves some difficulties with its application. When we talk about moral principles, we'd have to say, okay, whose moral principles? Is it the principle of the lawyer? Is it the principle of the client? Is, the, is it general morality? And what happens if any of those systems of morality don't give answers to the uncertain questions that you've got? So you're left indecisive by the philosophy of morality. There would be another aspect of the philosophy of morality, which is, if the lawyer is going to use his or her own morality to decide uncertain questions, aren't clients entitled to a disclosure by the lawyer that that's what they'd be doing? So that is another uh, issue with regard to the philosophy of morality. The philosophy of institutional values <clears throat> would say that in case of doubt, a lawyer should ad adhere to the values that ex express the social or institutional role of the lawyer. So if a lawyer is acting uh, in a litigation matter, the fundamental institution is the adversarial system. And a lawyer's conduct should be consistent with the adversarial system and not undermine the adversarial system. Just to take one example, if the client wants to send a crucial witness overseas where they couldn't be reached by the, uh, by the processes of the tribunal, a lawyer who follows an institutional value would find that to be improper conduct because it's undermining the fair, fairness of the adversarial system. The professionalism move, <clears throat> movement, uh, which is embodied in a number of codes and in a number of uh, court rules, one that I found uh, very detailed and very useful is the civil, civility and professionalism guidelines of the United States District Court for the Central District of California. But the ABA website has 
an extensive listing of all of the professionalism codes around the country, these are an example of a commitment to at least certain aspects of institutional structure. And finally, a, a philosophy of uh, defensive lawyering or self-interest and um, can be embodied in, in a, a, a quip about lawyers. That is, if someone has to go to jail, make sure it's the client and not the lawyer. <laughs> and so, uh, but that is the, the core of defensive lawyering is to protect yourself. Now, it can be a broad notion of protecting yourself. In other words, the lawyer, in case of doubt, I'm not saying the lawyer always does things in the lawyer's interest. I'm saying in case of doubt, the lawyer should err on the side of protecting his or her reputation, advancing the lawyer's monetary interests, avoiding risk of discipline, malpractice, disqualification, or criminal prosecution. Uh, the more limited notion of uh, this form of lawyering is, de is, is defensive lawyering. In case of doubt, make sure you avoid either criminal prosecution or uh, other forms of action against you. Now, each of these philosophies represents a perspective on the resolution of an uncertain ethical issue. So uh, the client-centered approach obviously focuses on the client's interest. The morality approach focuses either on general moral values or on the moralities, moral, moralities of a particular person involved in the, in the issue, whether it be that of the client, the lawyer, uh, or perhaps even the judge. The uh, institutional philosophy focuses on the values on which the legal system is based. In the case of litigation matters, the adversarial system being one of those values. And the defensive lawyering uh, approach focuses on the lawyer's personal interest. Now, I think Judge Wise's nuanced approach can be applied to unclear ethical issues by examining the issue from each of these perspectives. In other words, just as Judge Wise in dealing with Rule 11 looked at a number of different perspectives in deciding how that uh, issue should be resolved, I think the same broad approach can be applied uh, to dealing with uncertain issues of professional, professional ethics. And to take an example of this, just to see how um, how the uh, the matter might be applied or resolved in a nuanced approach. One difficult issue that lawyers often face in practice is a disclosure issue. When do I have an obligation to disclose information that is adverse to me or adverse to the client, to the court or to the opposing party? Rule 3.3 uh, deals with this issue extensively, labeled candor to the tribunal, a little overbroad in how it labels it because the, the obligations of disclosure are limited to the text of that rule, but there are a number of aspects of that rule in which lawyers do have an obligation of disclosure. Uh, probably the most famous of those where the lawyer has introduced or the client has testified falsely and the lawyer under the rule has to take reasonable remedial measures, including if necessary, disclosure to the tribunal of the false testimony. Now, the, um, the hypothetical I wanna play with is a little bit, um, uh, is based upon that rule, but is, is a, a difficult one for a lawyer. Suppose it's a case where a witness is called by the opposing party and testifies falsely, but the testimony is favorable to the client. So as a more concrete example, suppose it's a criminal case, suppose there's a witness called by the prosecution. Surprisingly to the prosecution, the witness testifies that the defendant was at a certain place at a certain time, uh, and it's very advantageous to the defense. But the lawyer knows that that testimony is incorrect. What are the lawyer's obligations in that situation? And does the lawyer have an obligation to inform the tribunal of the false testimony? 
Now, there are a couple of, of rules that relate to this. Rule 3.3A3 says, if a lawyer, a lawyer's client, or a witness called by the lawyer has offered material evidence and the lawyer comes to know of its falsity, the lawyer shall take reasonable remedial measures, including, if necessary, disclosure to the tribunal. So one of the things uh, that's missing from that rule is it doesn't talk about false testimony by the opposing witness. It only talks about false testimony that's offered by the lawyer. So based upon that rule, you might say the lawyer doesn't have an obligation to disclose. But there's another rule that comes into play in, in Rule 3.3, and that's 3.3b. A lawyer who represents a client in an adjudicative proceeding and who knows that a person intends to engage, is engaging, or has engaged in criminal or fraudulent conduct related to the proceeding shall take reasonable remedial measures, including if necessary disclosure to the tribunal. So a clear case in which that rule would apply is if the lawyer knows that there has been bribery of a witness or bribery of uh, maybe even bribery of the judge, the lawyer would have an obligation to, to disclose that. This rule is not limited by the misconduct of the, it's, it applies to any person. And if we have a witness testifying falsely and if the witness was lying, that rule could apply to the, to the situation. So, and we don't know, the lawyer doesn't know whether the witness is testifying uh, just by mistake or whether or not the testimony reflects uh, an intentional lie by the lawyer or by the, uh, by the witness. So how should a lawyer using the nuanced philosophy of reasoning based upon Judge Weiss's nuanced philosophy, look at this issue. So I would say the, the lawyer ought to look at the four different philosophies that I mentioned. First would be the philosophy of the client-centered approach. Is there a clear obligation under the rules to disclose in this case? And the answer to that is no, because under rule for the first rule, the lawyer uh, we're dealing with a witness not called by the lawyer, that rule does not apply directly. And under the second rule, we don't know whether or not there is criminal or fraudulent conduct. So the rules themselves don't provide uh, a clear answer, and therefore under the client-centered approach, the lawyer should not disclose. What about the philosophy of morality? In which way does that, uh, does that point? Well, I think we would all agree that lying is generally a moral wrong. Maybe there are exceptions to that, white lies and so on. But as a general proposition, lying is morally wrong. But the lawyer doesn't know that the witness is lying. It may only be mistaken testimony by the witness. And even if it, even if the person was lying, it's not really the lawyer's lie, it's the witness's lie. And so does a lawyer have a moral obligation where the witness is lying and the lawyer is not lying? Now, we could complicate the situation more. Suppose it's on cross-examination that this testimony comes out, where the lawyer is actually involved in eliciting the testimony. So the issue of morality becomes more difficult in that situation. But at least as, as the facts as we have it now, where it comes out on direct examination by the prosecution, it doesn't look like the philosophy of, law, of, of morality would require the lawyer to do anything. What about the institutional interest? There is an institutional interest in the tribunal not being affected by false testimony, but looking at these rules, the institutional interest seems to be a limited one, either one in which the lawyer brings out the testimony through the lawyer's own witness, or one in which the lawyer knows that there is intentionally false testimony that's offered. And so the institutional interest, it maybe points a little bit in the direction of disclosure, but certainly doesn't clearly call for disclosure. And finally, lawyer self-interest. Uh, if the lawyer were to make this disclosure, the lawyer may well open himself up to claims of ineffective assistance of counsel, to a disciplinary proceeding, maybe to a malpractice case, although those are fairly, fairly rare when we're dealing with, um, with criminal defense lawyers. So under the nuanced approach, looking at all of these different aspects of the problem, 
The client-centered approach does not call for disclosure. The morality approach is unclear. The institutional interest weakly points towards disclosure, if at all, and the lawyer self-interest points against disclosure. So both the client-centered approach and the lawyer self-interest approach would point against disclosure under this nuanced approach. We could take a, a more simplified version of uh, Judge Weiss's uh, nuanced philosophy, and that is he drew a distinction between abusive lawyer on the one hand and creative lawyering on the other. And if we take the situation the lawyer faces in this hypothetical, is it closer to creative lawyering or is it closer to abusive lawyering? And I would say it doesn't come close to abusive lawyering. It comes much closer to creative lawyering. It's not exactly creative lawyering, but on this on this uh, spectrum between those two, it falls closer to the uh, to the uh, uh, creative lawyering side than it does to the abusive lawyering side. So the bottom line of, of this is that I think the the uh, Judge Weiss's nuanced approach to reasoning has potential for developing a more comprehensive uh, approach to uh, lawyer decision-making under cases of uncertainty. And my plan is to develop that in more detail in the article, but I would be most appreciative of any comments you have about the presentation uh, to help me with the article, and I've given you my email address. Well, thank you very much. Our second presenter uh, is, I think, tied with Trey and Joe for journey, journeying the farthest to be with us today is Nancy Rappaport. Professor Rappaport is the UNLV Distinguished Professor, the Garmin Turner Gordon Professor of Law at the William S. Boyd School of Law, and an affiliate professor of business law and ethics at Lee Business School at UNLV. She is the former dean of the Nebraska Law School, the Houston Law School, and the interim dean of the UNLV Law School. She specializes in and is a renowned scholar studying the disciplines of business ethics, ethics and government, law firm behavior, and the depiction of lawyers in popular culture. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Rappaport. Yes, well, look at, gosh, you I've never there. looked better. All right. Um, <laughs> that little button that one? will advance you. Perfect. Excellent. Hi, everyone. It is wonderful to be here. This symposium has given me an opportunity to learn a lot more about an amazing judge who truly valued civility. So this is a matter after my own heart. Thank you for inviting me. So when Bill called and said, hey, you want to come to this cool symposium, he said, I noticed you wrote an article a little bit earlier in, in North Carolina about can we use law students to model civil behavior, to calm down difficult discourse, and to enable people to have good conversations with each other so that they could learn from each other. And I thought, yes, I would like to write more about this. And I thought, I had a good thesis. I don't know if y'all have been following Stanford Law this week. My thesis is in doubt, but the original thesis was we train students to listen carefully, to be able to disaggregate arguments, to be able to put on really good arguments. So why can't we deploy legions of law students into hard conversations and help them tamp down discourse? Since I wrote the article, I've noticed that social media has made us meaner. I don't know if anyone else has been following the, the, the sense that the anonymity of social media and the attacks, the tweets, the retweets, the quoted tweets, there's a meanness to our dialogue that we never had before. And so what I was going to do before law students overtook my thesis, what I was going to do was talk a lot about social media and how that has affected our discourse. And as I was doing it, I found this great book. Um, does anyone follow Dylan Marin at all? Yes, we've got one person who follows. What? 
Is he as nice as he seems? Excellent. So he he was posting videos on YouTube and tweeting, and he was getting a lot of hate messages. And it frustrated him, and it was a little frightening. This man is remarkable. He wrote a book that I love called Conversations with People Who Hate Me. And the thesis of the book was, why don't I actually talk to the people who have sent me hate mail and see if we can reach some common ground? And he has a podcast, and I'm, I want to talk to you afterwards about him because that is so cool. And I was reading the book, and I was going to do an analogy, and then a couple of incidents, not just Stanford, but there's been an incident at Seattle Law School. I don't know how many, how many of you read Above the Law the way I do. It's sort of like People Magazine for Lawyers. All right. So this was reported in Above the Law, and I think Law 360. It started in Seattle at Seattle University School of Law, where a group of CivPro students, a subset in a section, decided they didn't like the way the professor taught. They actually decided this. I, I've gotten a little bit of inside information, but without revealing all of it, they, they heard in orientation that he was going to require Friday classes. I know. And <laughs> that he was going to require a lot of pre-class work. They were going to meet together in groups and do a lot of extra work. And a subset really didn't like this. So they already entered CivPro expecting not to like this guy. And like all of us, he made some verbal slips that were not good and some students misinterpreted it. And it got worse and worse and worse. And some of the students went to the associate dean and to the dean and they complained and they didn't feel as if they were being heard. So a, a smaller group of students went and gave anonymous quotes to Seattle's undergraduate student newspaper with very specific language in it saying that he had called certain groups horrible things, racist, sexist, transphobic, the works. And so the student newspaper printed this. And the university does what universities do. In addition to being dean of been a provost, universities investigate things when, when something bad happens. The, the professor had taped his classes. Ever since COVID, a lot of us tape our classes in case students have to miss class. So he had kept all of his classes. The university reviewed the tapes and said he had never said these things that the students had alleged in the article that was reported by the student newspaper. Afterwards, when the students were told the university investigated and found these claims to be false, the students said, we still stand by our statements. So where it is now, the students are standing by something that is demonstrably untrue. The student undergraduate newspaper, like many undergraduate newspapers, doesn't know what to do, has not printed a retraction. And as you can imagine, this poor law professor's name is mud in every internet search everywhere. And so I started thinking about what did the law students do by giving their comments anonymously to the student newspaper rather than, in essence, signing their names to it. And you know, if you're a lawyer and you do bad stuff, you say false statements or you allow false statements, you, there are repercussions. Rule 4.1, we've got rule 8.4C 8 .8 that says we can't engage in conduct involving dishonesty. These aren't lawyers, though. These are law students. They're not there yet. But as I'm thinking about my original discipline, let's, let's, let's have students go out into the community and diffuse conversations. I thought maybe not these law students. <laughs> because we have not taught them the types of civility that, that Judge Wise would have wanted them to learn. And see, great minds think alike, same quote you had up there. <laughs> the, the stop, think, investigate, and research was something the students didn't do. So I started blogging about that. The beauty of a blog is anyone can have one. I have a couple of posts. The original one was about students making anonymous allegations. The second one reacted to the fact that the students didn't retract their allegations after their allegations were proven false. Now, full disclosure, I know the professor. He's my co-author on my PR textbook, ironically enough. So I do have a vested interest in somebody that I know and care about not having this hanging over his head. There's Bernie, there's me. But I wanted to go back to my original 
question of did social media change the way these students were behaving by making anonymous comments much more comfortable for law students. And so I started reading his book again. And, and he was talking about when he was first making nasty, snarky comments on the internet, he viewed it as a game. There was a winner and a loser. If you said something snarky, you got more views, you got more hits, you became more popular, people read you more. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. You wanted to be snarky because you got attention. And he decided that that original non-nuanced polar version of thinking about it, this is right and this is wrong. And there's no nuance in between, although it felt good in the short term, wasn't doing him emotional good long term. And I don't know how many of you read Pearls Before Swine. I love this. I love this strip. And this whole idea of there's good and there's bad and there's nothing in between is perfectly captured by this three panel strip. So he started thinking, how can I have a conversation with people whose views are so diametrically opposed to mine that we have no common ground? Can we create common ground? And he got really nasty comments on his stuff. You should die, everything, all of these horrible things. And he started thinking, how can I make this instead of just lobbing accusations at each other? How can I make it into a conversation? Do I have other dancers in here? Y'all have never danced. All right, some of you have danced. You know that there's a lead and a follow and it becomes a dynamic. Then, and I care passionately. I know, I, I, I'm a dancer. I'm a competitive ballroom dancer. So I know about lead and follow and the beauty of a real conversation is you're not just spending your time saying, what am I gonna say next? You're actually listening to the other side, taking it in and then responding based on what you've just heard, real conversation truly is a dance. And I'm thinking these, these first year law students could have had a conversation with the professor. He did say things that offended them and they could have decided I'm gonna be brave, I'm gonna to talk to him out of class and I'm gonna say, did you know that the way you said this is hurtful to me? which is what I would want a student to do if I had made a misstatement like that, come up to me and say, this was hurtful, this is why. If somebody is unintentionally saying something that is hurtful, the grown-up thing to do is to engage in a dialogue about it. Now, there are intentionally hurtful people out there, and I don't think that everybody should be treated the same. And many of us have been subject to comments where they say later, oh, I was just joking. And you know they weren't, but they're just trying to back out of it a little bit. But if the one else who had a beef with the professor had actually gone to him, knowing this professor as I do, he would probably have absorbed it and rearranged how he referred to certain things and how he addressed class. At least they would have had a fighting chance. And I know that some law students are brave enough to do this because Jeff, ha Jeff, Jeff Hazard made national news as a First Amendment scholar when he decided no longer to use a really loaded word in full in his classes because his students said, this makes me feel incredibly unwelcome. Is there another way you could teach this? And he said, I'm not gonna use that word anymore, bar none. So you can have those conversations with professors but first you have to be brave enough to want to have the conversation and you have to have it with a partner who is brave enough to listen. And again, when you're anonymous, you're just lobbing things back and forth. This has to be a very personal conversation. But if people are willing to listen and actually ask themselves, is there something underneath this I could learn from? It's a very different dynamic from I'm right, you're wrong, end of discussion, mic drop. It's a very different dynamic. So back in my central administration days, we had a student protest at UNLV. And we didn't just wanna leave it as a protest. We actually wanted to hear from the students. I have learned how to run conversations where people can talk about their feelings in a way that, that decreases stress rather than increase stress. These are the rules that we used in that conversation. 
You're the only person who knows your feelings. You're absolutely allowed to talk about your own feelings. You're just not allowed to tell anybody else what he or she is feeling. Tell us what you're feeling. And then because we didn't want to favor some comments over other comments, we said as a ground rule, we're not going to respond to anybody. We're taking it in and we're taking notes and we're learning from it. And we had about an hour and a half of conversation at which at the end, we had action items that actually made UNLV a slightly happier place because we had had a conversation instead of a screaming match. So what are some of the dangers when you start in a really highly stressed, nasty conversation, there's a tendency to refute point for point for point, everything the other person says. And Dylan calls this the everything storm. If you're responding to every offensive thing the other side is saying, you can't really do anything. There's too much noise there. So you have to figure out how to focus, catch one thing and engage in a dialogue on that. He pointed out again that if you're really having a conversation, you're not trying to win the conversation. It's not like a debate. You're trying to engage with someone human to human in the way I assume the judge would have wanted us to do and actually learn from the perspective of whoever is on the other side of the table having that conversation with you. So one of the, one of the quotes I love from the book is when he decided to give up doing a point for point refutation and actually say, there's no scoreboard. We're locked in a fluid back and forth. Finally, we are dancing. Well, how can a dancer not love that conversation? But it's true when you're really, really listening to the perspective of somebody else and not thinking of your next statement to say at the time, but actually taking it in, that's where civility starts and understanding matures. If you're just doing it point for point, there's almost no point to that conversation at all because you're not going to get anywhere. I found that people screaming at me has never changed my mind on anything. But people listening to me and asking questions often gets me to at least move back from an extreme position to a slightly more middle of the road position because they've respected me enough to ask me questions and given me space to answer. One chapter in his book said that there's different ways of asking questions. There's the one where you're still, you're asking questions, but not to get information from the other side. Lawyers know this. We're asking questions just to make our point over and over and over again. That's the whole point of cross-examination is we're making our point through somebody else. And he said, that's not the dance we're talking about. That's interrogation. And that's the meanness that the internet often facilitates as part of that. And then the final part of his book tells this great story where he was, he's in New York. And there's somebody not recycling properly in his neighborhood. And his first instinct is to do the Rappaport equivalent of, dear mush for brains, do you not know how to recycle? And he, he thought, do I just post a sign that's nasty to get this person to stop recycling? And then he thought, well, what have I learned from writing this book? And so he dropped a note at the, if you're recycling, your address is on those cardboard boxes. So he knew who it was. So he dropped a note and said, perhaps you don't know our rules. Let me help you with those rules. And he got a note back that said, thank you. I didn't realize that. I will do better from now on. No nasty altercation. Everybody comes away happier from that. The neighborhood is more peaceful. And so that is the end of that part of his book. And I found it delightful. So going back to... If, if you haven't followed the Stanford Law, Stanford Law students protested a Fifth Circuit judge who counterpunched in kind. Nobody came off good in that conversation. In Seattle, we have the situation of my co-author now looking for another position with the first thing on his Google search being potential racist professor. So he has to deal with that. And so I'm thinking, can we teach law students as we're teaching them civility to have different ways of engaging when their first shock factor is you have offended me. And the natural counterpunch to you have offended me is I'm going to take care of that. Can we teach them to react in different ways? My husband and I disagree about this all the time. Um, 
he was raised differently from me. And so his first presumption is somebody means to be a jerk. Mine is, let's not automatically chalk it up to malice. Maybe they don't know better. So we, we have this debate in our house and, and quietly I've decided I've won that debate, but I wanted to show this. He'll, he'll tell you otherwise. I wanted to show you this because if you start off with the presumption that the professor didn't mean to hurt you, you have a different conversation than you do if you start off saying the professor is obviously a racist because why else would he have used this term or that term or started an introduction to a chapter on this? So you can start by presuming people aren't necessarily as deliberate as you think they are. The other thing I noticed both in the Stanford law situation and in the Seattle law situation is there, there is a sense of, I must be right. My way is the only way of thinking about something. And I think we've lost the ability as a, as a society to have this very humble question. What if I am wrong? I'm assuming that since Judge Wise was full of humility, he would not have had a problem with what if I'm wrong. That's why he had law clerks debate things with him. He wanted to make sure he was right. If we start conversations with maybe I don't hold all the answers, maybe then we can start inculcating a better way of doing dialogue. So that comes back to can we teach, even in inflamed situations, law students to de-escalate and recalibrate a conversation? Um, there is a, a reference in here, and it will be a reference in my paper to the old light bulb joke. Does anyone know the light bulb joke? It's the only joke I remember. I've been told many, many jokes, but it's the only one I remember. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the bulb has to want to change. So if we want to change the level of discourse, there are some things we have to do. Now, is it scary for a law student to confront a professor? You bet it is. There's a huge power imbalance. I give grades, they get grades. There is an enormous power imbalance, but there are ways around that. If we provide the right tools for good conversations, but mostly I thought, well, how can we make this a big, broad-based effort? And the American Bar Association gave me a way to do that. For those of you who don't spend days and days wondering about the standards for accreditation, there is a new section, 303B3, where we're supposed to teach law students how to develop their professional identity. So we have a way to hang this new construct of thinking about how to deal with difficult conversations on how do good lawyers, how do good judges deal with difficult, thorny, emotional situations. And there's an interpretation that says that we can talk about the values and our guiding principles and also our own emotional health, because if you're anything like me, if you've left a highly charged emotional conversation, chances are you feel drained after it, not invigorated. And that's not necessarily what we want to teach students to do. We want to teach students how to come away feeling better about the interaction rather than worse about the interaction. So now that the American Bar Association has given us a door into thinking about how we can use law students to better diffuse not just conversations in law school, but conversations they have outside of law school, not just as lawyers, but because we know that lawyers do a lot of things in the community as community leaders too. Now that we know that we have a way in to do it in law school, maybe at the end of the day, we'll have a better series of conversations with less sniping outside law school. Thank you. Our third and final, but most certainly not least presenter is Abe Rich. Mr. Rich is Chair Emeritus of the law firm of Fox Rothschild LLP, a former Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar. 
He is a member of the ABA House of Delegates and a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. His active practice, uh, active trial practice, includes disputes between and among lawyers and law firms, and he regularly writes and lectures on matters involving trial practice and legal ethics and professional responsibility. Uh, Abe is renowned in the uh, state of Pennsylvania as being uh, a guy who channels what we all imagine Judge Wise's barometer of ethical, moral lawyering behavior looks like, and we're delighted that he's here. Please join us in welcoming Abe. Uh, Bill, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, the opportunity to participate in the contributions to the legacy of uh, Judge Wise is a bit of a daunting task because of the fear of not paying appropriate homage to uh, a judge of such a distinguished career. Um, you know, I, I got a kick out of uh, Professor Nathanson's reference to uh, humble and honored and all, you know, I'm humbled and honored. But I, I must tell you, having uh, not being a full time professor, being a, you know, kind of trial lawyer, practicing law, um, you know, when someone uh, says they gave Hague lectures, even over uh, computer, you say to yourself, oh, my God, what am I doing in this company? And, uh, you know, it's it's really an honor to be among the participants uh, in this program. Uh, by the time I joined the bar in 1974, Judge Wise was already a member of the Court of Appeals. While I did not know him, um, I felt as though I did. Uh, I've been teaching um, at Penn Carey Law for the past 18 years, uh, ethics and advocacy. And um, his jurisprudence in Rule 11 is quite noteworthy. And um, I have often used them in, in my course. Um, yet Nancy, um, as you know, I had a, a you know, real life experience this week in teaching my course because on the front page of the New York Times, um, you may have seen the article about Professor Wax at Penn. And um, that day, uh, one of my students was featured in the article with a picture in which he said, the racist view made me feel very uncomfortable. So, you know, maybe you can come and teach dialogue <laughs> at, at Penn Law. Um, uh, Art, you know, I, I really appreciated your insight uh, into Judge Wise. Um, I, as I said, I did not know him. I, you know, um, uh, Bill was good enough to send me some articles, but I thought I ought to do my own due diligence. So I called up uh, Flora Becker, who I've known for many years, the wife of the late Chief Judge uh, Becker. Um, and I asked Flora, I said, do you remember Joe Wise? And if you do, could you share any comments that you or your late husband might have, uh, you know, said about him. And she immediately responded, of course, I remember Joe Wise. He was the consummate gentleman. She asked me, give me a few days, Abe. I, I want to really think about it because I, I really so admired the man. I want to give some uh, thought about Eddie's views. Now, Eddie's was her term. He was always Chief Judge Becker or Judge Becker to me, even though he disavowed the pomp for those of you who knew, knew Judge Becker. Um, when Flora called me a few days later, she regaled me with a number of opportunities for Eddie to observe Judge Weiss, from baseball games uh, to um, judicial conferences to debates after oral argument in the deliberative process. Uh, Eddie J loved Joe's pen, quote unquote. Um, she recalled his writing style was very fluid, which his colleagues admired. And I'm sure all of the uh, law clerks in the room have some level of contribution to that writing style. Um, during uh, deliberation, she told me, he was not easily, be, uh, easily willing to change his vote as he was very confident in his views. Um, but nevertheless, he always listened in earnest and was willing to consider um, intellectually the rightness of a result. A marvelous colleague was another comment. Um, according to Flora, Eddie loved 
Judge Wise and felt he did such a great job because he was so well liked. The theme that, you know, just is plastered all over the wall today. Um, and finally, Eddie observed that Judge Weiss's military experience, which we heard about and we'll have a bobblehead to remind us of, um, provided him with a solid foundation for structure and discipline, so important in the development of his jurisprudence. Uh, as indicated in the marketing material, which we all got, few attributes better define Judge Weiss's service as a practitioner, uh, jurist, teacher, scholar, innovator, partner, colleague, and mentor than his civility, which we've heard a lot about, his professionalism, his intrinsic kindness, and his sterling ethics. Um, examples of his jurisprudence are his Rule 11 opinions in Garrardi, which we've heard about, and I will try to abort, but need to reference a bit, um, and Marianne Penzera versus Lingle, which helped define and police the boundaries of separating imaginative, though unsuccessful, lawyering from irresponsible and sanctionable attorney misconduct. So why am I here and what it is it that I'm going to do to try to bring Judge Weiss back with us today? And so I thought about it a bit. And my task today is really to evaluate his jurisprudence, to think about him as a person and predict how Judge Weiss would have decided a sanction motion against Rudy Giuliani in his role as counsel for Donald Trump and his challenge to the 2020 election outcome in Pennsylvania in which then President Trump lost his election bid. So let's start with Garrardi. It was already described um, uh, in some detail, so I'll abort that. But, uh, you know, uh, obviously, uh, Judge Wise denied the sanctions motion in that case. Uh, but let me be the third person to use this quote, <laughs> since it's so important. You know, Judge Wise made it clear that the pure heart and empty head defense didn't work. Um, but really, when it comes to lawyering, stop Think, investigate, and research. And again, this is the third time you're hearing it. On purpose, I'm repeating it because I will juxtapose that standard when we evaluate the question I'm posing to the group. Um, finally, um, uh, as we know, it's not should not be viewed as a fee-shifting device. And Rule 11 is only intended for exceptional circumstances. And again, juxtapose that against the task that I'm um, going to be doing. A year later, Judge Wise, and we haven't heard this, uh, the Marianne Pensiero versus Lingle case in 1988, uh, which was an antitrust action by a beer retailer against exclusive wholesalers. Summary judgment was granted for the defendants. Defendants moved for attorney fees under Rule 11, uh, which was granted by District Judge Caldwell. On appeal, Judge Weiss reversed. In addition to the principles set forth in Garrardi, uh, the opinion sent forth a number of other factors to consider engaging the reasonableness of an attorney's pre-filing inquiry. The key factor for my purposes and the question I posed uh, and the challenge I posed for today is <clears throat> what was the plausibility of the legal position advocated? the plausibility of the legal position advocated. Um, and so uh, before leaving uh, the standards that we're going to evaluate, um, it's worth commenting on Judge Wise's uh, view on 28 USC 1927, which I presume you all know what it is, and I don't really have time to go into the detail of that rule, but um, it, it, he wrote an opinion in 1991, and I know someone was a clerk during that time period. I forget who it was. Someone said 91, 92. Um, uh, in Hackman uh, versus Valley Fair, in Hackman, a discharged employee brought a hybrid lawsuit for wrongful discharge and against his union for breach of the duty to provide fair representation. District Judge Mary Ann Trump Berry granted summary judgment to the union and directed that the union's legal fees be paid. An appeal followed. In an opinion written by Judge Wise, 
uh, the court held that the grant of summary judgment was warranted, but not the imposition of attorney fees under 28 U.S.C. 1927. Uh, Judge Wise wrote that for a finding in that regard to oppose attorney fees, you needed to find willful bad faith, um, which required a factual determination of the same. And again, keep that standard in mind as we go through my brief discussion. Um, as a result, Judge Wise concluded that the finding of bad faith by the district court was clearly erroneous, compelling a reversal of the sanctions order. Again, part of the good guy judicial career that Judge Wise uh, exemplified. Um, you know, I've been teaching ethics and advocacy at Penn Carey for many years. As you might expect, uh, trying to guide students through the legitimate advocacy, even at the outer limits, versus frivolous and unacceptable advocacy is a challenge. But the jurisprudence among them, uh, written by Judge Weiss, is, uh, as someone else said, a godsend. Um, you know, I've created my own moniker for these rules, and I call them my five four rules. Rule 3.1 of the Rules of Professional Conduct, um, Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and 28 uh, USC 1927, the five four rules. I explained to the students that some of the most important jurisprudence in our country's history have been decided by five four margins in the United States Supreme Court. And the dissents of yesterday can become the future majority. And so it's not unethical to advocate a position, even a very weak one. And that's language that Judge Weiss used in deciding against a sanctions motion. Uh, even a very weak argument or a change in the law, as long as it's done in, with candor and good faith, belief in the outcome. As an ethicist, it's axiomatic that we're living in extremely interesting times, uh, to say the least. During the last six years, our political environment has produced multiple examples of ethical challenges for lawyers. Regardless of your political viewpoint, one could not ignore the travails of Donald Trump and his lawyers from the payment by Michael Cohn Esquire, a New York lawyer, uh, to Stormy Daniels, which you know, hold hold tight because it's back in the news, as you may know, uh, to the numerous, I think, 60 lawsuits challenging the results of the 2022 election. Whether it's Rudy Giuliani or Sidney Powell or John Eastman or Jeffrey Clark or even Kellyanne Conway, who was a, is a lawyer, um, these are names that have created such tumult in the, the advocacy as lawyers uh, that they're defining or not defining new standards and hold your you know, powder while uh, the results of what's gonna happen to them goes forward. Uh, to appreciate the elasticity of Judge Weiss, his thinking, his approach, um, uh, I wanna talk about the lawsuit uh, that Mr. Giuliani personally directed uh, Donald J. Trump for president versus Bookfire filed in the Middle District of Pennsylvania um, uh, on behalf of the Trump campaign and two Pennsylvania voters. Uh, Giuliani appeared in the case on November 17, 2020, after original counsel from Porter Wright withdrew, followed several days later by withdrawal of several successor counsel as well. Uh, Giuliani entered his appearance on that morning um, uh, that Judge uh, Matthew Braun, Bran uh, scheduled oral arguments on defendants' motion to dismiss the First Amendment complaint. His local counsel tried to get the matter continued, which was denied. Um, in telling contrast to uh, Giuliani's public narrative for pervasive and coordinated fraud, Mr. Giuliani's federal complaint did not allege fraud. Plaintiffs in Book Bar filed two complaints and proposed a third complaint um, based on two constitutional claims, one an equal protection clause claim and a second on an electorals and elections uh, clauses claim. Uh, the gravamen of the complaint was uh, that the rights were violated because every county in Pennsylvania, which you probably know, has their own unique 
election procedures. And the claim was that allowing each elect each county to determine the process by which counts were that votes were counted, where a observer could stand or not stand, violated the constitutional rights. And that was the essence of the claims. Um, <clears throat> you know, but again, even the amendment complaint did not allege fraud. Uh, despite the narrowness of the complaint, Mr. Giuliani asked the court to order broad relief like in other state and federal litigation he was managing. He asked the court to enjoin Bookvar, who was the secretary of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and the other defendants from certifying the results of the election and basically to throw out the election on a Commonwealth Commonwealth-wide basis. Um, uh, again, he wanted the election to be deemed defective and allow the Pennsylvania General Assembly, which was a Republican-controlled assembly, to choose the electors. At oral argument, Mr. Giuliani, and I, I know of the argument of having, uh, uh, you know, talked to the oppo his, his opposing counsel, who I know quite well, um, he asserted in his introductory remarks that the best description of what plaintiffs were alleging was a widespread nationwide fraud. He got up and argued that. Um, under questioning by Judge Brand, however, he quickly acknowledges, well, this really isn't a fraud case. We're not pleading fraud. You know, so out of both sides of his mouth, within literally 20 seconds. Within 10 days of oral argument before Judge Brand, plaintiffs lost in the district court and the Third Circuit. Judge Brand dismissed the First Amendment complaint, and he denied leave for him to file another amended complaint, um, and uh, in particular because of the timing. They were to certify the election by November 23rd. Um, you know, parenthetically, uh, several days before the argument, the Third Circuit decided a case, Bognet versus Secretary of Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which basically got rid of the standing issue as it related to the electors and election clause uh, claims. Um, and so uh, his memorandum at the outset, Judge Brand's memorandum said, quote, he had been unable to find any case, any case in which a plaintiff has sought such a drastic remedy in the contest of an election, in terms of the share volume of votes sought to be uh, invalidated, end of quote. The court wrote that instead, quote, uh, of compelling legal arguments and factual proof, one would expect to support such a drastic remedy and startling outcome. It had been presented with strained legal arguments without merit and speculative accusations unpled in the operative complaint and unsupported with evidence. Thus, again, the standard articulated in Pancero for the reasonableness of the priest filing inquiry, that is the plausibility of the legal position advocated appear to have been violated. Moreover, the preferred remedy for an equal protection clause violation, the court stated, was to level up to ask plaintiffs' votes be counted. Instead, plaintiffs had sought not only to level down, to not count votes of millions of voters, but to basically disenfranchise the constitutional rights of those voters. The only issue appealed to the Third Circuit, and incidentally, as you probably know, Judge Brand was a Trump appointee, as were many of the judges who decided these cases. And the only issue that uh, plaintiffs appealed uh, was whether the leave to amend was denied. The Court of Appeals, if anything, was more direct about the lack of merit in the suit, saying that even an amendment adding multiple other constitutional claims would be futile. Judge Beavis, um, who some of you may know, uh, in his opening opinion stated, quote, free fair elections are the lifeblood of our democracy. Charges of unfairness are serious. But calling an election unfair does not make it so. Charges require specific allegations and then proof. We have neither here. Like the district court, the Court of Appeals requested relief grossly disproportionate to the procedural challenges 
raised. It called the proposed relief drastic and unprecedented, noting that tossing out millions of mail-in ballots would disenfranchise a huge swath of the electorate and upsought all down-ballot elections as well. Uh, the appellate court concluded that the uh, request to amend the complaint was properly denied because of the inequitable and futile doctrine. Um, the Court of Appeals affirmed the leave of denial, denied the request for an injunction pending appeal, and ordered the mandate to issue immediately. So, uh, having given that brief background, it's now time to pass on the judgment of America's mayor in light of the jurisprudence of Judge Wise and his colleagues. Based on the significant lapses of professional judgment and acts, which only could be characterized as clownish, where Rudy over many months and in many different matters publicly excoriated the voting process and the harm to his client, President Trump. While the temptation to take it out of him is very compelling, restraint is dictated by the task at hand, particularly if Judge Weiss is deciding, Weiss is deciding this matter. After all, Rule 11 requires a signing but it also includes advocating for a file document, which Rudy did. Moreover, Rule 11 is intended only for exceptional circumstances. We would think there would be great reluctance to move ahead with a Rule 11 sanction in this case. Or perhaps we should explore whether uh, this case met the exceptional circumstances standard. Keep in mind that both the District Court and the Court of Appeals acknowledged that the remedy sought was a drastic remedy because of the sheer volume of votes which the lawsuit sought to invalidate. Moreover, the complaint and the proposed amendments did not allege fraud, despite the public pronouncements. Um, therefore, can we sanction Giuliani for seeking an extreme remedy when the legal basis for the same was neither alleged nor proven. Indeed, knowing that fraud was the sine qua non for the relief sought, how could Rudy have proceeded without such allegations? And in his argument before the court, Rudy ultimately acknowledged that his case was not a fraud case. Could he have gotten by if he sought a more modest remedy, such as counting votes rather than disenfranchising millions of voters? The fact that weak cases and bad lawyering, as articulated by Judge Wise, are not enough to sanction under Rule 11 might lend a compassionate jurist like Judge Wise to deny a Rule 11 request. Or would it? Even without Rule 11, Section 1927 may provide support for a sanction, but one would need a finding of bad faith, as we indicated, and an opportunity for the lawyer to challenge the intent allegations. If you've watched Rudy, he certainly would have do it, done it in this case. Based on the conduct which is widely known, however, such intent would likely be proven although reaching that conclusion is really beyond the scope of this presentation. If Rule 11 and Section 1927 don't achieve the result you consider fair, you could always ask the court to invoke its inherent power to sanction. Indeed, in Donald J. Trump versus Hillary Clinton, Judge Middlebrook of the Southern District of Florida in an opinion on January 19, 2023, invoked the court's inherent power to sanction Donald J. Trump and his lawyers for close to a million dollars. The sanction was stayed pending appeal. However, the court's first paragraph of its opinion perhaps said it all. Quote, this case should have never been brought. Its inadequacy as a legal claim was evident from the start. No reasonable lawyer would have filed it. Intended for a political purpose, none of the counts of the amended complaint state a cognizable legal claim. In the end, even a compassionate jurist like Judge, like Judge Wise would have no choice but to sanction Rudy and perhaps his client as a prophylactic measure 
to prevent such conduct in the future. Indeed, stop, think, investigate, and research. Fourth time you've heard that. An admonition by Judge Wise in his Rule 11 discussion could have prevented by what all accounts was frivolous litigation. Pick your poison, Rule 11, 28 U.S.C. 1927, or the inherent power of the court. Baseless claims for political purposes have no room in our judicial system. In closing, it is worth noting that Mr. Giuliani is presently subject to disorder proceedings in New York and the District of Columbia. It should not surprise anyone that the result in those proceedings will likely not fare any better for Mr. Giuliani than in the court system. Indeed, expect a more severe sanction, the likely loss of Giuliani's license to practice law. Judge Weiss' view of professionalism, which has been so well spelled out today, um, which I've now learned in a much deeper and more profound manner as a result of today, would never find acceptable a lawyer who pay, plays fast and loose with the role as a lawyer and that of a politician. You can't wear those two hats. It's a recipe for disaster. Stay tuned. The act of this play will resume shortly, the next act, and I thank you very much for the opportunity. That concludes our third panel. Thank you very much to Nancy, to Nathan, and to Abe. Panel four is about to begin. 2004. Uh, and I joined the Washington, D.C. office of Jones Day. I was fresh out of a Third Circuit clerkship, and I, I, I wanted to do appellate work. And the case that we talked about this morning on panel one, Rosario Ortega, about the 1367, the Supplemental Jurisdiction Statute, had just been granted cert at the Supreme Court, and Jones Day was representing the plaintiff in that case. Me being a fresh, freshly out of, out of a circuit clerkship, I was asked to help the head of the appellate practice, Don Ayer, who became a, a friend and mentor of mine, to help draft the briefs on that case. The briefs could have been titled, Why Judge Wise Was Wrong. <laughs> because I had to take the position that Judge Wise, against Judge Wise in that, in, 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 in that case on how he had drafted the statute. I was two weeks out of clerking for Judge Wise, and I was writing a brief to the United States Supreme Court on why he was wrong. Um, it was a hard thing to do. It was a hard thing to do. And I do remember um, after we filed the brief, I was just thrilled that my name was on a Supreme Court brief this quickly in my career. I sent a copy to Chambers. <laughs> and I got mailed back to me with red lines all over it. And he wrote on the on the, the on, on the front, and I still have it. I meant to bring it here today at home, and I, I, I left without it. He said, this was a very good brief, even though it was exactly wrong. <laughs> so I always remember that. Sometimes as an advocate, you have to take the position that is that you don't exactly want to take. Um, and, but that just sort of draws all the panels together. And here we're talking about advocacy. I turn it over to Art. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. That, uh, in fact, I have to say that panel three on uh, on uh, ethics uh, uh, is not, there's no dilemma for wise guys and wise gals, because all we do is ask, what would Judge Wise have done in this situation? So I don't know whether he would have uh, uh, signed that brief uh, or let alone sent it to him, uh, but he did, he certainly did. Well, uh, this is a uh, this panel is really of uh, advocacy from a wise guy, wise gal uh, perspective. Uh, essentially, what we learned and what we carried with us after our uh, two years in clerking. Um, it was, uh, anybody who is, uh, a student of Judge Wise, uh, recognizes his stature as an appellate jurist was built on number one, a distinguished career as a straight talking trial lawyer and trial judge. Uh, he didn't mince words. He was, he got to the point and you could trust every word that he said. Number two, uh, his uh, reputation and stature was built on a second uh, cornerstone, and that was his uncanny ability to reduce complex legal concepts into basic 
easy to understand ideas, uh, easy to follow. Uh, and in fact, one of the hallmarks of all of his opinions, and if you look at the materials that accompany this program, uh, we pulled a number of his opinions where the first paragraph um, was a straightforward opening that cut right to the core of, a co of the complicated appellate issue that the, uh, that the, uh, that the case tackled. Uh, then he would methodically uh, dissect in an objective logical analysis uh, how he got to that uh, point. Um, it was a, it's kind of that first paragraph is like the cherry on top of a Sunday. And I still can remember after working on an opinion, uh, waiting for him to come out with the last draft uh, with, and because the last draft would always put that paragraph in. That's the first time we law clerks saw that paragraph was at the very last as it was going to be circulated to the other judges. And it was always interesting because after you worked on a bench memo, after you heard the oral arguments, after you help research and help uh, uh, tweak the opinion, it was always fascinating to see how he could really cut to the really core of the whole case in one paragraph, often humor, often uh, really insightful uh, analysis. Um, his opinions really embrace the core concepts that every practitioner really should consider when you're drafting a brief, when you're presenting an oral argument, when you're making a presentation to a board of directors, any type of uh, program like that, it really uh, captures uh, what you as an advocate should be uh, trying to focus on. Uh, so today, uh, Panel four, which uh, uh, is entitled Effective Appellate Advocacy, I de-emphasize the word appellate because it really applies to everything, whether you're in a trial, uh, trial setting, whether you're in an, an administrative setting, whether you're making a presentation to a board of directors, it's really effective advocacy. Uh, but we ask uh, two wise guys and one wise gal uh, to... Uh, 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 to uh, make up this panel. And they were carefully chosen because they come from three different arenas of the practice of law. One is a frontline uh, extraordinary litigator. One is a, a, an, a an esteemed and accomplished academician. And the other one is a corporate uh, lawyer extraordinaire. Uh, so let me uh, introduce them one by one. And I'm going to ask them uh, uh, one question uh, after each one. And the first one is Stan Edelstein. Uh, Stan has been practicing law for uh, almost a half a century now uh, as a construction attorney. After he clerked for Judge Wise, uh, he started out with Wolf Block in Philadelphia uh, working in antitrust, uh, but he was drafted into handling, uh, working on and handling a complex piece of construction litigation. Uh, which he actually enjoyed and made a career out of. Uh, in fact, he then uh, eventually joined a construction boutique, owned his craft uh, for 30 some years as a construction lawyer, and he now heads the construction law practice at uh, Feynman, Creekstein, and Harris in Philadelphia. Uh, he divides his time uh, among federal courts, uh, Pennsylvania courts, uh, American Arbitration Association, uh, although starting out as a frontline litigator, he now has spends increasing amount of time as a counselor, an advisor, a mediator, a neutral, and has argued uh, cases before the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Superior Court, Commonwealth Court, and trial courts around the Commonwealth and elsewhere, I might add. Uh, so Stan, let me ask you a question, and let me ask, how did Judge Wise, or at least the lessons you learned from him and from your clerkship, influence your career? Boy, I could take from now until four o'clock. <laughs> no, no, but no. But I no. won't do that, because all of us could, because the influence was tremendous. But I've got to start with one, probably three points, but there's one that just, I think, is the most important. Nothing that you bring to anything that you do as an attorney is more important 
than being truthful. I learned it from him by watching how he treated briefs and arguments. If you lose your credibility because you make an argument that is untruthful, not mistaken, but untruthful. You know, the court doesn't know the litigants. They don't know the dispute. They get it and they decide it. But if you lose credibility on one item, you probably lost it on everything. Second point on that, and I heard this again and again from people, practitioners older than I, that learned I was working for Judge Wise, said one of the reasons he was such an effective trial lawyer was he didn't try on his case. He settled a lot of them, but people knew that if he said it, they could count on it being truthful. So we come back to that lesson which is the most important thing you have is your credibility. What, what did I gain personally? Through college and through law school, I had been told repeatedly that I wrote well. And I wrote well enough that Judge Wise hired me. Uh, on the first day, and Phoebe and I got First day, the judge explained he had just come back from an oral argument. We were sworn in the day after Labor Day. There had been an oral argument the Thursday before on an emergency motion, and there was a tight deadline, and we had to get an opinion out that week. And Judge Wise wrote the opinions, uh, but he gave us each pieces uh, of it to at least work up. And I turned we each turned ours in, we had the same time schedule. And we both got ours back around the same time. And mine is covered with red ink. And I'm thinking, uh oh, <laughs> it's three days in. I don't, I don't, I, I, this doesn't look good. And as I was going out of my office to see Phoebe, She's coming out of hers to see mine. And hers is covered with red ink. She, she was editor-in-chief of Law Review. Okay. We wrote well. But the red ink showed some things. Number one, it cut a lot out. And from that minute on, Judge Wise started to sometimes explain to us, sometimes just Give examples. Get the writing tighter and tighter and tighter to take a complex concept and reduce it to something that the reader could understand. I went in as what I think was a good writer. I came out a lot better. And a contrary to something I thought you said, and I may have misunderstood, but I think. You credited the clerks for helping influence the judge's writing. Uh -uh. <laughs> it was the other way around. And boy. Yeah. But you weren't there. But we were, and we benefited from it. And every time I write, not every time, but not a week goes by when I'm writing a brief, uh, sometimes a letter, uh, to convince somebody or something. I don't hear Judge Wise's voice in my head. So, and I think we all yeah. would share that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that may not be one thing I took away. It might be two, but uh, they were very, very important. Well, thank you, Stan. And uh, we've uh, already given a little bit of a prelude about uh, Phoebe Haddon. Uh, Phoebe is, uh, uh, is, I'm so pleased that she was able to join us. She comes from the academic community. Uh, she's a noted uh, in on issues relating to access and equity and served as chancellor of Rikers University, spearheaded a widened affordability access uh, through their Bridge the Gap program, which provided tuition uh, assistance for working uh, families. Um, she really uh, anchored their role as a community organization and uh, with a civil engagement program. Now, uh, one of the things as I was uh, trying to 
tell you a little bit about Phoebe. Um, I went to list the awards and we would be here till four if I had, uh, but I'm not going to, I'll, I'll just mention she did receive a couple of years ago, the Ruth Bader Ginzer Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association of American Law Schools. She received a Smith College a Medal, uh, which was her alma mater. And she formerly was on the, uh, was the vice chairman of the board of uh, Smith. Uh, she trailblazer awards and, and many more. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know. She she told me just cut all this out, but I, I really have to mention she she's uh, she went to D D Duquesne uh, University Law School, editor in chief, uh, clerk with Judge Wise. Uh, she's going to re be really mad at me, but she then she got her LLM from Yale. Uh, she um, went to work for Wilmer Cutler, uh, then uh, became dean at the law school at University of Maryland. Uh, and then she's taught at uh, Temple University. She's co-author of two case books, uh, numerous scholarly uh, articles on equal protection, jury participation, academic freedom. And uh, I, I could, maybe I've gone, to, gone a little too much, but uh, the fact is uh, she serves on numerous boards and is currently on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank in Philadelphia. So Phoebe, let me ask you the same question. Uh, and let me ask you how... Uh, just how the judge or how the lessons you learned from being a clerk influenced your career in academia. So before I start, I want to say that um, all of those things are true to some extent, um, but when we come to talk about just the, the role of the, um, of the clerk, but also uh, the opportunity to be exposed to law, I have to say that um, I've had one one time in the court, I said, may it please the court? And it said, motion dismissed. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> yes, so that was it. So obviously I chose a better route. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've been very happy at what I do. Uh, but I think that really I've emphasized in terms of what we got from our experience working with the judge was his display of judicial temperament and razor focus review of any claim that was before him. And what that meant was that we had to be responsible for ensuring that he had the feedback that he needed um, as he drafted decisions, but also as uh, we were engaged in the research um, that was pertinent to whatever case um, we were working on. And um, I think that that has uh, really made me feel as if um, though Judge Wise was a straight talking trial lawyer, Judge Wise had this uncanny ability to reduce very complex legal concepts into well-framed questions that really cut to the heart of whatever case we were working with him on. Uh, and um, it made me um, think about what that would mean uh, once I left um, the, the practice of law or the almost practice of law and then uh, went into the academy. Uh, because those are things that anybody who is dean or later um, as chancellor has to have that kind of razor focus, but also very importantly, the ability to listen to what other people are talking about and to think about it and to change your mind uh, and to ask them to be frank uh, and honest so that you will be put into the best position possible. Well, thank you, Phoebe. Uh, the, uh, uh, the other member of our panel is uh, Joe Polizzato. Uh, Joe is Senior Vice President uh, for Strategy and Client Services of uh, Quizlex, uh, which you may not know, but it is the world, one of the world's leading alternative legal services provider. He comes to us from the corporate community. Uh, before joining Quiznex, Alex, uh, Joe was the general counsel of, for the Americas of Deutsche Bank, uh, a position that he held for six years. And previously, he had been general counsel for at Lehman Brothers, uh, where he worked for almost 19 years. Uh, he's been uh, he's had a number of professional distinctions, a uh, number of awards, uh, the uh, Alfred J. Uh, Rauschman Award from the Securities Industry and Finance Markets Association. Uh, he's had a distinguished career in financial services uh, as well as the law. 
Uh, he was a commercial litigator initially with Cad, Cad Walleter uh, after his clerkship. Uh, he's an honors graduate of Columbia College and NYU Law School. Uh, but among highlights in uh, Joe's career uh, was uh, f- first uh, testifying uh, on, uh, on uh, before Congress on a number of occasions um, and uh, actually arguing before the U.S. Supreme Court in, in a case back in 1995. Uh, he spree- frequently speaks on critical issues on banking securities industry and legal ethics and the role of general counsel. And uh, he is here because uh, he gives a different perspective from the corporate setting. Joe? Right. So let me first clarify that my testimony in front of Congress was never in an adversarial context. It was all in connection with legislation and, and, and all of that stuff. I just, uh, just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. Uh, so the question then, Joe, you know, is uh, how did the uh, clerking for the judge or how did the judge and what you learned from your clerkship influence your career? So, I mean, I, I'm going to echo a little bit what Stan and Phoebe said. It was really all about the conciseness and the what I call the distillation of the law, taking a, comp, a, comp, a concept and reducing it to its essence, which is sometimes a long process. It's uh, a good single malt scotch could take upwards of 20 years to produce you know, the, 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 the final product. And I learned that rather relatively quickly in my clerk, clerkship when we went through the back and forth of how opinions got formed. The judge did write the initial opinion Frequently, when you got the draft from the judge, there was there were inter- interlineations where he said, "I'd like to expand on this a little bit, or or maybe let's do a little bit more research on that issue." And so he inevitably got something back that was significantly larger from from the clerk. But that's that was just the starting point to this extensive distillation until we got to the point where the clarity and the focus of his mind was such that there could be no ambiguity about anything that was being ultimately directed to the bar, because that's he fundamentally viewed the primary purpose of an, uh, of an appeals lawyer to provide instruction and direction to, to the bar. And, and, you know, I had a sort of kind of happenstance of stumbling across every bench memo I wrote for the judge about four years ago. It was a sack about this high. It was in a a bit, uh, it was in a box that I found, and I read them. And oh and one of the things that struck me about it is, I, as I started at the beginning, and by the end, those bench memos became tighter and tighter and tighter. I almost kind of knew what he wanted, and and it was really, it, it was really a remarkable sort of walk down memory lane as I went through that. Uh, sadly, we had a flood last year, and they're gone. Mm. Uh, yeah, I know. Really sad. Uh, but uh, at least I had the opportunity to reread them before before they turned into uh, wet wet dust, is what I would say. <laughs> when I went to uh, practice law, and I was an active litigator for six years, uh, ten years, excuse me, uh, argued six appeals, which is really unusual as an associate uh, at, at, a, at a large New York law firm. Tried a couple of cases, uh, did many arbitrations. I can't even count the number of motions and depositions I argued. Again, it was to me all about providing a clear roadmap to the court, but also really honing in on the key points. Don't distract the court with unnecessary arguments. Really focus and almost hammer in the points that you think are the winning points in in in, in your case. And uh, again, over the course of my ten years as a private lawyer, I focused uh, and 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 honed that style. I thought reasonably effectively. One of the things we haven't talked about today, which I think is important, is oral at oral advocacy, particularly at the, at the appellate level. And I had a lot of conversations with the judge about this. We had this wonderful situation where when we were in Philadelphia, the judge almost always took his clerks out for dinner. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it was one on one, which I loved. And when he had that second martini, we had some phenomenal <laughs> time. But we, we spent a lot of time, he and I, talking about specific lawyers, what was good, what was not good about the day's argument. And at, and at the end, you know, one of the takeaways I took about it was a truly effective oral argument has to be a bit of a conversation. It can't be a lecture. It can't be uh, stilted in any way. It needs to be honest. It stands uh, work absolutely truthful. You have to be credible. You have to show integrity in everything you say and how you act. And in and, and the lawyers that he liked and admired the most and the ones that I felt the most compelling as well had, had, those, had those traits. But then after 10 years, uh, 
uh, when I thought I was going to be a law a lawyer for life, I decided to uh, a real lawyer for life. I said okay. I would like I, I joke to my friends. I decided to go in house, and that really put to the test many of the things I learned as a as a as a litigator on the outside in terms of how you communicate effectively to a group of very smart. Uh, individuals on Wall Street, but who also, not surprisingly, had relatively short attention spans. I mean, this is a this is a group of type A plus people banded together to to uh, to fundamentally to make money and, and and increase the bottom line of the firm. And I I really had to take those lessons from the judge and hone them and 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 try to excise even more of the stuff that I had thought was fundamental to my job. For example, none of my clients ever wanted a legal exegesis on anything. I mean, the, the notion of walking into a room with a bunch of managing directors at either Lehman or DB and explaining what the law was in a, in a detailed way was fanciful. And you learned pretty quickly that you had to do what the judge did, provide the first paragraph, and the first paragraph was always part of what I provided to them. And then in a, in a very sort of syllogistic, logical way, go through the, what was essentially risk assessment in terms of what the proposal was and how we were going to go about it and how, was, how, how it could be successful and what the pitfalls were. And then from that perspective, arrive at a decision. It was an extremely uh, uh, sobering exercise in taking the judge's lessons and, and distilling them about as finely as they could be distilled, and yet still call yourself a a, a lawyer in the room because you were really doing something that was really beyond law, and it was looking at risk from a, an entirely holistic perspective, really, not just a purely legal perspective. But again, I always had the judge's uh, voice in mind. Uh, I don't think I ever gave a client more than a two-page memo on anything. <laughs> so my last brief was written. I read briefs while I was head of litigation, but that ended in 1999. After that, I mean, a couple of pages at most. And 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 even then, if they were half of them didn't even read it, but they would, but then you'd have a meeting and you'd go through it and everything else. Uh, just a different way of practicing, but one that was well suited to me, particularly because I had the luxury of and the privilege of working for the judge. And then finally, just two seconds on Quizlix because people don't even know what an alternative legal services provider was. But I want to hearken to one of the things that the judge was keenly interested as a, as a lawyer, and that is the intersection of law and technology. Yeah. In 1980, oh, certainly. the judge organized the first remote argument of an appellate court. Mm -hmm. The judge went to Philadelphia and the panel was in Philadelphia but all of the lawyers advocating in, on that docket that day were in Pittsburgh. And we set up what would now be considered a Zoom right. thing. I was the production manager in Pittsburgh. I was left behind. <laughs> My two clerks were in, were, in, uh, were in Philadelphia. And the, 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 uh, the, the advocates argued in front of a camera. They saw the three judges on, on the screen. And, and, and the judge was... Uh, to say in the forefront would be an understatement, right? He was he was predicting what our lives would be like forty years later, and but he was keenly interested in in the use of technology, uh, and 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 in its application to the law and, to, and and to the practice of law. And to some extent, it's what I do now in my current role. And again, I have the judge in my in, in my mind whenever I think about you know, how the law is affecting, uh, how, the, how the technology is affecting the practice of law. And we'll see what happens with the, the new chat tools because we're entering warp speed, a whole a whole other era of how uh, law is changing. So, so um, I also want to add that there was a certain amount of humility that um, the judge possessed about the variety of things uh, that had to be faced and the choices that would be made um, as we moved in the law and in legal principles, but as also things like um, uh, online um, and um, opportunities to try technology uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that people actually get hurt and um, want to be hurt. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that I, it's rare in my recollection that the judge always had the answer on at the beginning of, of an analysis or a problem. I mean, he wasn't one of these people who I could even predict many times how he was going to come out on it. That's case. right. And, and, I've, and, you know, he was sort of a moderate person in a way, but at, but at the end of the day, it was that humility came through in, in terms of how he approached his, the task of, of judging. Yeah. Yeah, stop, look, and listen uh, yeah. really uh, did uh, hit a, a theme that I think we all could share. Um, it is interesting, uh, the uh, oral, uh, your comments about oral argument. Uh, when I uh, started clerking, the Third Circuit had just experimented with a rule instead of all argument automatically getting, uh, all appeals automatically getting argument, they were going to pick and choose. This was heresy. I mean, you wouldn't believe the uh, the uh, uproar of, uh, of advocates saying, uh, this is, I need to make my uh, comments. And of course, I had just started when this uh, rule had uh, been adopted. And uh, and frankly, after I first attended oral argument, I understood where the court was coming from because, oh my goodness, arguments, uh, you know, you think uh, even big names uh, uh, just were terrible. Uh, if there's a, if there's one great advantage of clerking, uh, it's recognizing that hey, I could really screw up, and I'm not as bad as some of these people, you know. Uh, and then, and it is it true? It gives you a lot of co more confidence having clerked, and you see how how uh, bad it can be. But one of the keys that I think that uh, Phoebe and uh, and Joe have pointed out is it takes preparation. You've got to really think ahead and know what you're doing and go walk in. You're just not going to be able to come in and uh, be like a gunslinger and uh, and take and uh, take it from uh, take it take it uh, on the fly. All right, if I can just oh, like, see, see yeah. going to say yeah, something. Right. Okay, then the title of the let me look at it. Aha, effective advocacy, but then it says in parentheses appellate advocacy. Well, of course, that's what we're here for. You're going to hear very little about oral argument. And the reason is, and Art just sort of telegraphed it, uh, we usually as clerks knew which way the judge was headed before oral argument. He may not have known at the beginning, but by the time the case was worked up and ready for oral argument and, you know, our benches, and I'm talking about the court at the time, they were beyond hot. They were sizzling. I mean, the goal was to know the case better than counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we usually had an idea how it was going to come out. And I can think of probably maybe five, I can count them on my fingers, cases that ended up coming out differently after oral argument. Uh, the takeaway, at least that I saw, was that Oral argument is a great opportunity for counsel to lose <laughs> <laughs> where they were ahead to begin with. Yeah. The takeaway for everybody in the audience, and I see it's a very mixed audience. I see law students. I see people that are, have been doing this longer than we have. But the takeaway is, although I guess the pizzazz is with oral argument, the heresy people didn't want to give that up. To be effective, you've got to win it on appeal. And as we'll get into, you, you really have to win it in the first couple of pages of the brief. So I was going to yeah. um, add one other comment. Um, so the judge also talked often about other judges and those that he admired. And I remember one in particular was Judge Hasty, oh, yeah. uh, who was just an extraordinary judge, um, a role model for all of us, but um, also Judge really told us how much of an impact a, a good judge had on his view of how to write a good good um, opinion. Yeah, I might add there. Are, uh, I can remember a couple other judges who yes, call names. Yes, where they, when they would write uh, the majority, he would have us go and check the cases because he said, I don't really trust yeah, uh, the way they read the uh, opinion. So. Well, I, I can remember the computer churning out back in the day, you know, the, the beginnings of a rudimentary computer system. And the judge, the circuit had 
an uh, in, interconnected network where we get the, uh, the draft of the opinions on this computer machine. When, and there were a couple of judges on the court that tended to be, let's say, prolix in their writing style. And whenever a certain judge was assigned to the case, you could expect the 50 page majority opinion. If there were a case where the judge were, was possibly going to be dissenting, you knew you had to wait and spend a lot of time waiting through an opinion that probably should have been 20 pages, yeah. but yeah. it's actually 50 pages. Yeah. And the judge would true. quietly comment on some of those. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, that brings us to uh, the uh, point, uh, some of the points on uh, effective advocacy here. And uh, let's focus on the briefs at, at this point. Um, they're basically, and let me just say, there's an outline that's uh, in the materials. The outline is a compendium of feedback that I got from all the wise guys and wise gals. Uh, it was feedback that they uh, offered and I tried to put it in some type of uh, uh, orderly format. So uh, you then these slides uh, build on that. So. If you have any questions, uh, they, there's a little more detail in the materials that you're getting. Uh, but um, I think one of the keys that uh, the feedback that I got from most of the uh, clerks um, was that there are two primary goals in any kind of a brief uh, in, or an opinion, anything you're submitting. One, you have to give the right answer. And two, you have to make it easily understood. Um, Joe, wonder if you can comment on this. The first one about giving the right answer as being uh, one of the inflexible goals. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, again, it goes back to credibility and integrity. The judge needs to have trust that what you're saying is 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 accurate and consistent with the precedent as you as you described it. Yeah, you have to be an advocate, but you also have to be an advocate in such a way that you don't distort uh, the the body of law that uh, that is that is relevant to the case. Uh, this absolutely the same thing happens at an oral argument. You have to give the right answer, not the theoretical answer. If the theoretical answer goes against five Supreme Court cases, then it's basically wor worthless, and it has to permeate everything that you do with in the court, whether it's a discovery conference or a conference to decide whether you're going to be permitted to file a summary judgment motion or whatever. It doesn't matter. You have to have have that credibility. I had an experience in one of the cases I argued as a as a lawyer where we I was representing a good 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 guy client, if you will. It was about it was a nonprofit uh, Methodist organization and they were trying to keep alive an application that they'd gotten from the New York State Department of Health to build a nursing home. And they'd run out of time. But they still, and they were nice, nice people, and they were still seriously desirous of building that home. So we had to go to, and the department had pulled the application. So we went to court, uh, state court, and actually in front of a judge, ultimately became a federal judge. And, and he ruled in our favor, even though our arguments were, were probably weak, but we won. And, and frankly, the New York the Attorney General had done a terrible job at the, trial, at the trial court level, his brief was just awful. Uh, he, they took an appeal and they signed a different lawyer to the case. And the lawyer wrote a great brief. And I went to the partner on the case and I said, you know, we're gonna lose. I mean, uh, I know what the law is. It's rather limited in scope. I've read every regulation that's extant out there. And I just don't see how, what, what our path to victory is. You know, we went ahead. We, I wrote the brief. Uh, court was very polite when I got up there as the it was as the appellee. But you know, sure enough, we lost, and we frankly deserved to lose. And I, that was the one I, I mean, that I feel some ethical qualms about. It. The, the clients were so nice, and so they were it, they were good people wanting to do something good. So it was, uh, but I, but I, you know, I had the judge in the back of my head on that one because I knew uh, I was I was right at the borderline in terms of what. Was it was 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 correct advocacy in that situation? Right. Yeah, credibility is the uh, is the key, and if you have trouble believing in in yourself, uh, yeah, uh, the court may have second thoughts, I suppose. Um, uh, in addition to giving the right answer, and uh, really, I think that is one of the cornerstones of uh, of any lawyer's uh, uh, reputation and ability to. Uh, to prevail no matter what the setting, um, you have to be understood. 
And uh, I think we did key, we have keyed in on that a number of times, but Phoebe, I wonder if you could uh, touch on that second point about e being easy to understand, uh, how, how you focus on that. Uh, so I think it's really also important um, as, as we move to that point to avoid the passive voice. Mm -hmm. I think um, it is so clearly the case that law clerks in particular come in sometimes un, un, uh, clear about the fact that you cannot use passive voice. You have to have an active voice when you're talking about important issues. Uh, and I think a lot of people come in thinking that it is uh, a formal way of presenting when it's actually to the contrary. Um, that also comes when you're um, teaching in law schools and when you're teaching uh, in other contexts. Passive voice is often used as a way, as a marker for people. Uh, and it just is not good and effective advocacy. Yeah, you certainly don't. Uh, you don't uh, portray strength. If, right. if anything, it's uh, it seems like you're weak and backing in right. your argument. Yeah. Um, and what about getting to the point early on? Uh, I mean, that is one of the things I think we have commented on. And that if you read some of the opinions, uh, you'll see that that is the uh, that is one of the hallmarks of Judge Wise's uh, experience is getting to the point. Frankly. Um, the point is lost if you never if if the reader never gets beyond that first paragraph. Yeah, I, I don't know whether that was his thinking uh, or whether he uh, he just loved to encapsulate it uh, to the point where um, that uh, and, and that that first paragraph was so critical. Yeah. Uh, but it made it the rest of the analysis much easier to understand. You 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 knew where he was heading because you understood where he was going to end up and why he was going to end up there. And then he went through and he would dissect it uh, following uh, that in the uh, analysis uh, that would uh, follow on the, in the brief. Um, okay. Um, one of the other uh, hallmarks of, uh, of uh, briefs, and uh, I should also mention there is an article that he wrote that we attached to the materials and it's called How to Write a Bad Brief. Mm -hmm. uh, the judge did have a twinkle in his eye when he yeah, wrote. Right. And uh, he did like every once in a while to be a bit sarcastic. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this was an article on how to write a bad brief. And he went through every point that frustrated him as a judge uh, in getting briefs that were uh, less than uh, effective. Um, but uh, as far as um, how to write a uh, bad brief. Uh, Stan, do you want to uh, mention a couple of these? Okay, I'll hit uh, a couple of them. Uh, avoid distractions. Uh, seems kind of simple, but a lot of people either don't know the concept or they don't understand what it means or they just forget about it. And I'm going right up to the Supreme Court. I just read an opinion the other day, and it was a long, twisted path from the trial court, court of appeals, and it went back down, and then some things changed. And the decision, the majority decision, is talking about the respondents and the petitioners. And it's a very complex factual situation with a number of parties, and they align uh, pretty much into two camps, but very hard to figure out who did what to whom. But because of different terms for different, yeah. for the same person. It, yeah, well, or the group of people. Uh, you notice I said who did what to whom, not who had what done to them. It's strong writing. <laughs> when, when you're trying to pin something on the other side, they're doing it to your client. It's stronger writing when you use the active voice. But it's real simple. And it's right in the rules. Avoid use of things like appellants and appellees. Give them a name. Mr. Jones, the XYZ company. And be consistent. And be, yes. Then you once you start, 
you've got to be consistent and hopefully you've got ability, at least on an appellate brief, to have somebody else proofread it. I know that's harder and harder these days. I'm not talking about a spell checker, I'm talking about a person to make sure that you have stayed consistent with what you came up with. Okay, next. Know your audience. It's amazing how many practitioners don't pay attention to the rules for the court that they are in. If you're in Pennsylvania and you're on appeal, you might be in the Commonwealth Court, which has some rules that are different than Superior Court. And each court has a set, and the Third Circuit does too, of internal operating procedures. And you should know them and read them as an attorney. Uh, I can think of a few cases where somebody didn't pay attention to the rules and it was outcome determinative. Uh, not very, very many. The court, they want to get the right answer in the case, but it is a distraction and it slows them down. And it does make you wonder if you're the court, how much can I trust right. this advocate? Uh, rules of grammar, I probably violate them uh, more than I should, but I think it helps sometimes in communicating, but you can't be totally uh, ignorant of them. And rules of citation, you don't have to, I don't even know what rules of citation are anymore because of so much electronic stuff, but I do go to uh, the blue book as needed. Uh, and is it going to win the argument? Probably not. But again, it conveys to the court that they can trust this attorney. Again, very, very subtle, but it all adds up together. A judge doesn't want to be reversed. Yeah. So anything you can do to make the judge believe that picking your side is less likely to get them reversed. Helpful. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, like young lawyers do this anymore, but I know, and I know again, we talked about this when we were in chambers. I mean, just reading and understanding stroke and white, and if, I mean, if people even still yeah. read the thing, yeah. I mean, but I mean, in terms of basic usage and grammar, right. I mean, we whether we did it consciously or not, I think every opinion the judge wrote, with maybe one exception, that was the flap versus font. <laughs> Uh, yeah, issue uh the judge should hear to and and it's just it's it's so basic and so simple but uh you know he really strove to to write with that level of clarity and precision and consistency and we had a dictionary in the in yeah, chamber, big, 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 big dictionary and i remember usually when, when the last i think we go through like seven drafts if i can track generally and when the opinion was ready to go out the, you know, I would go in and we the judge would read the opinion. Yeah. And sometimes true. we'd argue over some final points. Right. But I remember several times when one of us would go to the dictionary because we wanted to make sure it was the right word. Right. Yeah, there's nothing worse than uh being uh, than a judge being distracted by some uh, yeah. you know terrible, right. terrible mistake of yeah. uh of grammar. And yeah. uh all of a sudden that's all you focus on. Uh instead of the yes. substance. Uh, it's a it's a distraction. Um Rules of citation is uh, something that there is a certain debate on. Uh, Bill, you've, uh, you, uh, I know that you have in the past uh, had experience with a judge where he said, forget the blue book. Nah. Is that right? Is that, uh, do you, how, 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 do you, how do you balance that between the blue book of citations and uh, let's say uh, the, uh, uh, oh, that's cleaned up uh, mantra for format. So when we were there, uh, Steve Irwin and I were the, you got to follow it because it's the blue book judge. You've got another choice. You got to follow it. And uh, we were in chambers one day and he just sits back in that chair and said, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> and he thought that the citation format that I remember him discussing with us was what has now become the cleaned up format that you see so often, where all of the citing, quoting, citation 
uh, is to be going long for four or five lines of text. And I think he thought that was incredibly distracting. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the blue book instructed us to follow that uh, gave him no fault. Yeah. Well, we also, if there were five, if there were five precedents that bolstered his point, he'd probably take three or four of them out, right? Mm -hmm. And there was what, Right. Third Circuit had already spoken in his yeah, that's why, right. why add the, the Eighth Circuit right. decision? And, and right. that made for much cleaner reading, too, right? Right. And yeah. string sites. He really yeah, doesn't like string it, sites. Right? Yeah. No. Well, there's nothing worse than getting ready for an oral argument. In if your brief has string sites, you better be prepared to talk about right. every single one exactly. of them. So, exactly. As exactly. an advocate, beware. You you want to want to keep it simple, uh, right? Just because you have a little less than a whole bunch right. before oral argument. Um, well, let's uh, see where we are as far as avoiding distractions, and uh, I'm just wondering as far as um, as far as well, let me go back one and uh, just ask, uh, uh, what about things like? Uh, Oh, uh, using uh, bold and italics uh, in order to bolster uh, your persuasiveness in a brief. Yes. <laughs> and if you didn't get that, uh, well, uh, there may not be much hope for you. <laughs> but and if you weren't awake, <laughs> yeah, all right. Don't do it. Yeah. Write it in a way that it will stand out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're you're going to look like. Uh, you know, so, some of the things I see now on the internet where half the words are in bold, the other half are in italics, right. and you don't know what's important. Even if you do it once, if you do it once, maybe that's okay. But you've got to have a good reason. Uh, figure that the judge, whoever he or she is, is smart enough to figure out what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the uh, texting equivalent is all caps. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, use stronger words, stronger verbs. Use word choice instead of uh, right. uh, the font or the uh, the boldness. Yeah, uh, but 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 do provide help. Like you do use short paragraphs. Don't use a paragraph that's going to go three pages long. Mm -hmm. Brief. It's just it's yeah. it, it requires a lot of the reader to yeah. understand that in the in the in the author's mind, this is like weaving of a single thought that runs several pages right. long. I mean, he he was all about trying to make it as easy as possible for the the reader to understand precisely what the opinion was trying to say. Yeah, I can remember him talking about boy, there's a lot of this. It looks all gray, uh, and that means there was there were very there were one dense, long long dense, paragraphs. Right. No, nothing that broke right. it up. Right. And uh, and, uh, and frankly, if you're looking over a stack of briefs. You're not going to read you every word, that. every word, yeah. uh, but by breaking it into smaller paragraphs, you can just kind of hit, and right. then maybe drop down to the next one if you get if you get that. Right. So um, that's the other thing he used to talk about: uh, block, uh, single block paragraphs or block quotes. Um, yeah. He referred to them as being covered in Teflon. Uh, because he would see a block, a single block uh, paragraph, let's say a, a quote that goes in half of a page, and it would be Teflon to his eyes. He would just look at it and then roll, roll right down and uh, and and get to the point. So what he always suggested, and that and it was a good one that I've always uh, followed, is even if you feel like you should give a block paragraph, uh, preface that with a little summary of what it's going to say. Um, kind of summarize uh, and or you know as justice so and so uh, explained and then explain it and then lead, and then put the block paragraph if you really want it but uh, there's a likelihood that it's never going to be read right. because it's like Teflon to to their eyes um, uh, and things like uh, uh, run on sentences uh, uh, any kind of uh, hyperbole or sarcasm sarcasm does not work in black no. and white as as an advocate. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, any kind of derogatory uh, terms, uh, we uh, you have to go back to that one uh, thing that I keep saying, what would Judge Wise do? Well, he did not use sarcasm. He did not use derogatory terms. He did not denigrate uh, any kind of, a, uh, of the judge. Right. Uh, and as an advocate, you shouldn't either. Right. Uh, let the, uh, let the uh, expose their lack of logic but don't use some derogatory term. Don't denigrate the judge. 
uh, whenever a uh, judge, uh, somebody was going to be reversed, you, the judge would never even reference who the judge was the, at the lower court. Because uh, he, you know, if it, if it was going to be reversed, it would kind of be a little bit embarrassing as to a uh, criticism. He might comment on the logic, but he would never comment on um, who was illogical. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, there are a lot of uh, distractions that uh, I think really got to the uh, get to the core. One of the other points that he used to make was uh, and whenever we would do a, uh, let's say, a bench memo, and we would uh, talk about how uh, the court found or the court held, he said, you know, there's a difference between a court finding something oh, and yeah. a court yeah. holding yeah. something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's something that so many advocates never yeah. think yeah. about. Right. Uh, the holding is the holding of a uh, uh, court holding something. It's the holding of the court. When they make a finding, it's a finding of fact. It's yeah. not a holding. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, uh, all a, effective points that I think really are uh, quite distracting uh, if you know what you're looking for. And in that sense, uh, it's it's helpful. So let's talk a little bit about the um, structure of a of a brief um, and how uh, how you go about uh, doing it. When you were boiling down uh, your uh, uh, your outlines and your bench memos, uh, how do you how do you go about doing it initially? Uh, what's uh, maybe you want to touch on that as far as. Uh, uh, structuring a brief or outlining or how, how do you yeah I would that? I would I would start with an outline uh, mm -hmm. because I, I'm an outliner and I can't think in complexity um, so I have to be able to um, uh, distill it first uh, so that I can make sure that what my lines of argument will be will be tight uh, so I still do that I start everything with an outline. And there's nothing more frustrating when you're reading with an opinion or somebody else's brief and uh, you see, gee, wait, they've already made this argument. Uh, you know, the outlining uh, yeah. promotes uh, right. the clustering of uh, the same arguments yeah. instead of uh, just kind of dabbling and uh, kind of jumping back and forth. Right. And, and if the ordering of how you structure your argument. I mean, I always felt that, again, this is, I think, having Clark for the judge, this this was hammered home. If you have a jurisdictional argument, it probably should be your first argument because okay. basically, as you're saying, you know, this case shouldn't even be here. Okay. And, and so, and if you're going to make a jurisdictional argument, it's, and it's, okay. it's the eighth argument in your brief. <laughs> I I mean, I just think it doesn't have any credibility at that point. There uh, shouldn't be eight arguments in a brief. Well, I agree with that, Jim. I totally agree yeah. with that. Yeah. 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 But it does make a lot of sense to uh, to uh, make sure that they're sequenced in, yeah, in right, the right, right order and, yeah. uh, in, in a logical sequence. Yeah, right. so outlines do that for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so, Stan, what about road mapping? Uh, you ever use that? Do I use it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, I do it a little bit. I, I just get there a little bit differently. And this, it, it sounds old fashioned. I've tried all kinds of different applications i've tried mind mapping and i do use a program of mind jet for certain things but when it comes to put the brief together or an argument i actually use index cards me too i have them as i put the case together generally and when it's time to write or get ready to argue i lay them out on a big table and i move them around so they're all together and the first thing i do is figure out what's duplicative that's that. Don't repeat arguments. Mm -hmm. These judges are smart enough to figure it out one, if you hear it one time. Second time, they may get a little irritated. Third time, it's going to be yeah. a problem. And that's to get started. Once I lay them out, I write, and then I go back and I put headings in. And then uh, what Judge Wise did with the first paragraph, sometimes he would telegraph all of that through uh, it depends on the structure. And what do I do for structure? I look at the rules because sometimes the rules tell you how you structure it. And you've got to follow the rules. Know your audience again. Uh, in that sense, uh, let's talk about a little bit. I we already hit on this uh, too much gray as far as block quotes, but um and responsive briefs. Uh, how do you um, how do you handle that, Stan? Uh, as far as uh, 
um, structuring it or organizing? This is hard. This is harder than it looks. Uh, one of the tendencies is to want to take the opponent's arguments and knock them down one by one. Uh, and I used to do that when I was younger. Uh, what I've developed is a judge may have a limited attention span. Judge Wise, to my knowledge, didn't. But other judges did. I don't know about the Third Circuit today. Uh, it's, it's a different court. Uh, all the courts are different, but I can tell you that in some state courts, both here and in other states, I don't know what the attention span is of the reader. So if I've got a point that's going to really, that I think will make the difference, I get it in first, no matter what. And then I'll deal with things in order of importance. Often I'll finish with, nor are opponents other points valid and i'll just tick them off real quick mm -hmm. but the other thing when they when you're dealing with a case that the other side cited uh it's amazing how many attorneys will just cite a case maybe they'll throw in a uh quote you explain what that case was about and the context of that case and then further explain why what might have worked in that case doesn't work here. Mm -hmm. So in, in a limited time, I think that's as quick as I can do it. And then what about when the, uh, your opponent never addresses one of your points? Um, uh, that uh, instead of, and that's a, a major uh, flaw in, in an opponent's argument, and that's something you really should uh, take it almost that they're admitting. Yeah, uh, and that, that's what made, made writing uh, reply yeah. briefs so much fun. Right. Yeah, so right. that situation. Yes, yeah, I was looking at a responsive brief if, if if I was the appellee. But yeah, reply briefs is right. they're a different animal, and they should be short. Short. Yeah. People that try to uh, re-argue, it doesn't go over well. People that try to add things that they forgot the first time <laughs> doesn't mm. go over well. Right. Some judges will really call you out on it. Judge Wise, I don't know that he did, but yeah. and knowing knowing when to not say going back to oral argument, knowing when to not say much of anything is also so important. If you're if you're the responding party on a motion and the and the uh the the moving party has not fared all that well in the argument, mm -hmm. I mean don't waste the judge's time or the court's time. I mean, I, I can recall a few, many, and that's a hard lesson for certainly young lawyer. Like, if you want to yeah. be so paid, this... you're supposed to be prepared. You're supposed to get up there and you may, you might stumble into a problem if you say too much. Uh, uh, and, but it's, it, it, you don't see enough lawyers do that. I don't yeah. think I could just one more story that has always stuck with me. I was about to argue a substantial case in front of a federal judge and the case just before me or the matter just before me, Arthur Lyman was about to get up and argue. And he was arguing on behalf of Dennis Levine, who was a Ivan Bosky protege, and he was convicted of insider trading. He was not a good man and spent some time in prison. And Lyman was there to argue that the conditions of Levine's prison was 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 uh, he was success he was seeking a change transfer of his prison terms to another facility because he was the 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 other inmates were picking on him he didn't like the food <laughs> he argued with the eloquence as if this were the scope trial for fifteen minutes uninterrupted uninterrupted and I'm sitting there listening to all of this and saying wow this is really he's just he's he's pouring his heart and soul into this anyway he finishes and the judge. Turns to the U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney, who was actually Chuck, your old partner, Charlie Carberry, okay, who was a man of few words. He tended to grunt more than speak. <laughs> and he usually had like like tomato stains on his tie and everything else. Wow. But he was notoriously viewed as a, as a really fine prosecutor. He gets up barely and says, I have nothing, Your Honor. Mm. And he sits down. And within the judge gave Lyman a respectable 10 seconds before denying the motion from the bench. Uh, but I thought Carberry's restraint there was exactly the right thing. He knew exactly what was going to happen and why waste the court's time? Less is more. 
Yeah, Maybe you yeah I was going to say this translates not only in courts and uh, really certainly applies uh, in the context of academia. Uh, you mm -hmm. can go on and on and on and on. Well, I've, he I've heard notorious stories about faculty meetings. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, before we run out we of time. We won't even get to that part. Before we won't run out of time, there's just two points I want to make. Uh, number one, I believe, at least at the time we were clerking, Judge Wise's opinions were the shortest yeah. of all the circuits. Yes. no question. Well, certainly the third circuit. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That was not an accident, and it was not right. laziness. In fact, it was yeah. the opposite for the reasons we talked about. The other point I want to add, and he took this very seriously, there was a case where it had to do with fees mm -hmm. in a class action. And this was the third time around mm -hmm. on this case. And I remember him saying, you know, we're not getting through. We somehow have to instruct the district court judges what they should be doing. So as much as he wanted to let the lawyers know uh, what they should be doing, he also felt a responsibility to make sure that the district court judges mm -hmm. had an understanding of what the Third Circuit was expecting of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, someone that during the break uh, asked me, uh, well, was the judge, uh, was Judge Wise ever up for uh, consideration for the U.S. Supreme Court? And uh, and I said, no, not to my knowledge. And, and frankly, his opinions were so pithy and so to the point, whereas the judges, at least from my yeah, observation, right. who were really lobbying yeah. for the uh, for consideration for the possible appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, would write these treatises and there would be so much um, BS, uh, but it would be almost a, you know, a, a treatise basically to yeah, show, look right. how smart I am. Yeah. The judge yeah. was trying to say, uh, look how easy it is for you to understand. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when I mentioned the Supreme Court, Joe, um, when you uh, were getting ready to argue for the Supreme Court, uh, that was probably a pretty dawning thing. You had to, you had to anticipate Every question from uh, you know from different points of view. So how, how, what was it like? Well, it was it was the privilege to do. I was doing. I did it as an in-house lawyer, which was really unusual. Uh, and and I also knew going in that the likelihood of winning the case was pretty slim because the court took cert on this, in a case where uh, all of the circuits had been uniform and in, uniformly in favor of the the industry. So when they took the case. Uh, it, it was not a welcome development. And then when the SG came in on the other side, that was a, it was an even worse development. So kind of going in, uh, I knew it was going to be a, a challenge. Uh, I worked very closely with some superb practitioners. Uh, the Securities Industry Association hired uh, Andy Fry from Mayor Brown, and he did a phenomenal brief. And I had the privilege of working with uh, Phil Neal, who was the former dean of the University of Chicago Law School, his law firm. Uh, had uh, had represented Lehman Brothers in in the in the lower court. Uh, so they prepped you for it. What they prepped you for they, the argument? They, they, yeah, and in and, fact, Phil probably would have argued the case, but for my boss saying you should argue the case. I mean, you, right. you, I, I have confidence in you, right. and I said I had a real job, so right. I can't just kind of waltz into the Supreme Court right. on the, on the day of and and argue. So no, no, we'll give you the time to just. You do it. So I did it. Six so how, how did you go about doing it? Did you, were there, uh, did you have mock arguments? Or? Oh, yeah, many. We had money, multiple mock arguments. Uh, I spent uh, three weeks in Chicago working on the brief with, with Phil and, and his team. Uh, many, many mock arguments. And then the only time in my life, I was never, I mean, the many things I, I don't miss about private practice, but I did, what I did miss was being in a courtroom. I always loved being in a courtroom and, and arguing. But the only time in my life and I was nerve that I was nervous was the day before I was arguing in the Supreme Court. Yeah, I uh, so. I've, yeah, I I've had trouble sleeping that night. We were at the, we, my wife came down for the argument. We were at the Willard Hotel, and I just kept in my own in my mind saying I'm going to be arguing tomorrow morning in the United <laughs> States Supreme Court, and it's never happened to me prior to that. Uh, now, by the time the argument rolled, the you, you adrenaline kicks in and you're fine. And the fact that I got about two seconds into my argument before I started being barraged with questions 
from everyone except the one justice who actually voted in my favor, who was Justice Thomas, who, of course, not surprisingly, remained silent. Uh, <laughs> but everyone else uh, uh, asked, asked, asked questions. So the 30 minutes went by like three, I, I would say. Did you had you anticipated every question? Yeah, you got? I, yeah I, I knew I knew. Uh, and, and look, being in the Supreme Court is like it's a nine piece puzzle, right? And you have to try to figure out how to fit five, five pieces together. And I knew it was going to be a challenge because, again, they took the case for a reason. And while I still to this day believe that the, the more credible opinion was Justice Thomas's decision, I mean, I understood that the, the, the court was going to move along a different direction. So well, we talked about the uh, oral arguments that there's the argument you intend to make, the argument you do make and the argument you wish you made. Yeah. Uh, which, what did that one fall into? Did it go as you had hoped and planned? Uh, I think, it, you know, not the outcome, but the argument. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't change anything. I, I just knew it was going to be a, a long, long haul. So, okay. Well, I'm, uh, there were uh, a couple other slides. Well, this is uh, one that we've already really dwelled on, and that's uh, really the idea of, of uh, making sure that you uh, make an impact uh, when you are an advocate. Uh, don't hold back, uh, whether it's using the passive voice, but uh, I, I think one of the things that the uh, I learned from the judge was when you're phrasing uh, the issue presented, phrase it as the holding that you're hoping that you're that the court is going to get. Uh, don't be shy about phrasing things the way you want them to end up. Um, uh, but as far as uh, as far as uh, any of these uh, points go, Essentially, it is just a matter of, of um, being persuasive, using strong and precise words, and making sure that uh, you make an impact rather than backing into a holding or an ar argument. And then the last one was how to write a bad brief. I, I just uh, made a checklist, and uh, those are ones that you don't want to look at, actually, <laughs> for fear that it, it might corrupt you or the way you uh, view. But we did attach the uh, article uh, uh, from the uh, federal lawyer that uh, was that appeared that the judge had written with his tongue in cheek. Yeah. Um, so I uh, at this hour, a couple minutes uh, uh, before four, um, if there is an, are any questions or answers, we're going to be hanging around a few minutes so we can uh, hear it. But uh, I always like to let people out a couple minutes early, two two to be exact. So uh, we thank you for that.